Introduction to The Spirit of the Border. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. The Spirit of the Border A Romance of the Early Settlers in the Ohio Valley by Zane Gray. 1906. To my brother, with many fond recollections of days spent in the solitude of the forests, where only can be satisfied that wild fever of freedom of which this book tells, where to hear the whirr of a wild duck in his rapid flight is joy, where the quiet of an autumn afternoon swells the heart, and where one may watch the fragrant wood smoke curl from the campfire and see the stars peep over dark wooded hills as twilight deepens and know a happiness that dwells in the wilderness alone introduction the author does not intend to apologize for what many readers may call the brutality of the story but rather to explain that its wild spirit is true to the life of the western border as it was known only a little more than one hundred years ago the writer is the fortunate possessor of historical material of undoubted truth and interest it is the long-lost journal of colonel ebenezer zane one of the most prominent of the hunter pioneers who labored in the settlement of the western country the story of that tragic period deserves a higher place in historical literature than it has thus far been given, and this unquestionably because of a lack of authentic data regarding the conquering of the wilderness. Considering how many years the pioneers struggled on the border of this country, the history of their efforts is meager and obscure. If the years at the close of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century were full of stirring adventure on the part of the colonists along the Atlantic coast, how crowded must they have been for the almost forgotten pioneers who daringly invaded the trackless wilds none there was to chronicle the fight of these sturdy travelers toward the setting sun the story of their stormy lives of their heroism and of their sacrifice for the benefit of future generations is too little known it is to a better understanding of those days that the author has labored to draw from his ancestors notes a new and striking portrayal of the frontier one which shall paint the fever of freedom that powerful impulse which lured so many to unmarked graves one which shall show his work his love the effect of the causes which rendered his life so hard and surely one which does not forget the wronged indian the frontier in seventeen seventy seven produced white men so savage as to be men in name only these outcasts and renegades lived among the savages and during thirty years harassed the border perpetrating all manner of fiendish cruelties upon the settlers they were no less cruel to the red men whom they ruled and at the height of their bloody careers made futile the moravian missionaries long labors and destroyed the beautiful hamlet of the christian indians called gnadenhutten or village of peace and while the border produced such outlaws so did it produce hunters eke boone the zanes the mccullochs and wetzel that strange silent man whose deeds are still whispered in the country where he once roamed in his insatiate pursuit of savages and renegades and who was purely a product of the times civilization could not have brought forth a man like wetzel great revolutions great crises great moments come and produce the men to deal with them the border needed wetzel the settlers would have needed many more years in which to make permanent homes had it not been for him he was never a pioneer but always a hunter after indians when not on the track of the savage foe he was in the settlement with his keen eye and ear ever alert for signs of the enemy to the superstitious indians he was a shadow 
a spirit of the border which breathed menace from the dark forests to the settlers he was the right arm of defense a fitting leader for those few implacable and unerring frontiersmen who made the settlement of the west a possibility and if this story of one of his relentless pursuits shows the man as he truly was loved by pioneers respected and feared by red men and hated by renegades if it softens a little the ruthless name history accords him the writer will have been well repaid z g end of introduction to the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Chapter One of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter One. Nell, I'm growing powerful fond of you. So you must be, Master Joe, if often telling makes it true. The girl spoke simply, and with an absence of that roguishness which was characteristic of her playful words arch smiles and a touch of coquetry had seemed natural to nell but now her grave tone and her almost wistful glance disconcerted joe during all the long journey over the mountains she had been gay and bright while now when they were about to part perhaps never to meet again she showed him the deeper and more earnest side of her character it checked his boldness as nothing else had done suddenly there came to him the real meaning of a woman's love when she bestows it without reservation silenced by the thought that he had not understood her at all and the knowledge that he had been half in sport he gazed out over the wild country before them the scene impressed its quietness upon the young couple and brought more forcibly to their minds the fact that they were at the gateway of the unknown west that somewhere beyond this rude frontier settlement out there in those unbroken forests stretching dark and silent before them was to be their future home from the high bank where they stood the land sloped and narrowed gradually until it ended in a sharp point which marked the last bit of land between the allegheny and monongahela rivers here these swift streams merged and formed the broad ohio the newborn river even here at its beginning proud and swelling as if already certain of its faraway grandeur swept majestically round a wide curve and apparently lost itself in the forest foliage on the narrow point of land commanding a view of the rivers stood a long low structure enclosed by a stockade fence on the four corners of which were little box-shaped houses that bulged out as if trying to see what was going on beneath the massive timbers used in the construction of this fort the square compact form and the small dark holes cut into the walls gave the structure a threatening impregnable aspect below nell and joe on the bank were many log cabins the yellow clay which filled the chinks between the logs gave these a peculiar striped appearance there was life and bustle in the vicinity of these dwellings in sharp contrast with the still grandeur of the neighboring forests there were canvas covered wagons around which curly-headed youngsters were playing several horses were grazing on the short grass and six red and white oxen munched at the hay that had been thrown to them the smoke of many fires curled upward and near the blaze hovered ruddy-faced women who stirred the contents of steaming kettles one man swung an axe with a vigorous sweep and the clean sharp strokes rang on the air another hammered stakes into the ground on which to hang a kettle before a large cabin a fur trader was exhibiting his wares to three indians a second redskin was carrying a pack of pelts from a canoe drawn up on the river bank a small group of persons stood near some were indifferent and others gazed curiously at the savages 
two children peeped from behind their mother's skirts as if half curious half frightened from this scene the significance of which had just dawned on him joe turned his eyes again to his companion it was a sweet face he saw one that was sedate but had a promise of innumerable smiles the blue eyes could not long hide flashes of merriment the girl turned and the two young people looked at each other her eyes softened with a woman's gentleness as they rested upon him for broad of shoulder and lithe and strong as a deer stalker he was good to look at listen she said we have known each other only three weeks since you joined our wagon train and have been so kind to me and so helpful to make that long rough ride endurable you have won my regard i i cannot say more even if i would you told me you ran away from your virginian home to seek adventure on the frontier and that you knew no one in all this wild country you even said you could not or would not work at farming perhaps my sister and i are as unfitted as you for this life but we must cling to our uncle because he is the only relative we have he has come out here to join the moravians and to preach the gospel to these indians we shall share his life and help him all we can you have been telling me you you cared for me and now that we are about to part i i don't know what to say to you unless it is give up this intention of yours to seek adventure and come with us it seems to me you need not hunt for excitement here it will come unsought i wish i were jim he said suddenly who is jim my brother tell me of him there is nothing much to tell he and i are all that are left of our people as are you and kate of yours jim's a preacher and the best fellow oh i cared a lot for jim then why did you leave him i was tired of williamsburg i quarreled with the fellow and hurt him besides i wanted to see the west i'd like to hunt deer and bear and fight indians oh i'm not much good was jim the only one you cared for asked nell smiling she was surprised to find him grave yes except my horse and dog and i had to leave them behind answered joe bowing his head a little you'd like to be jim because he's a preacher and could help uncle convert the indians well, yes partly that but mostly because somehow something you've said or done has made me care for you in a different way and i'd like to be worthy of you i don't think i can believe it when you say you are no good she replied nell he cried and suddenly grasped her hand she wrenched herself free and leaped away from him her face was bright now and the promise of smiles was made good behave yourself sir she tossed her head with a familiar backward motion to throw the chestnut hair from her face and looked at him with eyes veiled slightly under their lashes you will go with kate and me before he could answer a cry from some one on the plain below attracted their attention they turned and saw another wagon train pulling into the settlement the children were shouting and running alongside the weary oxen men and women went forward expectantly that must be the train uncle expected let us go down said nell joe did not answer but followed her down the path when they gained a clump of willows near the cabins he bent forward and took her hand she saw the reckless gleam in his eyes don't they'll see she whispered if that's the only reason you have i reckon i don't care said joe what do you mean i didn't say i didn't tell oh let me go implored nell she tried to release the hand joe had grasped in his broad palm but in vain the more she struggled the firmer was his hold a frown wrinkled her brow and her eyes sparkled with spirit she saw the fur trader's wife looking out of the window and remembered laughing and telling the good woman she did not like this young man it was perhaps because she feared those sharp eyes that she resented his audacity she opened her mouth to rebuke him 
but no words came. Joe had bent his head and softly closed her lips with his own. For the single instant during which Nell stood transfixed, as if with surprise, and looking up at Joe, she was dumb. Usually the girl was ready with sharp or saucy words, and impulsive in her movements. But now the bewilderment of being kissed, particularly within view of the trader's wife, confused her. Then she heard voices, and as Joe turned away with a smile on his face, the unusual warmth in her heart was followed by an angry throbbing. Joe's tall figure stood out distinctly as he leisurely strolled toward the incoming wagon train without looking backward. Flashing after him a glance that boded wordy trouble in the future, she ran into the cabin. As she entered the door, it seemed certain the grizzled frontiersman sitting on the bench outside had grinned knowingly at her, and winked as if to say he would keep her secret. Mrs. Wentz, the fur trader's wife, was seated by the open window which faced the fort. She was a large woman, strong of feature, and with that calm placidity of expression common to people who have lived long in sparsely populated districts. Nell glanced furtively at her, and thought she detected the shadow of a smile in the gray eyes. "'I saw you and your sweetheart making love behind the willow,' Mrs. Wentz said in a matter-of-fact voice. "'I don't see why you need to hide to do it. We folks out here like to see the young people sparkin'. Your young man is a fine-appearing chap. I felt certain you were sweethearts, for all you allowed you'd known him only a few days. Lise Davis said she saw he was sweet on you. I like his face. Jake, my man, says as how he'll make a good husband for you, and he'll take to the frontier like a duck does to water. I'm sorry you'll not tarry here a while. We don't see many lasses, especially any as pretty as you, and you'll find it more quiet and lonesome the farther west you get. Jake knows all about Fort Henry, and Jeff Lynn, the hunter outside, he knows Ebb and Jack Zane and Wetzel and all those Fort Henry men. You'll be getting married out there, won't you? You are quite wrong, said Nell, who all the while Mrs. Wentz was speaking grew rosier and rosier. We're not anything... Then Nell hesitated and finally ceased speaking. She saw that denials or explanations were futile. The simple woman had seen the kiss and formed her own conclusions. During the few days Nell had spent at Fort Pitt, she had come to understand that the dwellers on the frontier took everything as a matter of course. She had seen them manifest a certain pleasure, but neither surprise, concern, nor any of the quick impulses so common among other people. And this was another lesson Nell took to heart. She realized that she was entering upon a life absolutely different from her former one, and the thought caused her to shrink from the ordeal. Yet all the suggestions regarding her future home, the stories told about Indians, renegades, and of the wild border life, fascinated her. These people who had settled in this wild region were simple, honest, and brave. They accepted what came as facts not to be questioned, and believed what looked true. Evidently the fur trader's wife and her female neighbors had settled in their minds the relation in which the girl stood to Joe. This latter reflection heightened Nell's resentment toward her lover. She stood with her face turned away from Mrs. Wentz. The little frown deepened, and she nervously tapped her foot on the floor. "'Where is my sister?' she presently asked. Uh, "'She went to see the wagon train come in. Everybody's out there.' Nell deliberated a moment, and then went into the open air. She saw a number of canvas-covered wagons drawn up in front of the cabins. The vehicles were dusty, and the wheels encrusted with yellow mud. The grizzled frontiersman, who had smiled at Nell, stood leaning on his gun, talking to three men, whose travel-stained and worn homespun clothes suggested a long and toilsome journey. There was the bustle of excitement incident to the arrival of strangers, to the quick exchange of greetings, the unloading of wagons, and unharnessing of horses and oxen. Nell looked here and there for her sister. Finally she saw her standing near her uncle while he conversed with one of the teamsters. The girl did not approach them, 
but glanced quickly around in search of someone else. At length she saw Joe unloading goods from one of the wagons. His back was turned toward her, but she at once recognized the challenge conveyed by the broad shoulders. She saw no other person, gave heed to nothing, save what was to her righteous indignation. Hearing her footsteps, the young man turned, glancing at her admiringly, said, "'Good evening, miss.' Nell had not expected such a matter-of-fact greeting from Joe. There was not the slightest trace of repentance in his calm face, and he placidly continued his labor. "'Aren't you sorry you—you you treated me so?' burst out Nell. His coolness was exasperating. Instead of the contrition and apology she had expected, and which was her due, he evidently intended to tease her, as he had done so often. The young man dropped a blanket and stared. "'I don't understand,' he said gravely. "'I never saw you before.' This was too much for quick-tempered Nell. She had had some vague idea of forgiving him, after he had sued sufficiently for pardon, but now, forgetting her good intentions, in the belief that he was making sport of her when he should have pleaded for forgiveness, she swiftly raised her hand and slapped him smartly. The red blood flamed to the young man's face. As he staggered backward with his hand to his cheek, she heard a smothered exclamation behind her, and then the quick, joyous barking of a dog. When Nell turned, she was amazed to see Joe standing beside the wagon, while a big white dog was leaping upon him. Suddenly she felt faint. Bewildered, she looked from Joe to the man she had just struck, but could not say which was the man who professed to love her. "'Jem, so you followed me!' cried Joe, starting forward and flinging his arms around the other. "'Yes, Joe, and I'm right glad I am to find you,' answered the young man, while a peculiar expression of pleasure came over his face. "'It's good to see you again, and here's my old dog Mose. But how on earth did you know?' Where did you strike by trail? What are you going to do out here on the frontier? Tell me all. What happened after I left? Then Joe saw Nell standing nearby, pale and distressed, and he felt something was amiss. He glanced quickly from her to his brother. She seemed to be dazed, and Jim looked grave. What the deuce? Uh, Nell, this is my brother Jim, the one I told you about. Jim, this is my friend, Miss Wells. "'I am happy to meet Miss Wells,' said Jim, with a smile, "'even though she did slap my face for nothing.' "'Slapped you? What for?' Then the truth dawned on Joe, and he laughed until the tears came into his eyes. "'She took you for me! <laughs> oh, this is great!' Nell's face was now rosy red, and moisture glistened in her eyes, but she tried bravely to stand her ground. Humiliation had taken the place of anger. "'I—I—' I, "'I'm sorry, Mr. Downs. I did take you for him. He—he he has insulted me.' And she turned and ran into the cabin. End of chapter 1 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter 2 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 2 Joe and Jim were singularly alike. They were nearly the same size, very tall, but so heavily built as to appear of medium height, while their gray eyes, and indeed every feature of their clean-cut faces, corresponded so exactly as to proclaim them brothers. "'Already up to your old tricks?' asked Jim, with his hand on Joe's shoulder, as they both watched Nell's flight. "'I'm really fond of her, Jim, and I didn't mean to hurt her feelings. But tell me about yourself. What made you come west?' "'To teach the Indians, and I was, no doubt, strongly influenced by your being here.' "'You're going to do as you ever have, make some sacrifice. You're always devoting yourself, if not to me, to some other.' Now it's your life you're giving up. To try to convert the redskins and influence me for good is, in both cases, impossible. How often have I said there wasn't any good in me? My desire is to kill Indians, not preach to them, Jim. I'm glad to see you, but I wish you hadn't come. 
this wild frontier is no place for a preacher i think it is said jim quietly well, what of rose the girl you were to marry joe glanced quickly at his brother jim's face paled slightly as he turned away i'll speak once more of her and then never again he answered you knew rose better than i did once you tried to tell me she was too fond of admiration and i rebuked you but now i see that your wider experience of women had taught you things i could not then understand she was untrue when you left williamsburg apparently because you had gambled with jewett and afterward fought him i was not misled you made the game of cards a pretense you sought it simply as an opportunity to wreak your vengeance on him for his villainy toward me well it's all over now though you cruelly beat and left him disfigured for life he will live and you are saved from murder thank god when i learned of your departure i yearned to follow then i met a preacher who spoke of having intended to go west with a mr wells of the moravian mission i immediately said i would go in his place and here i am i am fortunate in that i have found both him and you i am sorry i didn't kill you it i certainly meant to anyway there's some comfort in knowing i left my mark on him he was a sneaking cold-blooded fellow with his white hair and pale face and always fawning round the girls i hated him and gave it to him good joe spoke musingly and complacently as though it was a trivial thing to compass the killing of a man well jim you're here now and there's no help for it we'll go along with this moravian preacher and his nieces if you haven't any great regrets for the past why all may be well yet i can see that the border is the place for me but now jim for once in your life take a word of advice from me we're out on the frontier where every man looks after himself your being a minister won't protect you here where every man wears a knife and a tomahawk and where most of them are desperadoes cut out that soft voice and most of your gentle ways and be a little more like your brother be as kind as you like and preach all you want to but when some of these buckskin-legged frontier men try to walk all over you as they will take your own part in a way you have never taken it before i had my lesson the first few days out with the wagon train it was a case of four fights but i'm all right now joe i won't run if that's what you mean answered jim with a laugh yes i understand that a new life begins here and i'm content if i can find my work in it and remain with you i shall be happy ah old mose i'm glad to see you joe cried to the big dog who came nosing round him you've brought this old fellow did you bring the horses look behind the wagon with the dog bounding before him jim did as he was directed and there found two horses tethered side by side little wonder that his eyes gleamed with delight one was jet black the other iron gray and in every line the clean-limbed animals showed the thoroughbred the black threw up his slim head and whinnied with affection clearly shining in his soft dark eyes as he recognized his master lance old fellow how did i ever leave you murmured joe as he threw his arm over the arch neck mose stood by looking up when wagging his tail in token of happiness at the reunion of the three old friends there were tears in joe's eyes when with a last affectionate caress he turned away from his pet come jim i'll take you to mr wells they started across the little square while mose went back under the wagon but at a word from joe he bounded after them trotting contentedly at their heels halfway to the cabins a big raw-boned teamster singing in a drunken voice came staggering toward them evidently he had just left the group of people who had gathered near the indians i didn't expect to see drunkenness out here said jim in a low tone there's lots of it i saw that fellow yesterday when he couldn't walk wentz told me he was a bad customer the teamster his red face bathed in perspiration and his sleeves rolled up showing brown knotty arms lurched toward them as they met he aimed a kick at the dog 
but Mose leaped nimbly aside, avoiding the heavy boot. He did not growl or show his teeth, but the great white head sank forward a little, and the lithe body crouched for a spring. "'Don't touch that dog. He'll tear your leg off,' Joe cried sharply. "'Say, pard, come and have a drink,' replied the teamster with a friendly leer. "'I don't drink,' answered Joe curtly, and moved on. The teamster growled something, of which only the word parson was intelligible to the brothers. Joe stopped and looked back. His gray eyes seemed to contract. They did not flash, but shaded and lost their warmth. Jim saw the change, and knowing what it signified, took Joe's arm as he gently urged him away. The teamster's shrill voice could be heard until they entered the fur trader's cabin. An old man with long white hair flowing from beneath his wide-brimmed hat sat near the door, holding one of Mrs. Wentz's children on his knee. His face was deep-lined and serious, but kindness shone from his mild blue eyes. "'Mr. Wells, this is my brother James. He is a preacher, and has come in place of the man you expected from Williamsburg.' The old minister arose and extended his hand, gazing earnestly at the newcomer meanwhile. Evidently he approved of what he saw in his quick scrutiny of the other's face, for his lips were wreathed with a smile of welcome. "'Mr. Downs, I am glad to meet you, and to know you will go with me. I thank God I shall take into the wilderness one who is young enough to carry on the work when my days are done.' "'I will make it my duty to help you in whatsoever way lies in my power,' answered Jim earnestly. "'We have a great work before us. I have heard many scoffers who claim that it is worse than folly to try to teach these fierce savages Christianity. But I know it can be done, and my heart is in my work. I have no fear, yet I would not conceal from you, young man, that the danger of going among these hostile Indians must be great. I will not hesitate because of that. My sympathy is with the red man. I have had an opportunity of studying Indian nature, and believe the race inherently noble. He has been driven to make war, and I want to help him into other paths." Joe left the two ministers talking earnestly and turned toward Mrs. Wentz. The fur trader's wife was glowing with pleasure. She held in her hand several rude trinkets, and was explaining to her listener, a young woman, that the toys were for the children, having been brought all the way from Williamsburg. "'Kate, where's Nell?' Joe asked of the girl. Uh, she went on an errand for Mrs. Wentz. Kate Wells was the opposite of her sister. Her motions were slow, easy, and consistent with her large, full form. Her brown eyes and hair contrasted sharply with Nell's. The greatest difference in the sisters lay in that Nell's face was sparkling and full of the fire of her eager young life, while Kate's was calm, like the unruffled surface of a deep lake. "'That's Jim, my brother. We're going with you,' said Joe. "'Are you? I'm glad,' answered the girl, looking at the handsome, earnest face of the young minister. "'Your brother is like you for all the world,' whispered Mrs. Wentz. "'He does look like you,' said Kate, with her slow smile. "'Which means you think or hope that that is all,' retorted Joe, laughingly. "'Well, Kate, there the resemblance ends. Thank God for Jim.' He spoke in a sad, bitter tone, which caused both women to look at him wonderingly. Joe had to them ever been full of surprises. Never until then had they seen evidences of sadness in his face. A moment's silence ensued. Mrs. Wentz gazed lovingly at the children, who were playing with the trinkets, while Kate mused over the young man's remark, and began studying his half-averted face. She felt warmly drawn to him by the strange expression in the glance he had given his brother. The tenderness in his eyes did not harmonize with much of this wild and reckless boy's behavior. To Kate he had always seemed so bold, so cold, so different from other men, and yet here was proof that Master Joe loved his brother. The murmured conversation of the two ministers was interrupted by a low cry from outside the cabin. A loud, coarse laugh followed, and then a husky voice, "'Hold on, my pretty lass!' 
joe took two long strides and was on the doorstep he saw nell struggling violently in the grasp of the half-drunken teamster i'll just have to kiss this lassie for luck she said in a tone of good humor at the same instant joe saw three loungers laughing and a fourth a grizzled frontiersman starting forward with a yell let me go cried nell just when the teamster had pulled her close to him and was bending his red moist face to hers two brown sinewy hands grasped his neck with an angry clutch deprived thus of breath his mouth opened his tongue protruded his eyes seemed starting from their sockets and his arms beat the air then he was lifted and flung with a crash against the cabin wall falling he lay in a heap on the grass while the blood flowed from a cut on his temple what's this cried a man authoritatively he had come up swiftly and arrived at the scene where stood the grizzled frontiersman it was pretty handy wince i couldn't have did better myself and i was coming for that purpose said the frontiersman leffler was trying to kiss the lass he's been drunk for two days that little girl's sweetheart can handle himself some now you take my word on it i'll agree laughs bad when he's drinking answered the fur trader and to joe he added he's liable to look you up when he comes around tell him if i'm here when he gets sober i'll kill him joe cried in a sharp voice his gaze rested once more on the fallen teamster and again an odd contraction of his eyes was noticeable the glance was cutting as if with the flash of cold gray steel nell i'm sorry i wasn't round sooner he said apologetically as if it was owing to his neglect the affair had happened as they entered the cabin nell stole a glance at him this was the third time he had injured a man because of her she had on several occasions seen that cold steely glare in his eyes and it had always frightened her it was gone however before they were inside the building he said something which she did not hear distinctly and his calm voice allayed her excitement she had been angry with him but now she realized that her resentment had disappeared he had spoken so kindly after the outburst had he not shown that he considered himself her protector and lover a strange emotion sweet and subtle as the taste of wine thrilled her while a sense of fear because of his strength was mingled with her pride in it any other girl would have been only too glad to have such a champion she would too hereafter for he was a man of whom to be proud look here nell you haven't spoken to me joe cried suddenly seeming to understand that she had not even heard what he said so engrossed had she been with her reflections are you mad with me yet he continued why nell i am in i love you evidently joe thought such fact a sufficient reason for any act on his part his tender tone conquered nell and she turned to him with flushed cheeks and glad eyes i wasn't angry at all she whispered and then eluding the arm he extended she ran into the other room end of chapter two of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter three of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter three joe lounged in the doorway of the cabin thoughtfully contemplating two quiet figures that were lying in the shade of a maple tree one he recognized as the indian with whom jim had spent an earnest hour that morning the red sun of the woods was wrapped in slumber he had placed under his head a many-hued homespun shirt which the young preacher had given him but while asleep his head had rolled off this improvised pillow and the bright garment lay free attracting the eye certainly it had led to the train of thought which had found lodgment in joe's fertile brain the other sleeper was a short stout man whom joe had seen several times before this last fellow did not appear to be well balanced in his mind and was the butt of the settler's jokes while the children called him lurie he like the indian was sleeping off the effects of the previous night's dissipation during a few moments joe regarded the recumbent figures with an expression on his face 
which told that he thought in them were great possibilities for sport. With one quick glance around, he disappeared within the cabin, and when he showed himself at the door, surveying the village square with mirthful eyes, he held in his hand a small basket of Indian design. It was made of twisted grass, and simply contained several bits of soft, chalky stone, such as the Indians used for painting, which collection Joe had discovered among the fur traders' wares. He glanced around once more, and saw that all those in sight were busy with their work. He gave the short man a push, and chuckled when there was no response other than a lazy grunt. Joe took the Indian's gaudy shirt, and lifting Lurie, slipped it around him, shoved the latter's arms through the sleeves, and buttoned it in front. He streaked the round face with red and white paint, and then, dexterously extracting the eagle plume from the Indian's headdress, stuck it in Lurie's thick shock of hair. It was all done in a moment, after which Joe replaced the basket and went down to the river. Several times that morning he had visited the rude wharf where Jeff Lynn, the grizzled old frontiersman, busied himself with preparations for the raft journey down the Ohio. Lynn had been employed to guide the missionary's party to Fort Henry, and as the brothers had acquainted him with their intention of accompanying the travelers, he had constructed a raft for them and their horses. Joe laughed when he saw the dozen two-foot logs fastened together upon which a rude shack had been erected for shelter. This slight protection from sun and storm was all the brothers would have on their long journey. Joe noted, however, that the larger raft had been prepared with some thought for the comfort of the girls. The floor of the little hut was raised so that the waves which broke over the logs could not reach it. Taking a peep into the structure, Joe was pleased to see that Nell and Kate would be comfortable, even during a storm. A buffalo robe and two red blankets gave to the interior a cozy, warm look. He observed that some of the girls' luggage was already on board. "'When'll we be off?' he inquired. "'Sun up,' answered Lynn briefly. "'I'm glad of that. I'd like to be on the go in the early morning,' said Joe cheerfully. "'Most folks from over east ways ain't in a hurry to tackle the river,' replied Lynn, eyeing Joe sharply. "'It's a beautiful river, and I'd like to sail on it from here to where it ends, and then come back to go again,' Joe replied warmly. "'In a hurry to be a-goin'? I'll allow you'll see some slim red devils with feathers in their hair slipping among the trees along the bank, and maybe you'll hear the ping which is made when whistling lead hits. Perhaps you want to be back here by tomorrow sundown.' "'Not I,' said Joe, with his short, cool laugh. The old frontiersman slowly finished his task of coiling up a rope of wet cowhide, and then, producing a dirty pipe, he took a live ember from the fire and placed it on the bowl. He sucked slowly at the pipe stem, and soon puffed out a great cloud of smoke. Sitting on a log, he deliberately surveyed the robust shoulders and long, heavy limbs of the young man, with a keen appreciation of their symmetry and strength. Agility, endurance, and courage were more to a borderman than all else. A newcomer on the frontier was always sized up with reference to these points, and respected in proportion to the measure in which he possessed them. Old Jeff Lynn, riverman, hunter, frontiersman, puffed slowly at his pipe while he mused thus to himself, "'Maybe I'm wrong in taking a liking to this youngster so sudden.' Maybe it's because I'm fond of his sunny-haired lass, and again, maybe it's because I'm getting old and likes young folks better than I once did. Anyway, I'm kinder thinking if this young feller gets worked out, save for about twenty pounds less, he'll lick a whole raft load of wildcats. Joe walked to and fro on the logs, ascertained how the raft was put together, and took a pull on the long, clumsy steering oar. At length he seated himself beside Lynn. He was eager to ask questions, to know about the rafts, the river, the forest, the Indians, everything in connection with this wild life. But already he had learned that questioning these frontiersmen is a sure means of closing their lips. "'Ever handled a long rifle?' asked Lynn after a silence. "'Yes,' answered Joe, simply. "'Ever shoot anything?' the frontiersman questioned when he had taken four or five puffs at his pipe. Squirrels. 
good practice shooting squirrels observed jeff after another silence long enough to allow joe to talk if he was so inclined can you hit one say a hundred yards yes but not every time in the head returned joe there was an apologetic tone in his answer another interval followed in which neither spoke jeff was slowly pursuing his line of thought after joe's last remark he returned his pipe to his pocket and brought out a tobacco pouch he tore off a large portion of the weed and thrust it into his mouth then he held out the little buckskin sack to joe have a chaw he said to offer tobacco to any one was absolutely a borderman's guarantee of friendliness toward that person jeff expectorated half a dozen times each time coming a little nearer the stone he was aiming at some five yards distant possibly this was the borderman's way of oiling up his conversational machinery at all events he commenced to talk your brother's going to preach out there ain't he preaching is all right i'll allow but i'm kind of doubtful about preaching to redskins howsomever i've knowed injuns who are good fellows and there's no tellin what are you going in for a farmin no i wouldn't make a good farmer just come out kind of wild like eh rejoined jeff knowingly i wanted to come west because i was tired of tame life i loved the forest i want to fish and hunt and i think i'd like to to see indians i kind of thought so said the old frontiersman nodding his head as though he perfectly understood joe's case well lad where you're going seein injuns ain't a matter of choice you has to see em and fight em too we've had bad times for years out here on the border and i'm thinkin wuss is comin did you ever hear the name gertie yes he's a renegade he's a traitor and jim and george gertie his brothers are pison rattlesnake injuns simon gertie's bad enough but jim's the wust he's now wussern a full-blooded delaware he's all the time on the lookout to capture white women to take to his injun teepee simon gertie and his pals mckee and elliot deserted from that thar fort right afore your eyes they're now livin among the redskins down fort henry way raisin as much hell for the settlers as they can is fort henry near the indian towns asked joe there's delaware shawnees and hurons all along the ohio below fort henry where is the moravian mission located well lad the village of peace as the indians call it is right in the midst of that injun country i spect it's a matter of a hundred miles below and cross country a little from fort henry the fort must be an important point is it not well i guess so it's the last place on the river answered lynn with a grim smile there's only a stockade there and a handful of men the injuns have stormed down on it time and again but they have never burned it only such men as colonel zane his brother jack and wetzel could have kept that fort standing all these bloody years eb zane's got but a few men yet he can handle em some and with such scouts as jack zane and wetzel he allus knows what's going on among the injuns i've heard of colonel zane he was an officer under lord dunmore the hunters here speak often of jack zane and wetzel what are they jack zane is a hunter and guide i knowed him well a few years back he's a quiet mild chap but a streak of chain lightning when he's riled wetzel is an injun killer some people say as how he's crazy over scalp hunting but i reckon that's not so i've seen him a few times he don't hang around the settlement except when the engines are up and nobody sees him much at home he sets round silent like and then maybe next morning he'll be gone and won't show up for days or weeks but all the frontier knows of his deeds for instance i've heard of settlers getting up in the morning and finding a couple of dead and scalped engines right in front of their cabins no one knowed who killed em but everybody says wetzel he's always warning the settlers when they need to flee to the fort and sure he's right every time because when these men go back to their cabins they find nothing but ashes there couldn't be any farming done out there but for wetzel what does he look like questioned joe much interested wetzel stands straight as the oak over thar 
he'd have to go sideways to get his shoulders in that door but he's as light of foot and fast as a deer and his eyes why lad you can hardly look into em if you ever see wetzel you know him to once i want to see him joe spoke quickly his eyes lighting with an eager flash he must be a great fighter is he lou wetzel is the heftiest of em all and we have some as can fight out here i was down the river a few years ago and joined a party to go out and hunt up some redskins as had been reported wetzel with whistles we soon struck engine sign and then come on to a lot of the pesky varmints we was all for going home because we had a small force and when, when we started to go we finds wetzel sitting calm like on a log we said ain't you going home and he replied i come out here to find redskins and now as we found em i'm not going to run away and we left him settin our oh wetzel is a fighter i hope i shall see him said joe once more the warm light which made him look so boyish still glowing in his face maybe you'll get to and sure you'll see redskins and not tame ones nother at this moment the sound of excited voices near the cabins broke in on the conversation joe saw several persons run toward the large cabin and disappear behind it he smiled as he thought perhaps the commotion had been caused by the awakening of the indian brave rising to his feet joe went toward the cabin and soon saw the cause of the excitement a small crowd of men and women all laughing and talking surrounded the indian brave and the little stout fellow joe heard some one groan and then a deep guttural voice pale face big steel sure injun mad heap mad kill pale face after elbowing his way into the group joe saw the indian holding Luri with one hand while he poked him on the ribs with the other the captive's face was the picture of dismay even the streaks of paint did not hide his look of fear and bewilderment the poor half-witted fellow was so badly frightened that he could only groan silver tip scalp pale face Urgh, growled the savage giving Luri another blow on the side this time he bent over in pain the bystanders were divided in feeling the men laughed while the women murmured sympathetically this is not a bit funny muttered joe as he pushed his way nearly to the middle of the crowd then he stretched out a long arm that bare and brawny looked as though it might have been a blacksmith's and grasped the indian's sinewy wrist with a force that made him loosen his hold on Lurry instantly i stole the shirt fun joke said joe scalp me if you want to scalp any one the indian looked quickly at the powerful form before him with a twist he slipped his arm from joe's grasp big pale face heap fun all squaw play he said scornfully there was a menace in his somber eyes as he turned abruptly and left the group i'm afraid you've made an enemy said jake wentz to joe and the indian never forgets an insult and that's how he regarded your joke silvertip has been friendly here because he sells us his pelts he's a shawnee chief there he goes through the willows by this time jim and mr wells mrs wentz and the girls had joined the group they all watched silvertip get into his canoe and paddle away a bad sign said wentz and then turning to jeff lynn who joined the party at that moment he briefly explained the circumstances never did like silver he's a crafty redskin and not to be trusted replied jeff he has turned around and is looking back nell said quickly so he has observed the fur trader the indian was now several hundred yards down the swift river and for an instant had ceased paddling the sun shone brightly on his eagle plumes he remained motionless for a moment and even at such a distance the dark changeless face could be discerned he lifted his hand and shook it menacingly if you don't hear from that red skin again jeff lynn don't know nothing calmly said the old frontiersman end of chapter three of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter four of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter four 
As the rafts drifted with the current, the voyagers saw the settlers on the landing place diminish until they had faded from indistinct figures to mere black specks against the green background. Then came the last wave of a white scarf, faintly in the distance, and at length the dark outline of the fort was all that remained to their regretful gaze. Quickly that too disappeared behind the green hill, which, with its bold front, forces the river to take a wide turn. The Ohio, winding in its course between high wooded bluffs, rolled on and on into the wilderness. Beautiful as was the ever-changing scenery, rugged gray-faced cliffs on one side, contrasting with green-clad hills on the other, there hovered over land and water something more striking than beauty. Above all hung a still atmosphere of calmness, of loneliness. And this penetrating solitude marred somewhat the pleasure which might have been found in the picturesque scenery, and caused the voyagers to whom this country was new to take less interest in the gaily feathered birds and stealthy animals that were to be seen on the way. By the forms of wild life along the banks of the river, this strange intruder on their peace was regarded with attention. The birds and beasts evinced little fear of the floating rafts. The sand-hill crane, stalking along the shore, lifted his long neck as the unfamiliar thing came floating by, and then stood still and silent as a statue until the rafts disappeared from view. Blue herons, feeding along the bars, saw the unusual spectacle, and, uttering surprised booms, they spread wide wings and lumbered away along the shore. The crows circled above the voyagers, cawing in not unfriendly excitement. Smaller birds alighted on the raised poles, and several, a robin, a catbird, and a little brown wren, ventured with hesitating boldness to peck at the crumbs the girls threw to them. Deer waded knee-deep in the shallow water, and lifting their heads, instantly became motionless and absorbed. Occasionally a buffalo appeared on a level stretch of bank, and tossing his huge head, seemed inclined to resent the coming of this stranger into his domain. All day the rafts drifted steadily and swiftly down the river, presenting to the little party ever-varying pictures of densely wooded hills, of jutting broken cliffs with scant evergreen growth, of long reaches of sandy bar that glistened golden in the sunlight, and over all the flight and call of wild fowl, the flitting of woodland songsters, and now and then the whistle and bellow of the horned watchers in the forest. The intense blue of the vault above began to pale, and low down in the west a few fleecy clouds, gorgeously golden for a fleeting instant, then crimson-crowned for another, shaded and darkened as the setting sun sank behind the hills presently the red rays disappeared a pink glow suffused the heavens and at last as gray twilight stole down over the hilltops the crescent moon peeped above the wooded fringe of the western bluffs hard and fast she is sang out jeff lynn as he fastened the rope to a tree at the head of a small island all off now and we'll have supper there's a fine spring under yon curly birch, and I fetched along a leg of deer meat. Hungry, Lillin? He had worked hard all day steering the rafts, yet Nell had seen him smiling at her many times during the journey, and he had found time before the early start to arrange for her a comfortable seat. There was now a solicitude in the frontiersman's voice that touched her. I'm famished, she replied with her bright smile. I'm afraid I could eat a whole deer. They all climbed the sandy slope and found themselves on the summit of an oval island with a pretty glade in the middle surrounded by birches. Bill, the second raftsman, a stolid, silent man, at once swung his axe upon a log of driftwood. Mr. Wells and Jim walked to and fro under the birches, and Kate and Nell sat on the grass, watching with great interest the old helmsman as he came up from the river his brown hands and face shining from the scrubbing he had given them. Soon he had a fire cheerfully blazing, and after laying out the few utensils, he addressed himself to Joe. 
I'll tell you right here, lad, good venison can be spoiled by bad cutting and cooking. You're slicing it too thick. See, thar. Now salt good, and keep out in the flame on the red coals is best. With a sharpened stick, Jeff held the thin slices over the fire for a few moments. Then he laid them aside on some clean white oak chips Bill's axe had provided. The simple meal of meat, bread, and afterward a drink of the cold spring water was keenly relished by the hungry voyagers. When it had been eaten, Jeff threw a log on the fire and remarked, "Seein' as how we won't be in redskin territory for a while yet, we can have a fire. I'll allow you'll all be chilly and damp from river mist before long, so toast yourselves good. How far have we come today? inquired Mr. Wells, his mind always intent on reaching the scene of his cherished undertaking. About thirty odd mile, I reckon. Not much on a trip, that's sartin, but we'll pick up tomorrow. We've got some quicker water, and the rafts have to go separate. How quiet! exclaimed Kate, suddenly breaking the silence that followed the frontiersman's answer. Beautiful, impetuously said Nell, looking up at Joe. The quick flash from his gray eyes answered her. He did not speak. Indeed, he had said little to her since the start, but his glance showed her how glad he was that she felt the sweetness and content of this wild land. "'I was never in a wilderness before,' broke in the earnest voice of the young minister. "'I feel an almost overpowering sense of loneliness. I want to get near to you all. I feel lost.' yet it is grand sublime here is the promised land the fruitful life nature as it was created by god replied the old minister impressively tell us a story said nell to the old frontiersman as he once more joined the circle round the fire so little un ye want a story queried jeff taking up a live coal and placing it in the bowl of his pipe he took off his coonskin cap and carefully laid it aside. His weather-beaten face beamed in answer to the girl's request. He drew a long and audible pull at his black pipe, and sent forth slowly a cloud of white smoke. Deliberately poking the fire with a stick, as if stirring into life dead embers of the past, he sucked again at his pipe, and emitted a great puff of smoke that completely enveloped the grizzled head. From out that white cloud came his drawling voice. "'You've seen that big curly birch over there. That in his bends kind of sorrowful like. Well, it used to stand straight and proud. I've knowed that tree all the years I've navigated this river, and it seems natural like to me that it now droops dying, for it shades the grave of as young and sweet and pretty a lass as yourself, Miss Nell.' Rivermen call this island George's Island, cause Washington was camped here. But of late years the names got changed, and the men say something like this. We'll try and make Millie's Birch afore sundown, just as Bill and me have done today. Some years ago when I was coming up from Fort Henry, and I had on board my slow old scow, a lass named Millie. We never learned her other name. She come to me at the fort and tells us how her folks had been killed by engines, and she wanted to get back to Pitt to meet her sweetheart. I was again her coming all along, and first off I said no. But when I seen tears in her blue eyes, and she puts her little hand on mine, I just wilted and says to Jim Blair, she goes. Well, just as might have been expected, and fact is i looked for it we was tackled by redskins somehow jim girty got wind of us having a lass aboard and he catched up with us just below here it's a bad place called shawnee rock and i'll show it to you tomorrow the renegade with his red devils attacked us thar and we had a time getting away milly was shot she lived for a while a couple of days and all the time was so patient and sweet and brave with that renegade's bullet in her, for he shot her when he seen he couldn't capture her. 
that there wasn't a blame man of us who wouldn't have died to grant her prayer which was that she could live to once more see her lover there was a long silence during which the old frontiersman sat gazing into the fire with sad eyes we couldn't do nothing and we buried her there under that birch where she smiled her last sad sweet smile and died ever since then the river has been eaten away at this island it's only half as big as it was once and another flood will take away this sandbar these few birches and milly's grave the old frontiersman's story affected all his listeners the elder minister bowed his head and prayed that no such fate might overtake his nieces the young minister looked again as he had many times that day at nell's winsome face the girls cast grave glances at the drooping birch and their bright tears glistened in the fire-glow once more joe's eyes glinted with that steely flash and as he gazed out over the wide darkening expanse of water his face grew cold and rigid i'll allow i might have told a more cheerful story and i'll do so next time but i wanted you all particular the lasses to know something of the kind of country you're going into the frontier needs women but just yet it deals hard with them and jim girty with more of his kind ain't dead yet why don't someone kill him was joe's sharp question easier said than done lad jim girty is a white trader but he's a cunning and fierce redskin in his ways and life he knows the woods as a crow does and he keeps out of sight except when he's least expected then again he's got simon girty his brother and almost the whole redskin tribe behind him injuns stick close to a white man that has turned against his own people and jim girty hain't ever been catched howsomever i heard last trip that he'd been trying some of his tricks round fort henry and that wetzel is on his trail well if it's so that lou wetzel is arter him i wouldn't give a pinch of powder for the white redskin's chances of a long life no one spoke and jeff after knocking the ashes from his pipe went down to the raft returning shortly afterward with his blanket this he laid down and rolled himself in it presently from under his coonskin cap came the words well i've turned in and i advise you all to do the same all save joe and nell acted on jeff's suggestion for a long time the young couple sat close together on the bank gazing at the moonlight on the river the night was perfect a cool wind fanned the dying embers of the fire and softly stirred the leaves earlier in the evening a single frog had voiced his protest against the loneliness but now his dismal croak was no longer heard a snipe belated in his feeding ran along the sandy shore uttering his tweet tweet and his little cry breaking in so softly on the silence seemed only to make more deeply felt the great vast stillness of the night joe's arm was around nell she had demurred at first but he gave no heed to her slight resistance and finally her head rested against his shoulder there was no need of words joe had a pleasurable sense of her nearness and there was a delight in the fragrance of her hair as it waved against his cheek but just then love was not uppermost in his mind all day he had been silent under the force of an emotion which he could not analyze some power some feeling in which the thought of nell had no share was drawing him with irresistible strength nell had just begun to surrender to him in the sweetness of her passion and yet even with that knowledge knocking reproachfully at his heart he could not help being absorbed in the shimmering water and the dark reflection of the trees the gloom and shadow of the forest presently he felt her form relax in his arms then her soft regular breathing told him she had fallen asleep and he laughed low to himself how she would pout on the morrow when he teased her about it 
then realizing that she was tired with her long day's journey he reproached himself for keeping her from the needed rest and instantly decided to carry her to the raft yet such was the novelty of the situation that he yielded to its charm and did not go at once the moonlight found bright threads in her wavy hair it shone caressingly on her quiet face and tried to steal under the downcast lashes joe made a movement to rise with her when she muttered indistinctly as if speaking to someone he remembered then she had once told him that she talked in her sleep and how greatly it annoyed her he might hear something more with which to tease her so he listened yes uncle i will i will go kate we must go another interval of silence then more murmurings he distinguished his own name and presently she called clearly as if answering some inward questioner i love him yes i love joe he has mastered me yet i wish he were like jim jim who looked at me so with his deep eyes and i joe lifted her as if she were a baby and carrying her down to the raft gently laid her by her sleeping sister the innocent words which she should not have heard were like a blow what she would never have acknowledged in her waking hours had been revealed in her dreams he recalled the glance of jim's eyes as it had rested on nell many times that day and now these things were most significant he found at the end of the island a great mossy stone on this he climbed and sat where the moonlight streamed upon him gradually that cold bitterness died out from his face as it passed from his heart and once more he became engrossed in the silver sheen on the water the lapping of the waves on the pebbly beach and in that speaking mysterious silence of the woods when the first faint rays of red streaked over the eastern hilltops and the river mist rose from the water in a vapory cloud jeff lynn rolled out of his blanket stretched his long limbs and gave a hearty call to the morning his cheerful welcome awakened all the voyagers except joe who had spent the night in watching and the early morning in fishing well i'll be darned ejaculated jeff as he saw joe up before me and catched a string of fish what are they asked joe holding up several bronze-backed fish bass black bass and that big feller is a lamb and hefty un how'd you catch em i fish for them well so it appears growled jeff once more reluctantly yielding to his admiration for the lad how'd you wake up so early i stayed up all night i saw three deer swim from the mainland but nothing else came around try your hand at cleanin em for breakfast continued jeff beginning to busy himself with preparations for that meal well well if he ain't surprisin he'll do something out here on the frontier sure as i'm a born sinner he muttered to himself wagging his head in the his quaint manner breakfast over jeff transferred the horses to the smaller raft which he had cut loose from his own and giving a few directions to bill started downstream with mr wells and the girls the rafts remained close together for a while but as the current quickened and was more skillfully taken advantage of by jeff the larger raft gained considerable headway gradually widening the gap between the two all day they drifted from time to time joe and jim waved their hands to the girls but the greater portion of their attention was given to quieting the horses mose joe's big white dog retired in disgust to the hut where he watched and dozed by turns he did not fancy this kind of voyaging bill strained his sturdy arms all day on the steering oar about the middle of the afternoon joe observed that the hills grew more rugged and precipitous and the river ran faster he kept a constant lookout for the wall of rock which marked the point of danger 
when the sun had disappeared behind the hills he saw ahead a gray rock protruding from the green foliage it was ponderous overhanging and seemed to frown down on the river this was shawnee rock joe looked long at the cliff and wondered if there was now an indian scout hidden behind the pines that skirted the edge prominent on the top of the bluff a large dead tree projected its hoary twisted branches bill evidently saw the landmark for he stopped in his monotonous walk to and fro across the raft and pushing his oar amidships he looked ahead for the other raft the figure of the tall frontiersman could be plainly seen as he labored at the helm the raft disappeared round a bend and as it did so joe saw a white scarf waved by nell bill worked the clumsy craft over toward the right shore where the current was more rapid he pushed with all his strength and when the oar had reached its widest sweep he lifted it and ran back across the raft for another push joe scanned the river ahead he saw no rapids only rougher water whirling over some rocks they were where the channel narrowed and ran close to the right-hand bank under a willow flanked ledge was a sandbar to joe there seemed nothing hazardous in drifting through this pass bad place ahead said bill observing joe's survey of the river it doesn't look so replied joe a raft ain't a boat we could pole a boat you has to have water to float logs and the rivers run out considerable i'm only feared for the horses if we hit or drag they might plunge around a bit when the raft passed into the head of the bend it struck the rocks several times but finally gained the channel safely and everything seemed propitious for an easy passage but greatly to bill's surprise the wide craft was caught directly in the channel and swung round so that the steering oar pointed toward the opposite shore the water roared a foot deep over the logs hold hard on the horses yelled bill something's wrong i never seen a snag there the straining mass of logs insecurely fastened together rolled and then pitched loose again but the short delay had been fatal to the steering apparatus joe would have found keen enjoyment in the situation had it not been for his horse lance the thoroughbred was difficult to hold as bill was making strenuous efforts to get in a lucky stroke of the oar he failed to see a long length of grapevine floating like a brown snake of the water below in the excitement they heeded not the barking of mose nor did they see the grapevine straighten and become taut just as they drifted upon it but they felt the raft strike and hold on some submerged object it creaked and groaned and the foamy water surged gurgling between the logs jim's mare snorted with terror and rearing high pulled her halter loose and plunged into the river but jim still held her at risk of being drawn overboard let go she'll drag you in yelled joe grasping him with his free hand lance trembled violently and strained at the rope which his master held with a strong grip crack the stinging report of a rifle rang out above the splashing of the water without a cry bill's grasp on the oar loosened he fell over it limply his head striking the almost submerged log a dark red fluid colored the water then his body slipped over the oar and into the river where it sank my god shot cried jim in horrified tones he saw a puff of white smoke rising above the willows then the branches parted revealing the dark forms of several indian warriors from the rifle in the foremost savage's hand a slight veil of smoke rose with the leap of a panther the redskin sprang from the strip of sand to the raft hold jim drop that axe we're caught cried joe it's that indian from the fort gasped jim the stalwart warrior was indeed silver tip but how changed stripped of the blanket he had worn at the settlement now standing naked but for his buckskin breechcloth with his perfectly proportioned form disclosed in all its sinewy beauty and on his swarthy evil face an expression of savage scorn he surely looked a warrior and a chief 
he drew his tomahawk and flashed a dark glance at joe for a moment he steadily regarded the young man but if he expected to see fear in the latter's face he was mistaken for the look was returned coolly pale-faced steel shirt he said in his deep voice fool pale-face play silver tip no forget End of chapter four of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter five of the spirit of the border by zane gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter five silvertip turned to his braves and giving a brief command sprang from the raft the warriors closed in around the brothers two grasping each by the arms and the remaining indian taking care of the horse the captives were then led ashore where silvertip awaited them when the horse was clear of the raft which task necessitated considerable labor on the part of the indians the chief seized the grapevine that was now plainly in sight and severed it with one blow of his tomahawk the raft dashed forward with a lurch and drifted downstream in the clear water joe could see the cunning trap which had caused the death of bill and ensured the captivity of himself and his brother the crafty savages had trimmed a six-inch sapling and anchored it under the water they waited the heavy end leaving the other pointing upstream to this last had been tied the grapevine when the drifting raft reached the sapling the indians concealed in the willows pulled hard on the improvised rope the end of the sapling stuck up like a hook and the aft was caught and held the killing of the helmsman showed the indians foresight even had the raft drifted on downstream the brothers would have been helpless on a craft they could not manage after all joe thought he had not been so far wrong when he half fancied that an indian lay behind shawnee rock and he marveled at this clever trick which had so easily effected their capture but he had little time to look around at the scene of action there was a moment only in which to study the river to learn if the unfortunate raftsman's body had appeared it was not to be seen the river ran swiftly and hid all evidence of the tragedy under its smooth surface when the brave who had gone back to the raft for the goods joined his companion the two hurried joe up the bank after the others once upon level ground joe saw before him an open forest on the border of this the indians stopped long enough to bind the prisoner's wrists with thongs of deer hide while two of the braves performed this office silvertip leaned against a tree and took no notice of the brothers when they were thus securely tied one of their captors addressed the chief who at once led the way westward through the forest the savages followed in single file with joe and jim in the middle of the line the last indian tried to mount lance but the thoroughbred would have none of him and after several efforts the savage was compelled to desist mose trotted reluctantly along behind the horse although the chief preserved a dignified mien his braves were disposed to be gay they were in high glee over their feat of capturing the pale faces and kept up an incessant jabbering one indian who walked directly behind joe continually prodded him with the stock of a rifle and whenever joe turned the brawny redskin grinned as he grunted Ur! joe observed that this huge savage had a broad face of rather a lighter shade of red than his companions perhaps he intended those rifle prods in friendliness for although they certainly amused him he would allow no one else to touch joe but it would have been more pleasing had he shown his friendship in a gentle manner this indian carried joe's pack much to his own delight especially as his companions evinced an envious curiosity the big fellow would not however allow them to touch it 
he's a cheerful brute remarked joe to jim uh, grunted the big indian jamming joe with his rifle stock joe took heed to the warning and spoke no more he gave all his attention to the course over which he was being taken here was his first opportunity to learn something of indians and their woodcraft it occurred to him that his captors would not have been so gay and careless had they not believed themselves safe from pursuit and he concluded that they were leisurely conducting him to one of the indian towns he watched the supple figure before him wondering at the quick step light as the fall of a leaf and tried to walk as softly he found however that where the indian readily avoided the sticks and brush he was unable to move without snapping twigs now and then he would look up and study the lay of the land ahead and as he came nearer to certain rocks and trees he scrutinized them closely in order to remember their shape and general appearance he believed he was blazing out in his mind this woodland trail so that should fortune favor him and he contrive to escape he would be able to find his way back to the river also he was enjoying the wild scenery the forest would have appeared beautiful even to one indifferent to such charms and joe was far from that every moment he felt steal stronger over him a subtle influence which he could not define half unconsciously he tried to analyze it but it baffled him he could no more explain what fascinated him than he could understand what caused the melancholy quiet which hung over the glades and hollows he had pictured a real forest so differently from this here was a long lane paved with springy moss and fenced by bright green sassafras there a secluded dale dotted with pale blue blossoms over which the giant cottonwoods leaned their heads jealously guarding the delicate flowers from the sun beech trees growing close in clanny groups spread their straight limbs gracefully the white birches gleamed like silver wherever a stray sunbeam stole through the foliage and the oaks monarchs of the forest rose over all dark rugged and kingly joe soon understood why the party traveled through such open forest the chief seeming hardly to deviate from his direct course kept clear of broken ground matted thickets and tangled windfalls joe got a glimpse of dark ravines and heard the music of tumbling waters he saw gray cliffs grown over with vines and full of holes and crevices steep ridges covered with dense patches of briar and hazel rising in the way yet the shawnee always found an easy path the sun went down behind the foliage in the west and shadows appeared low in the glens then the trees faded into an indistinct mass a purple shade settled down over the forest and night brought the party to a halt the indians selected a sheltered spot under the lee of a knoll at the base of which ran a little brook here in this enclosed space were the remains of a campfire evidently the indians had halted there that same day for the logs still smouldered while one brave fanned the embers another took from a neighboring branch a haunch of deer meat a blaze was soon coaxed from the dull coals more fuel was added and presently a cheerful fire shone on the circle of dusky forms it was a picture which joe had seen in many a boyish dream now that he was a part of it he did not dwell on the hopelessness of the situation nor of the hostile chief whose enmity he had incurred almost it seemed he was glad of this chance to watch the indians and listen to them he had been kept apart from jim and it appeared to joe that their captors treated his brother with a contempt which they did not show him silvertip had no doubt informed them that jim had been on his way to teach the indians of the white man's god jim sat with drooping head his face was sad and evidently he took the most disheartening view of his capture when he had eaten the slice of venison given him he lay down with his back to the fire 
Silvertip, in these surroundings, showed his real character. He had appeared friendly in the settlement, but now he was the relentless savage, a son of the wilds, free as an eagle. His dignity as a chief kept him aloof from his braves. He had taken no notice of the prisoners since the capture. He remained silent, steadily regarding the fire with his somber eyes. At length, glancing at the big Indian, he motioned toward the prisoners, and with a single word, stretched himself on the leaves. Joe noted the same changelessness of expression in the other dark faces as he had seen in Silvertip's. It struck him forcibly. When they spoke in their soft, guttural tones, or burst into a low, not unmusical laughter, or sat gazing stolidly into the fire, their faces seemed always the same, inscrutable, like the depths of the forest now hidden in night. One thing Joe felt rather than saw, these savages were fierce and untamable. He was sorry for Jim, because, as he believed, it would be as easy to teach the panther gentleness toward his prey as to instill into one of these wild creatures a belief in Christ. The braves manifested keen pleasure in anticipation as to what they would get out of the pack, which the Indian now opened. Time and again the big brave placed his broad hand on the shoulder of a comrade Indian and pushed him backward. Finally the pack was opened. It contained a few articles of wearing apparel, a pair of boots and a pipe and pouch of tobacco. The big Indian kept the latter articles, grunting with satisfaction, and threw the boots and clothes to the others. Immediately there was a scramble. One brave, after a struggle with another, got possession of both boots. He at once slipped off his moccasins and drew on the white man's foot coverings. He strutted around in them a few moments, but his proud manner soon changed to disgust. Cowhide had none of the soft, yielding qualities of buckskin, and hurt the Indian's feet. Sitting down, he pulled one off, not without difficulty, for the boots were wet. But he could not remove the other. He hesitated a moment, being aware of the subdued merriment of his comrades, and then held up his foot to the nearest one. This chanced to be the big Indian, who evidently had a keen sense of humor, Taking hold of the boot with both hands, he dragged the luckless brave entirely around the campfire. The fun, however, was not to be all one-sided. The big Indian gave a more strenuous pull, and the boot came off suddenly. Unprepared for this, he lost his balance and fell down the bank almost into the creek. He yelled onto the boot, nevertheless, and getting up, threw it into the fire. The braves quieted down after that, and soon lapsed into slumber leaving the big fellow to whom the chief had addressed his brief command acting as guard observing joe watching him as he puffed on his new pipe he grinned and spoke in broken english that was intelligible and much of a surprise to the young man pale face to back eat good then seeing that joe made no effort to follow his brother's initiative for jim was fast asleep he pointed to the recumbent figures and spoke again. Ah, uh, pale face, sleep. Injun wigwams near setting sun. On the following morning, Joe was awakened by the pain in his legs, which had been bound all night. He was glad when the bonds were cut, and the party took up its westward march. The Indians, though somewhat quieter, displayed the same carelessness. They did not hurry nor use particular caution, but selected the most open paths through the forest. They even halted while one of their number crept up on a herd of browsing deer. About noon, the leader stopped to drink from a spring. His braves followed suit and permitted the white prisoners to quench their thirst. When they were about to start again, the single note of a bird far away in the woods sounded clearly on the quiet air. Joe would not have given heed to it had he been less attentive. He instantly associated this peculiar bird note with the sudden stiffening of Silvertip's body and his attitude of intense listening. Low exclamations came from the braves as they bent to catch the lightest sound. 
Presently, above the murmur of the gentle fall of water over the stones, rose that musical note once more. It was made by a bird, Joe thought, and yet, judged by the actions of the Indians, how potent with meaning beyond that of the simple melody of the woodland songster. He turned, half expecting to see somewhere in the treetops the bird which had wrought so sudden a change in his captors. As he did so, from close at hand came the same call, now louder, but identical with the one that had deceived him. It was an answering signal, and had been given by Silvertip. It flashed into Joe's mind that other savages were in the forest. They had run across the Shawnee's trail, and were thus communicating with them. Soon dark figures could be discerned against the patches of green thicket. They came nearer and nearer, and now entered the open glade where Silvertip stood with his warriors. Joe counted twelve, and noted that they differed from his captors. He had only time to see that this difference consisted in the headdress, and in the color and quantity of paint on their bodies, when his gaze was attracted and riveted to the foremost figures. The first was that of a very tall and stately chief, toward whom Silvertip now advanced with every show of respect. In this Indian's commanding stature, in his reddish-bronze face, stern and powerful, there were readable the characteristics of a king. In his deep-set eyes, gleaming from under a ponderous brow, in his mastiff-like jaw, in every feature of his haughty face, were visible all the high intelligence, the consciousness of past valor, and the power and authority that denote a great chieftain. The second figure was equally striking for the remarkable contrast it afforded to the chiefs. Despite the gaudy garments, the paint, the fringed and beaded buckskin leggings, all the Indian accoutrements and garments which bedecked this person, he would have been known anywhere as a white man. His skin was burned to a dark bronze, but it had not the red tinge which characterizes the Indian. The white man had indeed a strange physiognomy. The forehead was narrow and sloped backward from the brow, denoting animal instincts. The eyes were close together, yellowish-brown in color, and had a peculiar vibrating movement, as though they were hung on a pivot like a compass needle. The nose was long and hooked, and the mouth set in a thin, cruel line. There was in the man's aspect an extraordinary combination of ignorance, vanity, cunning, and ferocity. While the two chiefs held a short consultation, this savage-appearing white man addressed the brothers. "'Where are you, and where are you going?' he asked gruffly, confronting Jim. "'My name is Downs. I am a preacher, and was on my way to the Moravian Mission to preach to the Indians. You are a white man. Will you help us?' If Jim expected the information would please his interrogator, he was mistaken. "'So you're one of them. Yes, I'll do something for you when I get back from this hunt. I'll cut your heart out, chop it up, and feed it to the buzzards,' he said fiercely concluding his threat by striking Jim a cruel blow on the head. Joe paled deathly white at this cowardly action, and his eyes, as they met the gaze of the ruffian, contracted with their characteristic steely glow, as if some powerful force within the depths of his being were at white heat, and only this pale flash came to the surface. "'You ain't a preacher?' questioned the man, meeting something in Joe's glance that had been absent from Jim's. Joe made no answer, and regarded the questioner steadily. "'Ever seen me before? Ever hear of Jim Gertie?' he asked boastfully. "'Before you spoke, I knew you were Gertie,' answered Joe quietly. "'How do you know? Ain't you afeard?' "'Of what?' "'Me, me!' Joe laughed in the renegade's face. "'How'd you know me?' growled Gertie. "'I'll see that you have cause to remember me after this.' "'I figured there was only one so-called white man in these woods "'who was coward enough to strike a man whose hands are tied. "'Boy, you're too free with your tongue. "'I'll shut off your wind. 
Gertie's hand was raised, but it never reached Joe's neck. The big Indian had an hour or more previous cut Joe's bonds, but he still retained the thong which was left attached to Joe's left wrist. This allowed the young man free use of his right arm, which, badly swollen or not, he brought into quick action. When the renegade reached toward him, Joe knocked up the hand, and instead of striking, he grasped the hooked nose with all the powerful grip of his fingers. Gertie uttered a frightful curse. He writhed with pain, but could not free himself from the vice-like clutch. He drew his tomahawk, and with a scream aimed a vicious blow at Joe. He missed his aim, however, for Silvertip had intervened and turned the course of the keen hatchet. But the weapon struck Joe a glancing blow, inflicting a painful, though not dangerous, wound. The renegade's nose was skinned and bleeding profusely. He was frantic with fury and tried to get at Joe. But Silvertip remained in front of his captive until some of the braves led Gertie into the forest, where the tall chief had already disappeared. The nose-pulling incident added to the gaiety of the Shawnees, who evidently were pleased with Gertie's discomfiture. They jabbered among themselves and nodded approvingly at Joe, until a few words spoken by Silvertip produced a sudden change. What the words were, Joe could not understand, but to him they sounded like French. He smiled at the absurdity of imagining he had heard a savage speak a foreign language. At any rate, whatever had been said was trenchant with meaning. The Indians changed from gay to grave. They picked up their weapons, and looked keenly on every side. The big Indian at once retied Joe, and then all crowded round the chief. "'Did you hear what Silvertip said? And did you notice the effect it had?' whispered Jim, taking advantage of the moment. "'It sounded like French, but of course it wasn't,' replied Joe. "'It was French, le vent de la mort.' "'By Jove, that's it. What does it mean?' asked Joe, who was not a scholar. "'The wind of death.' "'That's English, but I can't apply it here. Can you?' "'No doubt it is some Indian omen.' The hurried consultation over, Silvertip tied Joe's horse and dog to the trees and once more led the way. This time he avoided the open forest and kept on low ground. For a long time he traveled in the bed of the brook, wading when the water was shallow, and always stepping where there was the least possibility of leaving a footprint. Not a word was spoken. If either of the brothers made the lightest splash in the water or tumbled a stone into the brook, the Indian behind wrapped him on the head with a tomahawk handle. At certain places, Indicated by the care which Silvertip exercised in walking, the Indian in front of the captives turned and pointed where they were to step. They were hiding the trail. Silvertip hurried them over the stony places, went more slowly through the water, and picked his way carefully over the soft ground it became necessary to cross. At times he stopped, remaining motionless many seconds. The vigilance continued all the afternoon. The sun sank, twilight spread its gray mantle, and soon black night enveloped the forest. The Indians halted, but made no fire. They sat close together on a stony ridge, silent and watchful. Joe pondered deeply over this behavior. Did the Shawnees fear pursuit? What had that Indian chief told Silvertip? To Joe it seemed they acted as if believing foes were on all sides. Though they hid their tracks, it was apparently not the fear of pursuit alone which made them cautious. Joe reviewed the afternoon's march and dwelt upon the possible meaning of the cat-like steps, the careful brushing aside of branches, the roving eyes, suspicious and gloomy, the eager watchfulness of the advance as well as to the rear, and always the strained effort to listen, all of which gave him the impression of some grave, unseen danger. And now as he lay on the hard ground, nearly exhausted by the long march, and suffering from the throbbing wound, his courage lessened somewhat, and he shivered with dread. The quiet and gloom of the forest, these fierce wild creatures, 
free in the heart of their own wilderness, yet menaced by a foe, and that strange French phrase which kept recurring in his mind. All had the effect of conjuring up giant shadows in Joe's fanciful mind. During all his life, until this moment, he had never feared anything. Now he was afraid of the darkness. The spectral trees spread long arms overhead, and phantom forms stalked abroad. Somewhere out in that dense gloom stirred this mysterious foe, the wind of death. Nevertheless, he finally slept. In the dull gray light of early morning, the Indians once more took up the line of march toward the west. They marched all that day, and at dark halted to eat and rest. Silvertip and another Indian stood watch. Some time before morning, Joe suddenly awoke. The night was dark, yet it was lighter than when he had fallen asleep. A pale crescent moon shone dimly through the murky clouds. There was neither movement of the air nor the chirp of an insect. Absolute silence prevailed. Joe saw the Indian guard leaning against a tree, asleep. Silvertip was gone. The captive raised his head and looked around for the chief. There were only four Indians left, three on the ground and one against the tree. He saw something shining near him. He looked more closely and made out the object to be an eagle plume Silvertip had worn in his headdress. It lay on the ground near the tree. Joe made some slight noise which awakened the guard. The Indian never moved a muscle, but his eyes roved everywhere. He, too, noticed the absence of the chief. At this moment, from out of the depths of the woods, came a swelling sigh, like the moan of the night wind. It rose and died away, leaving the silence apparently all the deeper. A shudder ran over Joe's frame. Fascinated, he watched the guard. The Indian uttered a low gasp. His eyes started and glared wildly. He rose very slowly to his full height and stood waiting, listening. The dark hand which held the tomahawk trembled, so that little glints of moonlight glanced from the bright steel. From far back in the forest deeps came that low moaning. Um it rose from a faint murmur and swelled to a deep moan soft but clear and ended in a wail like that of a lost soul the break it made in that dead silence was awful joe's blood seemed to have curdled and frozen a cold sweat oozed from his skin and it was as if a clammy hand clutched at his heart he tried to persuade himself that the fear displayed by the savage was only superstition and that that moan was but the sigh of the night wind. The Indian sentinel stood as if paralyzed an instant after that weird cry, and then, swift as a flash, and as noiseless, he was gone into the gloomy forest. He had fled, without awakening his companions. Once more the moaning cry arose, and swelled mournfully on the still night air. It was close at hand. The wind of death, whispered Joe. He was shaken and unnerved by the events of the past two days, and dazed from his wound. His strength deserted him, and he lost consciousness. End of chapter 5 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter Six of *The Spirit of the Border* by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Six. One evening, several days previous to the capture of the brothers, a solitary hunter stopped before a deserted log cabin which stood on the bank of a stream fifty miles or more inland from the Ohio River. It was rapidly growing dark. A fine drizzling rain had set in, and a rising wind gave promise of a stormy night. Although the hunter seemed familiar with his surroundings, 
he moved cautiously and hesitated as if debating whether he should seek the protection of this lonely hut or remain all night under dripping trees feeling of his hunting frock he found that it was damp and slippery this fact evidently decided him in favor of the cabin for he stooped his tall figure and went in it was pitch dark inside but having been there before the absence of a light did not trouble him he readily found the ladder leading to the loft ascended it and lay down to sleep during the night a noise awakened him for a moment he heard nothing except the fall of the rain then came the hum of voices followed by the soft tread of moccasined feet he knew there was an indian town ten miles across the country and believed some warriors belated on a hunting trip had sought the cabin for shelter the hunter lay perfectly quiet awaiting developments if the indians had flint and steel and struck a light he was almost certain to be discovered he listened to their low conversation and understood from the language that they were delawares a moment later he heard the rustling of leaves and twigs accompanied by the metallic click of steel against some hard substance the noise was repeated and then followed by a hissing sound which he knew to be the burning of a powder on a piece of dry wood after which rays of light filtered through cracks of the unstable floor of the loft the man placed his eye to one of these crevices and counted eleven indians all young braves with the exception of the chief the indians had been hunting they had haunches of deer and buffalo tongues together with several packs of hides some of them busied themselves drying their weapons others sat down listlessly plainly showing their weariness and two worked over the smouldering fire the damp leaves and twigs burned faintly yet there was enough to cause the hunter fear that he might be discovered he believed he had not much to worry about from the young braves but the hawk-eyed chief was dangerous and he was right presently the stalwart chief heard or saw a drop of water fall from the loft it came from the hunter's wet coat almost any one save an indian scout would have fancied this came from the roof as the chief's gaze roamed everywhere over the interior of the cabin his expression was plainly distrustful his eye searched the wet clay floor but hardly could have discovered anything there because the hunter's moccasined tracks had been obliterated by the footprints of the indians the chief's suspicions seemed to be allayed but in truth this chief with the wonderful sagacity natural to indians had observed matters which totally escaped the young braves and like a wily old fox he waited to see which cub would prove the keenest not one of them however noted anything unusual they sat around the fire ate their meat and parched corn and chatted volubly the chief arose and walking to the ladder ran his hand along one of the rungs ah huh, he exclaimed instantly he was surrounded by ten eager bright-eyed braves he extended his open palm it was smeared with wet clay like that under his feet simultaneously with their muttered exclamations the braves grasped their weapons they knew there was a foe above them it was a pale face for an indian would have revealed himself the hunter seeing he was discovered acted with the unerring judgment and lightning-like rapidity of one long accustomed to perilous situations drawing his tomahawk and noiselessly stepping to the hole in the loft he leaped into the midst of the astounded indians rising from the floor like the rebound of a rubber ball his long arm with the glittering hatchet made a wide sweep and the young braves scattered like frightened sheep he made a dash for the door and incredible as it may seem his movements were so quick he would have escaped from their very midst without a scratch but for one unforeseen circumstance the clay floor was wet and slippery his feet were hardly in motion before they slipped from under him and he fell headlong with loud yells of triumph the band jumped upon him 
there was a convulsive heaving motion of the struggling mass one frightful cry of agony and then hoarse commands three of the braves ran to their packs from which they took cords of buckskin so exceedingly powerful was the hunter that six indians were required to hold him while the others tied his hands and feet then with grunts and chuckles of satisfaction they threw him into a corner of the cabin two of the braves had been hurt in the brief struggle one having a badly wrenched shoulder and the other a broken arm so much for the hunter's power in that single moment of action the loft was searched and found to be empty then the excitement died away and the braves settled themselves down for the night the injured ones bore their hurts with characteristic stoicism if they did not sleep both remained quiet and not a sigh escaped them the wind changed during the night the storm abated and when daylight came the sky was cloudless the first rays of the sun shone in the open door lighting up the interior of the cabin a sleepy indian who had acted as guard stretched his limbs and yawned he looked for the prisoner and saw him sitting up in the corner one arm was free and the other nearly so he had almost untied the thongs which bound him a few moments more and he would have been free ah exclaimed the young brave awakening his chief and pointing to the hunter the chief glanced at his prisoner then looked more closely and with one spring was on his feet a drawn tomahawk in his hand a short shrill yell issued from his lips roused by that clarion call the young braves jumped up trembling in eager excitement the chief's summons had been the sharp war cry of the delawares he manifested as intense emotion as could possibly have been betrayed by a mature and experienced chieftain and pointing to the hunter he spoke a single word at noonday the indians entered the fields of corn which marked the outskirts of the delaware encampment Kalu, Kalu, Kalu. the long signal heralding the return of the party with important news pealed throughout the quiet valley and scarcely had the echoes died away when from the village came answering shouts once beyond the aisles of waving corn the hunter saw over the shoulders of his captors the home of the red men a grassy plain sloping gradually from the woody hill to a winding stream was brightly beautiful with chestnut trees and long well-formed lines of lodges many hued blankets hung fluttering in the sun and rising lazily were curling columns of blue smoke the scene was picturesque and reposeful the vivid hues suggesting the indian's love of color and ornament the absence of life and stir his languorous habit of sleeping away the hot noonday hours the loud whoops however changed the quiet encampment into a scene of animation children ran from the wigwams maidens and braves dashed here and there squaws awakened from their slumber and many a doughty warrior rose from his rest in the shade french fur traders came curiously from their lodges and renegades hurriedly left their blankets roused to instant action by the well-known summons the hunter led down the lane toward the approaching crowd presented a calm and fearless demeanor when the indians surrounded him one prolonged furious yell rent the air and then followed an extraordinary demonstration of fierce delight the young brave's staccato yell the maiden's scream the old squaw's screech and the deep war cry of the warriors intermingled in a fearful discordance often had this hunter heard the name which the indian called him he had been there before a prisoner he had run the gauntlet down the lane he had been bound to a stake in front of the lodge where his captors were now leading him he knew the chief wingenund sachem of the delawares since that time now five years ago when wingenund had tortured him they had been bitterest foes if the hunter heard the hoarse cries or the words hissed into his ears if he saw the fiery glances of hatred and sudden giving way to ungovernable rage unusual to the indian nature 
if he felt in their fierce exultation the hopelessness of succor or mercy he gave not the slightest sign atalang 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 rang out the strange indian name the french traders like real savages ran along with the procession their feathers waving their paint shining their faces expressive of as much excitement as the indians as they cried aloud in their native tongue le vent de la mort le vent de la mort le vent de la mort the hunter while yet some paces distant saw the lofty figure of the chieftain standing in front of his principal men well he knew them all there were the crafty pipe and his savage comrade the half-king there was shingis who wore on his forehead a scar the mark of the hunter's bullet there were kotoxen the lynx and misepa the source and winstona the war cloud chiefs of sagacity and renown three renegades completed the circle and these three traitors represented a power which had for ten years left an awful bloody trail over the country simon girty the so-called white indian with his keen authoritative face turned expectantly elliot the tory deserter from fort pitt a wiry spider-like little man and last the gaunt and gaudily arrayed form of the demon of the frontier jim girty the procession halted before this group and two brawny braves pushed the hunter forward simon girty's face betrayed satisfaction elliot's shifty eyes snapped and the dark repulsive face of the other girty exhibited an exultant joy these desperadoes had feared this hunter wagenand with a majestic wave of his arm silenced the yelling horde of frenzied savages and stepped before the captive the deadly foes were once again face to face the chieftain's lofty figure and dark sleek head now bare of plumes towered over the other indians but he was not obliged to lower his gaze in order to look straight into the hunter's eyes verily this hunter merited the respect which shone in the great chieftain's glance like a mountain ash he stood straight and strong his magnificent frame tapering wedge-like from his broad shoulders the bulging line of his thick neck the deep chest the knotty contour of his bared forearm and the full curves of his legs all denoted a wonderful muscular development the power expressed in this man's body seemed intensified in his features his face was white and cold his jaw square and set his coal-black eyes glittered with almost a superhuman fire and his hair darker than the wing of a crow fell far below his shoulders matted and tangled as it was still it hung to his waist and had it been combed out must have reached his knees one long moment wingenon stood facing his foe and then over the multitude and through the valley rose his sonorous voice death wind dies at dawn the hunter was tied to a tree and left in view of the indian populace the children ran fearfully by the braves gazed long at the great foe of their race the warriors passed in gloomy silence the savages tricks of torture all their diabolical ingenuity of inflicting pain was suppressed awaiting the hour of sunrise when this hated long knife was to die only one person offered an insult to the prisoner he was a man of his own color jim girty stopped before him his yellowish eyes lighted by a tigerish glare his lips curled in a snarl and from between them issuing the odor of the fur trader's vile rum you'll soon be feed for the buzzards he croaked in his hoarse voice he had so often strewed the plains with human flesh for the carrion birds that the thought had a deep fascination for him do you hear scalp hunter feed for buzzards he deliberately spat in the hunter's face do you hear he repeated there was no answer save that which glittered in the hunter's eye but the renegade could not read it because he did not meet that flaming glance wild horses could not have dragged him to face this man had he been free 
Even now a chill crept over Gertie. For a moment he was enthralled by a mysterious fear, half paralyzed by a foreshadowing of what would be this hunter's vengeance. Then he shook off his craven fear. He was free. The hunter's doom was sure. His sharp face was again wreathed in a savage leer, and he spat once more on the prisoner. His fierce impetuosity took him a step too far. The hunter's arms and waist were fastened, but his feet were free. His powerful leg was raised suddenly, his foot struck Gertie in the pit of the stomach. The renegade dropped, limp and gasping. The braves carried him away, his gaudy feathers trailing, his long arms hanging inertly and his face distorted with agony. The maidens of the tribe, however, showed for the prisoner an interest that had in it something of veiled sympathy. Indian girls were always fascinated by white men. Many records of Indian maidens' kindness, of love, of heroism for white prisoners brighten the dark pages of frontier history. These girls walked past the hunter, averting their eyes when within his range of vision, but stealing many a sidelong glance at his impressive face and noble proportions. One of them particularly attracted the hunter's eye. This was because, as she came by with her companions, while they all turned away, she looked at him with her soft, dark eyes. She was a young girl whose delicate beauty bloomed fresh and sweet as that of a wild rose. Her costume, fringed, beaded, and exquisitely wrought with fanciful design, betrayed her rank. She was Wingenund's daughter. The hunter had seen her when she was a child, and he recognized her now. He knew that the beauty of Aeola, of whispering winds among the leaves, had been sung from the Ohio to the Great Lakes. Often she passed him that afternoon. At sunset, as the braves untied him and led him away, he once more caught the full, intense gaze of her lovely eyes. That night, as he lay securely bound in the corner of a lodge, and the long hours wore slowly away, he strained at his stout bonds, and in his mind revolved different plans of escape. It was not in this man's nature to despair. While he had life, he would fight. From time to time he expanded his muscles, striving to loosen the wet buckskin thongs. The dark hours slowly passed, no sound coming to him, save the distant bark of a dog and the monotonous tread of his guard. A dim grayness pervaded the lodge. Dawn was close at hand. His hour was nearly come. Suddenly his hearing, trained to a most acute sensibility, caught a faint sound, almost inaudible. It came from without, on the other side of the lodge. There it was again, a slight tearing sound, such as is caused by a knife when it cuts through soft material. Someone was slitting the wall of the lodge. The hunter rolled noiselessly over and over until he lay against the skins. In the dim grayness, he saw a bright blade moving carefully upward through the deer hide. Then a long knife was pushed into the opening. A small brown hand grasped the hilt. Another little hand followed and felt of the wall and floor, reaching out with groping fingers. The hunter rolled again so that his back was against the wall and his wrists in front of the opening. He felt the little hand on his arm. Then it slipped down to his wrists. The contact of cold steel set a tremor of joy through his heart. The pressure of his bonds relaxed, ceased. His arms were free. He turned to find the long-bladed knife on the ground. The little hands were gone. In a twinkling he rose, unbound, armed, desperate. In another second an Indian warrior lay upon the ground in his death rose while a fleeing form vanished in the gray morning mist. End of chapter 6 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio
Chapter Seven of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Seven. Joe felt the heavy lethargy rise from him like the removal of a blanket. His eyes became clear, and he saw the trees and the forest gloom. Slowly he realized his actual position. He was a prisoner, lying helpless among his sleeping captors. Silvertip and the guard had fled into the woods, frightened by the appalling moan which they believed sounded their death knell, and Joe believed he might have fled himself had he been free. What could have caused that sound? He fought off the numbing chill that once again began to creep over him. He was wide awake now, his head was clear, and he resolved to retain his senses. He told himself there could be nothing supernatural in that wind, or wail, or whatever it was, which had risen murmuring from out the forest depths. Yet, despite his reasoning, Joe could not allay his fears. That thrilling cry haunted him. The frantic flight of an Indian brave, nay of a cunning, experienced chief, was not to be lightly considered. The savages were at home in these untracked wilds. Trained from infancy, to scent danger and to fight when they had an equal chance they surely would not run without good cause joe knew that something moved under those dark trees he had no idea what it might be the fretting night wind or a stealthy prowling soft-footed beast or a savage alien to these wild indians and wilder than they by far the chirp of a bird awoke the stillness night had given way to morning welcoming the light that was chasing away the gloom joe raised his head with a deep sigh of relief as he did so he saw a bush move then a shadow seemed to sink into the ground he had seen an object lighter than the trees darker than the gray background again that strange sense of the nearness of something thrilled him moments passed to him long as hours he saw a tall fern waver and tremble a rabbit or perhaps a snake had brushed it other ferns moved their tops agitated perhaps by a faint breeze no that wavering line came straight toward him it could not be the wind it marked the course of a creeping noiseless thing it must be a panther crawling nearer and nearer Joe opened his lips to awaken his captors, but could not speak. It was as if his heart had stopped beating. Twenty feet away the ferns were parted to disclose a white gleaming face with eyes that seemingly glittered. Brawny shoulders were upraised, and then a tall, powerful man stood revealed. Lightly he stepped over the leaves into the little glade. He bent over the sleeping Indians. Once, twice, Three times a long blade swung high. One brave shuddered, another gave a sobbing gasp, and the third moved two fingers. Thus they passed from life to death. Wetzel, cried Joe. I reckon so, said the deliverer, his deep, calm voice contrasting strangely with what might have been expected from his aspect. Then, seeing Joe's head covered with blood, he continued, able to get up i'm not hurt answered joe rising when his bonds had been cut brothers i reckon wetzel said bending over jim yes we're brothers wake up jim wake up we're saved what who's that cried jim sitting up and staring at wetzel this man has saved our lives see jim the indians are dead and jim it's wetzel the hunter you remember Jeff Lynn said I'd know him if I ever saw him, and— uh, What happened to Jeff? inquired Wetzel, interrupting. He had turned from Jim's grateful face. Jeff was on the first raft, and for all we know, he's now safe at Fort Henry. Our steersman was shot, and we were captured. Has the Shawnee anything against you boys? Why, yes, I guess so. I played a joke on him, took his shirt, put it on another fellow might just as well kick an engine what is he again you i don't know perhaps he did not like my talk to him answered jim 
I am a preacher and have come west to teach the gospel to the Indians. They're good Indians now, said Wetzel, pointing to the prostrate figures. How did you find us? eagerly asked Joe. Run right across your trail two days back. And you've been following us? The hunter nodded. Did you see anything of another band of Indians? A tall chief and Jim Girty were among them. They've been arter me for two days. I was following you when Silvertip got wind of Girty and his Delawares. The big chief was winging and I seen you pull Girty's nose. Arter the Delawares went, I turned loose your dog and horse and lit out on your trail. Well, where are the Delawares now? I reckon they're nosing my back trail. We must be getting. Silvertip will soon have a lot of engines here. Joe intended to ask the hunter about what had frightened the Indians, but despite his eager desire for information, he refrained from doing so. Gertie and I did for you, remarked Wetzel, examining Joe's wound. He's in a bad humor. He got kicked a few days back. Then he had the skin pulled off in his nose. Somebody'll have to suffer. Well, you fellers, grab your rifles, and we'll be starting for the fort. Joe shuddered as he leaned over one of the dusky forms to detach powder and bullet horn. He had never seen a dead Indian, and the tense face, the sightless vacant eyes, made him shrink. He shuddered again when he saw the hunter scalp his victims. He shuddered the third time when he saw Witzel pick up Silvertip's beautiful white eagle plume, dabble it in a pool of blood, and stick it in the bark of a tree. Bereft of its graceful beauty, drooping with its gory burden, the long feather was a deadly message. It had been Silvertip's pride. It was now a challenge, a menace to the Shawnee chief. Come, said Wetzel, leading the way into the forest. Shortly after daylight, on the second day following the release of the Downs brothers, the hunter rushed through a thicket of alder and said, Thar's Fort Henry. The boys were on the summit of a mountain, from which the land sloped in a long incline of rolling ridges and gentle valleys like a green billowy sea, until it rose again abruptly into a peak higher still than the one upon which they stood. The broad Ohio, glistening in the sun, lay at the base of the mountain. Upon the bluff overlooking the river and under the brow of the mountain lay the frontier fort. In the clear atmosphere it stood out in bold relief. A small, low structure surrounded by a high stockade fence was all, and yet it did not seem unworthy of its fame. Those watchful, forbidding loopholes, the blackened walls and timbers, told the history of ten long, bloody years. The whole effect was one of menace, as if the fort sent out a defiance to the wilderness and meant to protect the few dozen log cabins clustered on the hillside. "'How will we ever get across that big river?' asked Jim, practically. "'Wade, swim,' answered the hunter laconically, and began the descent of the ridge. An hour's rapid walking brought the three to the river. Depositing his rifle in a clump of willows, and directing the boys to do the same with their guns, the hunter splashed into the water. His companions followed him into the shallow water, and waded a hundred yards, which brought them near the island that they now perceived hid the fort. The hunter swam the remaining distance, and climbing the bank, looked back for the boys. They were close behind him. Then he strode across the island, perhaps a quarter of a mile wide. "'We will long swim here,' said Wetzel, waving his hand toward the main channel of the river. "'Good for it?' he inquired of Joe, since Jim had not received any injuries during the short captivity, and consequently showed more endurance. "'Good for anything,' answered Joe, with that coolness Wetzel had been quick to observe in him. The hunter cast a sharp glance at the lad's haggard face, his bruised temple, and his hair matted with blood. In that look he read Joe thoroughly. Had the young man known the result of that scrutiny, he would have been pleased as well as puzzled for the hunter had said to himself, A brave lad, and the border fever is on him. Swim close to me, said Wetzel, and he plunged into the river. The task was accomplished without accident. See the big cabin thar on the hillside? Thar's Colonel Zane in the door, said Wetzel. 
As they neared the building, several men joined the one who had been pointed out as the colonel. It was evident the boys were the subject of their conversation. Presently Zane left the group and came toward them. The brothers saw a handsome, stalwart man in the prime of life. "'Well, Lou, what luck?' he said to Wetzel. Uh, "'Not much. I treed five engines, and two got away,' answered the hunter as he walked toward the fort. "'Lads, welcome to Fort Henry,' said Colonel Zane, a smile lighting his dark face. "'The others of your party arrived safely. They certainly will be overjoyed to see you.' Uh, "'Colonel Zane, I had a letter from my uncle to you,' replied Jim. "'But the Indians took that, and everything else we had with us.' "'Oh, never mind the letter. I knew your uncle, and your father, too. Come into the house and change those wet clothes. And you, my lad, have got an ugly knock on the head. Who gave you that?' jim girty what exclaimed the colonel jim girty did that he was with a party of delawares who ran across us they were searching for wetzel girty with the delawares the devil's to pay now and you say hunting wetzel i must learn more about this it looks bad but tell me how did girty come to strike you i pulled his nose you did good good cried colonel sane heartily by george that's great uh tell me but wait until you are more comfortable your packs came safely on jeff's raft and you'll find them inside as joe followed the colonel he heard one of the other men say like as two peas in a pod farther on he saw an indian standing a little apart from the others hearing joe's slight exclamation of surprise he turned disclosing a fine manly countenance characterized by calm dignity the indian read the boy's thought uh, ye friend he said in english oh that's my shawnee guide tommy pomihala he's a good fellow although jonathan and wetzel declare the only good indian is a dead one come right in here there are your packs and you'll find water outside the door thus saying colonel zane led the brothers into a small room brought out their packs and left them he came back presently with a couple of soft towels now you lads fix up a bit and come out and meet my family and tell us all about your adventure by that time dinner will be ready gee minnie don't that towel remind you of home said joe when the colonel had gone from the looks of things colonel zane means to have comfort here in the wilderness he struck me as being a fine man the boys were indeed glad to change the few articles of clothing the indians had left them and when they were shaved and dressed they presented an entirely different appearance once more they were twin brothers in costume and feature joe contrived by brushing his hair down on his forehead to conceal the discolored bump i think i saw a charming girl observed joe suppose you did what then asked jim severely why nothing see here mayn't i admire a pretty girl if i want no you may not joe will nothing ever cure you i should think the thought of miss wells look here jim she don't care at least it's very little she cares and i'm i'm not worthy of her turn around and face me said the young minister sharply joe turned and looked in his brother's eyes have you trifled with her as you have with so many others tell me i know you don't lie no then what do you mean well nothing much jim except i'm really not worthy of her i'm no good you know and she ought to get a fellow like like you absurd you ought to be ashamed of yourself never mind me see here don't you admire her why why yes stammered jim flushing a dark guilty red at the direct question who could help admiring her that's what i thought and i know she admires you for qualities which i lack nell's like a tender vine just beginning to creep around and cling to something strong she cares for me but her love is like the vine it, it may hurt her a little to tear that love away but it won't kill her and in the end it will be best for her you need a good wife what could i do with the woman go in and win her jim oh you're sacrificing yourself again for me cried jim white to the lips it's wrong to yourself and wrong to her i tell you enough joe's voice cut in cold and sharp usually you influence me but sometimes you can't i say this 
Nell will drift into your arms as surely as the leaf falls. It will not hurt her, will be best for her. Remember, she is yours for the winning. You do not say whether that will hurt you, whispered Jim. Come, we'll find Colonel Zane, said Joe, opening the door. They went out in the hallway which opened into the yard, as well as the larger room through which the colonel had first conducted them. As Jim, who was in advance, passed into this apartment, a trim figure entered from the yard. It was Nell, and she ran directly against him. Her face was flushed, her eyes were beaming with gladness, and she seemed the incarnation of girlish joy. Oh, Joe, was all she whispered. But the happiness and welcome in that whisper could never have been better expressed in longer speech. Then slightly, ever so slightly, she tilted her sweet face up to his. It all happened with a quickness of thought. In a single instant, Jim saw the radiant face, the outstretched hands, and heard the glad whisper. He knew that she had again mistaken him for Joe, but for his life he could not draw back his head. He had kissed her, and even as his lips thrilled with her tremulous caress, he flushed with the shame of his deceit. "'You're mistaken again. I'm Jim,' he whispered. For a moment they stood staring into each other's eyes, slowly awakening to what had really happened, slowly conscious of a sweet, alluring power. Then Colonel Zane's cheery voice rang in their ears. "'Ah, oh, here's Nellie and your brother. Now, lads, tell me which is which.' "'That's Jim, and I'm Joe,' answered the latter. He appeared not to notice his brother, and his greeting to Nell was natural and hearty. For the moment she drew the attention of the others from them. Joe found himself listening to the congratulations of a number of people. Among the many names he remembered were those of Mrs. Zane, Silas Zane, and Major McCulloch. Then he found himself gazing at the most beautiful girl he had ever seen in his life. Uh, my only sister, Mrs. Alfred Clark, once Betty Zane, and the heroine of Fort Henry said Colonel Zane proudly, with his arm around the slender, dark-eyed girl. "'I would brave the Indians and the wilderness again for this pleasure,' replied Joe gallantly, as he bowed low over the little hand she cordially extended. "'Bess, is dinner ready?' inquired Colonel Zane of his comely wife. She nodded her head, and the colonel led the way into the adjoining room. "'I know you boys must be hungry as bears.' During the meal, Colonel Zane questioned his guests about their journey, and as to the treatment they had received at the hands of the Indians. He smiled at the young minister's earnestness in regard to the conversion of the red men, and he laughed outright when Joe said he guessed he came to the frontier because it was too slow at home. "'I am sure your desire for excitement will soon be satisfied, if indeed it be not so already,' remarked the colonel. But as to the realization of your brother's hopes, I am not so sanguine. Undoubtedly, the Moravian missionaries have accomplished wonders with the Indians. Not long ago I visited the village of Peace, the Indian name for the mission, and was struck by the friendliness and industry which prevail there. Truly, it was a village of peace. Yet it is almost too early to be certain of permanent success of this work. The Indian's nature is one hard to understand. He is naturally roving and restless, which, however, may be owing to his habit of moving from place to place in search of good hunting grounds. I believe, though I must confess I haven't seen any pioneers who share my belief, that the savage has a beautiful side to his character. I know of many noble deeds done by them, and I believe, if they are honestly dealt with, they will return good for good. There are bad ones, of course, but the French traders, and men like the Gerties, have caused most of this long war. Jonathan and Wetzel tell me the Shawnees and Chippewas have taken the warpath again. Then the fact that the Gerties are with the Delawares is reason for alarm. We have been comparatively quiet here of late. Did you boys learn to what tribe your captors belong? Did Wetzel say? He did not. He spoke a little, but I will say he was exceedingly active, answered Joe with a smile. To have seen Wetzel fight Indians is something you are not likely to forget, said Colonel Zane grimly. 
Now tell me, how did those Indians wear their scalp lock? Uh, their heads were shaved closely, with the exception of a little place on top. The remaining hair was twisted into a tuft, tied tightly, and into this had been thrust a couple of painted pins. When Wetzel scalped the Indians, the pins fell out. I picked one up and found it to be bone. You will make a woodsman, that's certain, replied Colonel Zane. The Indians were Shawnee on the warpath. Well, we will not borrow trouble, for when it comes in the shape of redskins, it usually comes quickly. Mr. Wells seemed anxious to resume the journey down the river, but I shall try to persuade him to remain with us a while. Indeed, I am sorry I cannot keep you all here at Fort Henry, and more especially the girls. On the border we need young people, and while I do not want to frighten the women, I fear there will be more than Indians fighting for them. I hope not, but we have come prepared for anything, said Kate, with a quiet smile. Our home was with Uncle, and when he announced his intention of going west, we decided our duty was to go with him. You were right, and I hope you will find a happy home, rejoined Colonel Zane. If life among the Indians proves to be too hard, we shall welcome you here. Betty, show the girls your pets and Indian trinkets. I'm going to take the boys to Silas's cabin to see Mr. Wells, and then show them over the fort. As they went out, Joe saw the Indian guide standing in exactly the same position as when they entered the building. Can't that Indian move? he asked curiously. He can cover one hundred miles in a day when he wants to, replied Colonel Zane. He's resting now. An Indian will often stand or sit in one position for many hours. He's a fine-looking chap, remarked Joe, and then to himself, but I don't like him. I guess I'm prejudiced. You learn to like Tomei, as we call him. Colonel Zane, I want a light for my pipe. I haven't had a smoke since the day we were captured. That blamed redskin took my tobacco. It's lucky I had some in my other pack. I'd like to meet him again, also Silvertip and that brute dirty. My lad, don't make such wishes, said Colonel Zane earnestly. You were indeed fortunate to escape, and I can well understand your feelings. There's nothing I should like better than to see Gertie over the sights of my rifle. But I never hunt after danger, and to look for Gertie is to court death. But Wetzel, ah, my lad, I know, Wetzel goes alone in the woods. But then he is different from other men. Before you leave, I will tell you all about him. Colonel Zane went around the corner of the cabin and returned with a live coal on a chip of wood, which Joe placed in the bowl of his pipe, and because of the strong breeze stepped close to the cabin wall. Being a keen observer, he noticed many small round holes in the logs. They were so near together that the timbers had an odd speckled appearance, and there was hardly a place where he could have put his thumb without covering a hole. At first he thought they were made by a worm or bird peculiar to that region but finally he concluded that they were bullet holes. He thrust his knife blade into one, and out rolled a leaden ball. I'd like to have been here when these were made, he said. Well, at the time, I wished I was back on the Potomac, replied Colonel Zane. They found the old missionary on the doorstep of the adjacent cabin. He appeared discouraged when Colonel Zane interrogated him, and said that he was impatient because of the delay. Mr. Wells, is it not possible that you underrate the danger of your enterprise? I fear not but the Lord, answered the old man. Do not you fear for those with you, went on the colonel earnestly. I am heart and soul with you in your work, but want to impress upon you that the time is not propitious. It is a long journey to the village, and the way is beset with dangers of which you have no idea. Will you not remain here with me for a few weeks? or at least until my scouts report. I thank you, but go I will. Then let me entreat you to remain here a few days, so that I may send my brother Jonathan and Wetzel with you. If any can guide you safely to the village of peace, it will be they. At this moment Joe saw two men approaching from the fort, and recognized one of them as Wetzel. He doubted not that the other was Lord Dunmore's famous guide and hunter, Jonathan Zane. In features he resembled the colonel, and was as tall as Wetzel, although not so muscular or wide of chest. 
Joe felt the same thrill he had experienced while watching the frontiersmen at Fort Pitt. Wetzel and Jonathan spoke a word to Colonel Zane and then stepped aside. The hunters stood lithe and erect, with the easy, graceful poise of Indians. "'We'll take two canoes day after tomorrow,' said Jonathan decisively to Colonel Zane. "'Have you a rifle for Wetzel? The Delaware's got his.' Colonel Zane pondered over the question. Rifles were not scarce at the fort, but a weapon that Wetzel would use was hard to find. "'The hunter may have my rifle,' said the old missionary. "'I have no use for a weapon with which to destroy God's creatures. My brother was a frontiersman. He left this rifle to me. I remember hearing him say once that if a man knew exactly the weight of lead and power needed, it would shoot absolutely true he went into the cabin and presently came out with a long object wrapped in linsey cloths unwinding the coverings he brought to view a rifle the proportions of which caused jonathan's eyes to glisten and brought an exclamation from colonel zane wetzel balanced the gun in his hands it was fully six feet long the barrel was large and the dark steel finely polished the stock was black walnut ornamented with silver trimmings using jonathan's powder flask and bullet pouch wetzel proceeded to load the weapon he poured out a quantity of powder into the palm of his hand performing the action quickly and dexterously but was so slow while measuring it that joe wondered if he were counting the grains next he selected a bullet out of a dozen which jonathan held toward him he examined it carefully and tried it in the muzzle of the rifle evidently it did not please him for he took another finally he scraped a bullet with his knife and placing it in the center of a small linsey rag deftly forced it down he adjusted the flint dropped a few grains of powder in the pan and then looked around for a mark at which to shoot joe observed that the hunters and colonel zane were as serious regarding the work as if at that moment some important issue depended upon the accuracy of the rifle there lou there's a good shot it's pretty far even for you when you don't know the gun said colonel zane pointing toward the river joe saw the end of a log about the size of a man's head sticking out of the water perhaps a hundred and fifty yards distant he thought to hit it would be a fine shot but was amazed when he heard colonel zane say to several men who had joined the group that wetzel intended to shoot at a turtle on the log by straining his eyes joe succeeded in distinguishing a small lump which he concluded was the turtle wetzel took a step forward the long black rifle was raised with a stately sweep the instant it reached a level a thread of flame burst forth followed by a peculiarly clear ringing report did he hit it asked colonel zane eagerly as a boy i allow he did answered jonathan i'll go and see said joe he ran down the bank along the beach and stepped on the log he saw a turtle about the size of an ordinary saucer picking it up he saw a bullet hole in the shell near the middle the bullet had gone through the turtle and it was quite dead joe carried it to the waiting group i allowed so declared jonathan wetzel examined the turtle and turning to the old missionary said your brother spoke the truth and i thank you for the rifle end of chapter seven of the spirit of the border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter 8 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 8. So you want to know all about Wetzel, inquired Colonel Zane of Joe, when having left Jim and Mr. Wells, they returned to the cabin i am immensely interested in him replied joe well i don't think there's anything singular in that i know wetzel better perhaps than any man living but i've seldom talked about him he doesn't like it he is by birth a virginian i should say forty years old we were boys together and i'm a little beyond that age he was like any of the lads except that he excelled us all in strength and agility when he was nearly eighteen years old a band of indians delawares i think 
crossed the border on a marauding expedition far into Virginia. They burned the old Wetzel homestead and murdered the father, mother, two sisters, and a baby brother. The terrible shock nearly killed Lewis, who for a time was very ill. When he recovered, he went in search of his brothers, Martin and John Wetzel, who were hunting and brought them back to their desolated home. Over the ashes of the home and the graves of the loved ones, the brothers swore sleepless and eternal vengeance. The elder brothers have been devoted all these twenty years and more to the killing of Indians, but Lewis has been the great foe of the red man. You have already seen an example of his deeds, and will hear of more. His name is a household word on the border. Scores of times he has saved, actually saved, this fort and its settlement. His knowledge of savage ways surpasses by far Boone's, Major McCulloch's, Jonathan's, or any of the hunters. Then hunting Indians is his sole occupation? He lives for that purpose alone. He is very seldom in the settlement. Sometimes he stays here a few days, especially if he is needed, but usually he roams the forest. Oh, what did Jeff Lynn mean when he said that some people think Wetzel is crazy? There are many who think the man mad, but I do not. When the passion for Indian hunting comes upon him, he is fierce, almost frenzied, yet perfectly sane. While here he's quiet, seldom speaks except when spoken to, and is taciturn with strangers. He often comes to my cabin and sits beside the fire for hours. I think he finds pleasure in the conversation and laughter of friends. He is fond of the children, and would do anything for my sister Betty. His life must be lonely and sad, remarked Joe. The life of any border man is that, but Wetzel's is particularly so. What is he called by the Indians? They call him Atalang, or in English, Death Wind. By George, that's what Silvertip said in French, Le Vent de la Moore. Yes, you have it right. A French fur trader gave Wetzel that name years ago, and it has clung to him. The Indians say the death wind blows through the forest whenever Wetzel stalks on their trail. Colonel Zane, don't you think me superstitious, whispered Joe, leaning toward the colonel, but I heard that wind blow through the forest. What? ejaculated Colonel Zane. He saw that Joe was in earnest, for the remembrance of the moan had more than once paled his cheek and caused beads of perspiration to collect on his brow. Joe related the circumstances of that night, and at the end of his narrative Colonel Zane sat silent and thoughtful. You don't think it was Wetzel who moaned? he asked at length. No, I don't, replied Joe quickly. But, Colonel Zane, I heard that moan as plainly as I can hear your voice. I heard it twice. Now what was it? Jonathan said the same thing to me once. He had been out hunting with Wetzel. They separated, and during the night Jonathan heard the wind. The next day he ran across a dead Indian. He believes Wetzel makes the noise, and so do the hunters. But I think it is simply the moan of the night wind through the trees. I have heard it at times when my very blood seemingly ran cold. Well, I tried to think it was the wind soughing through the pines, but I'm afraid I didn't succeed very well. Anyhow, I knew Wetzel instantly, just as Jeff Lynn said I would. He killed those Indians in an instant, and he must have an iron arm. Wetzel excels in strength and speed any man, red or white, on the frontier. He can run away from Jonathan, who is as swift as an Indian, He's stronger than any of the other men. I remember one day old Hugh Bennett's wagon wheels stuck in a bog down by the creek. Hugh tried, as several others did, to move the wheels, but they couldn't be made to budge. Along came Wetzel, pushed away the men, and lifted the wagon unaided. It would take hours to tell you about him. In brief, among all the border scouts and hunters, Wetzel stands alone. No wonder the Indians fear him. He is as swift as an eagle, strong as mountain ash, keen as a fox, and absolutely tireless and implacable. 
How long have you been here, Colonel Sane? More than twelve years, and it has been one long fight. I'm afraid I'm too late for the fun, said Joe, with his quiet laugh. Not by about twelve more years, answered Colonel Zane, studying expression on Joe's face. When I came out here years ago, I had the same adventurous spirit which I see in you. It has been considerably quelled, however. I have seen many a daring young fellow get the border fever, and with it his death. Let me advise you to learn the ways of the hunters, to watch someone skilled in woodcraft. Perhaps Wetzel himself will take you in hand. I don't mind saying that he spoke of you to me in a tone I never heard Lou use before. He did, questioned Joe eagerly, flushing with pleasure. Do you think he'd take me out? Dare I ask him? Don't be impatient. Perhaps I can arrange it. Come over here now to Metzer's place. I want to make you acquainted with him. These boys have all been cutting timber. They've just come in for dinner. Be easy and quiet with them. Then you'll get on. Colonel Zane introduced Joe to five sturdy boys and left him in their company. Joe sat down on a log outside a cabin and leisurely surveyed the young men. They all looked about the same, strong without being heavy, light-haired, and bronze-faced. In their turn, they carefully judged Joe. A newcomer from the East was always regarded with some doubt. If they expected to hear Joe talk much, they were mistaken. He appeared good-natured, but not too friendly. "'Fine weather we're having,' said Dick Metzger. "'Fine,' agreed Joe, laconically. You "'Like frontier life?' "'Sure.' A silence ensued after this breaking of the ice. The boys were awaiting their turn at a little wooden bench upon which stood a bucket of water and a basin. "'Here you got catched by some Shawnees,' remarked another youth, as he rolled up his shirt-sleeves. They all looked at Joe now. It was not improbable their estimate of him would be greatly influenced by the way he answered this question. Yes, was captive for three days. "'Did you knock any redskins over?' This question was artfully put to draw Joe out. Above all things, the border men detested boastfulness. Tried on Joe, the ruse failed signally. "'I was scared speechless most of the time,' answered Joe, with his pleasant smile. "'By gosh, I don't blame you,' burst out Will Metzer. "'I had that experience once, and once's enough.' The boys laughed and looked in a more friendly manner at Joe. Though he said he had been frightened, his cool and careless manner belied his words. In Joe's low voice and clear gray eye, there was something potent and magnetic, which subtly influenced those with whom he came in contact. While his new friends were at dinner, Joe strolled over to where Colonel Zane sat on the doorstep of his home. "'How did you get on with the boys?' inquired the Colonel. "'All right, I hope. Say, Colonel Zane, I'd like to talk to your Indian guide.' Colonel Zane spoke a few words in the Indian language to the guide, who left his post and came over to them. The Colonel then had a short conversation with him, at the conclusion of which he pointed toward Joe. "'How do, Jake?' said Tome, extending his hand. Joe smiled and returned the friendly hand pressure. Shawnee catch him? asked the Indian in his fairly intelligible English. Joe nodded his head, while Colonel Zane spoke once more in Shawnee, explaining the cause of Silvertip's enmity. Shawnee chief one bad Injun, replied Tome seriously. Silvertip mad, thunder mad. Catch him pale face scalp them sure after giving this warning the chief returned to his former position near the corner of the cabin he can talk in english fairly well much better than the shawnee brave who talked with me the other day observed joe some of the indians speak the language almost fluently said colonel zane you could hardly have distinguished logan's speech from a white man's corn planter uses good english as also does my brother's wife a wyandot girl did your brother marry an indian and joe plainly showed his surprise indeed he did and a most beautiful girl she is i'll tell you isaac's story some time he was a captive among the wyandots for ten years the chief's daughter myura loved him kept him from being tortured 
and finally saved him from the stake well that floors me said joe yet i don't see why it should i'm just surprised where's your brother now he lives with the tribe he and Mayura are working hard for peace we are now on more friendly terms with the great wyandots or hurons as we call them than ever before who is this big man coming from the fort asked joe suddenly observing a stalwart frontiersman approaching major sam mcculloch you have met him he's the man who jumped his horse from yonder bluff jonathan and he have the same look the same swing observed joe as he ran his eye over the major his faded buckskin costume beaded fringed and laced was similar to that of the colonel's brother powder flask and bullet pouch were made from cow horns and slung around his neck on deer hide strings the hunting coat was unlaced exposing under the long fringed borders a tunic of the same well tanned but finer and softer material as he walked the flaps of his coat fell back showing a belt containing two knives sheathed in heavy buckskin and a bright tomahawk he carried a long rifle in the hollow of his arm these hunters have the same kind of buckskin suits continued joe still it doesn't seem to me the clothes make the resemblance to each other the way these men stand walk and act is what strikes me particularly as in the case of wetzel i know what you mean the flashing eye the erect poise of expectation and the springy step those my lad come from a life spent in the woods well it's a grand way to live colonel my horse is laid up said major mcculloch coming to the steps he bowed pleasantly to joe so you're going to short creek you can have one of my horses but first come inside and we'll talk over your expedition the afternoon passed uneventfully for joe his brother and mr wells were absorbed in plans for their future work and nell and kate were resting therefore he was forced to find such amusement or occupation as was possible in or near the stockade end of chapter eight of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter nine of the spirit of the border by zane gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter nine joe went to bed that night with a promise to himself to rise early next morning for he had been invited to take part in a raising which term meant that a new cabin was to be erected and such task was ever an event in the lives of the settlers the following morning joe rose early dressing himself in a complete buckskin suit for which he had exchanged his good garments of cloth never before had he felt so comfortable he wanted to hop skip and jump the soft undressed buckskin was as warm and smooth as silk plush the weight so light the moccasins so well fitting and springy that he had to put himself under considerable restraint to keep from capering about like a frolicsome colt the possession of this buckskin outfit and the rifle and accoutrements which went with the bargain marked the last stage in joe's surrender to the border fever the silent shaded glens the mystery of the woods the breath of this wild free life claimed him from this moment entirely and forever he met the others however with a serene face showing no trace of the emotion which welled up strongly from his heart nell glanced shyly at him kate playfully voiced her admiration jim met him with a brotherly ridicule which bespoke his affection as well as his amusement but colonel zane having once yielded to the same burning riotous craving for freedom which now stirred in the boy's heart understood and felt warmly drawn toward the lad he said nothing though as he watched joe his eyes were grave and kind in his long frontier life where many a day measured the life and fire of ordinary years he had seen lad after lad go down before this forest fever it was well he thought because the freedom of the soil depended on these wild light-footed boys yet it always made him sad 
how many youths his brother among them lay under the fragrant pine-needle carpet of the forest in their last earthly sleep the raising brought out all the settlement the women to look on and gossip while the children played the men to bend their backs in the moving of the heavy timbers they celebrated the erection of a new cabin as a noteworthy event as a social function it had a prominent place in the settlers short list of pleasures joe watched the proceedings with the same pleasure and surprise he had felt in everything pertaining to border life to him this log raising appeared the hardest kind of labor yet it was plain these hardy men these low-voiced women and married children regarded the work as something far more significant than the mere building of a cabin after a while he understood the meaning of the scene a kindred spirit the spirit of the pioneer drew them all into one large family this was another cabin another home another advance toward the conquering of the wilderness for which these brave men and women were giving their lives in the bright-eyed children's glee when they clapped their little hands at the mounting logs joe saw the progress the march of civilization well i'm sorry you're to leave us tonight," remarked colonel zane to joe as the young man came over to where he his wife and sister watched the work jonathan said all was ready for your departure at sundown do we travel by night indeed yes my lad there are indians everywhere on the river i think however with jack and lou handling the paddles you will slip by safely the plan is to keep along the south shore all night then cross over at a place called gertie's point where you are to remain in hiding during daylight from there you paddle up yellow creek then portage across country to the head of the tuscarawas another night's journey will then bring you to the village of peace jim and mr wells with his nieces joined the party now and all stood watching as the last logs were put in place colonel zane my first log raising is an education to me said the young minister in his earnest manner this scene is so full of life i never saw such good will among laboring men look at that brawny armed giant standing on the topmost log how he whistles as he swings his axe mr wells does it not impress you the pioneers must be brothers because of their isolation and peril to be brothers means to love one another to love one another is to love god what you see in this fraternity is god and i want to see the same beautiful feeling among the indians i have seen it said colonel zane to the old missionary when i came out here alone twelve years ago the indians were peaceable if the pioneers had paid for land as i paid corn planter there would never have been a border war but no the settlers must grasp every acre they could then the indians rebelled then the girties and their allies spread discontent and now the border is a bloody warpath have the jesuit missionaries accomplished anything with these war tribes inquired jim no their work has been chiefly among the indians near detroit and northward the hurons delawares shawnees and other western tribes have been demoralized by the french traders rum and incited to fierce hatred by gertie and his renegades your work at nodenhutten must be among these hostile tribes and it is surely a hazardous undertaking my life is god's murmured the old minister no fear could assail his steadfast faith jim it strikes me you'd be more likely to impress these indians colonel jane spoke of if you'd get a suit like mine and wear a knife and tomahawk interposed joe cheerfully then if you couldn't convert you could scalp him well well let us hope for the best said colonel zane when the laughter had subsided we'll go over to dinner now come all of you jonathan bring wetzel betty make him come if you can as the party slowly wended its way toward the colonel's cabin jim and nell found themselves side by side they had not exchanged a word since the evening previous when jim had kissed her unable to look at each other now and finding speech difficult they walked in embarrassed silence 
doesn't joe look splendid in his hunting suit asked jim presently i hadn't noticed yes he looks well replied nell carelessly she was too indifferent to be natural are you angry with him certainly not jim was always simple and frank in his relations with women he had none of his brother's fluency of speech with neither confidence boldness nor understanding of the intricate mazes of a woman's moods but you are angry with me he whispered nell flushed to her temples yet she did not raise her eyes nor reply it was a terrible thing for me to do went on jim hesitatingly i don't know why i took advantage of of your mistaking me for joe if you only hadn't held up your mouth no i don't mean that of course you didn't but well i couldn't help it i'm guilty i have thought of little else some wonderful feeling has possessed me ever since since what has joe been saying about me demanded nell her eyes burning like opals why hardly anything answered jim haltingly i took him to task about about what i considered might be wrong to you joe has never been very careful of young ladies feelings and i thought well it was none of my business he said he honestly cared for you that you had taught him how unworthy he was of a good woman but he's wrong there joe is wild and reckless yet his heart is a well of gold he is a diamond in the rough just now he is possessed by wild notions of hunting indians and roaming through the forest but he'll come round all right i wish i could tell you how much he has done for me how much i love him how i know him he can be made worthy of any woman he will outgrow this fiery daring spirit and then won't you help him i will if he will let me softly whispered nell irresistibly drawn by the strong earnest love thrilling in his voice End of chapter nine of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter ten of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter ten once more out under the blue-black vault of heaven with its myriads of twinkling stars the voyagers resumed their westward journey whispered farewells of new but sincere friends lingered in their ears now the great looming bulk of the fort above them faded into the obscure darkness leaving a feeling as if a protector had gone perhaps forever admonished to absolute silence by the stern guides who seemed indeed to have embarked upon a dark and deadly mission the voyagers lay back in the canoes and thought and listened the water eddied with soft gurgles in the wake of the racing canoes but that musical sound was all they heard the paddles might have been shadows for all the splash they made they cut the water swiftly and noiselessly onward the frail barks glided into black space side by side close under the overhanging willows long moments passed into long hours as the guides paddled tirelessly as if their sinews were cords of steel with gray dawn came the careful landing of the canoes a cold breakfast eaten under cover of a willow thicket and the beginning of a long day while they were lying hidden from the keen eyes of indian scouts waiting for the friendly mantle of night the hours dragged until once more the canoes were launched this time not on the broad ohio but on a stream that mirrored no shining stars as it flowed still and somber under the dense foliage the voyagers spoke not nor whispered nor scarcely moved so menacing had become the slow listening caution of wetzel and zane snapping of twigs somewhere in the inscrutable darkness delayed them for long moments any moment the air might resound with the horrible indian war-whoop every second was heavy with fear 
how marvelous that these scouts penetrating the wilderness of gloom glided on surely silently safely instinct or the eyes of the lynx guide their course but another dark night wore on to the tardy dawn and each of its fearful hours numbered miles past and gone the sun was rising in ruddy glory when wetzel ran his canoe into the bank just ahead of a sharp bend in the stream do we get out here asked jim seeing jonathan turn his canoe toward wetzel's the village lies yonder round the bend answered the guide wetzel cannot go there so i'll take you all in my canoe there's no room i'll wait replied joe quietly jim noticed his look a strange steady glance it was and then saw him fix his eyes upon nell watching her until the canoe passed around the green bordered bend in the stream unmistakable signs of an indian town were now evident dozens of graceful birchen canoes lay upon the well-cleared banks a log bridge spanned the stream above the slight ridge of rising ground could be seen the poles of indian teepees as the canoe grated upon the sandy beach a little indian boy who was playing in the shallow water raised his head and smiled that's an indian boy whispered kate the dear little fellow exclaimed nell the boy came running up to them when they were landed with pleasure and confidence shining in his dusky eyes save for tiny buckskin breeches he was naked and his shiny skin gleamed gold bronze in the sunlight he was a singularly handsome child me benny he lisped in english holding up his little hand to nell the action was as loving and trusting as any that could have been manifested by a white child jonathan zane stared with a curious light in his dark eyes mr wells and jim looked as though they doubted the evidence of their own sight here even in an indian boy was incontestable proof that the savage nature could be tamed and civilized with a tender exclamation nell bent over the child and kissed him jonathan zane swung his canoe upstream for the purpose of bringing joe the trim little bark slipped out of sight around the bend presently its gray curved nose peeped from behind the willows then the canoe swept into view again there was only one person in it and that the guide where is my brother asked jim in amazement gone answered zane quietly gone what do you mean gone perhaps you have missed the spot where you left him they are both gone nell and jim gazed at each other with slowly whitening faces come i'll take you up to the village said zane getting out of his canoe all noticed that he was careful to take his weapons with him can't you tell us what it means this disappearance asked jim his voice low and anxious they're gone canoe and all i knew wetzel was going but i didn't calculate on the lad maybe he followed wetzel maybe he didn't answered the taciturn guide and he spoke no more in his keen expectation and wonder as to what the village would be like jim momentarily forgot his brother's disappearance and when he arrived at the top of the bank he surveyed the scene with eagerness what he saw was more imposing than the village of peace which he had conjured up in his imagination confronting him was a level plain in the center of which stood a wide low structure surrounded by log cabins and these in turn encircled by indian teepees a number of large trees mostly full foliaged maples shaded the clearing the settlement swarmed with indians a few shrill hellos uttered by the first observers of the newcomers brought braves maidens and children trooping toward the party with friendly curiosity jonathan zane stepped before a cabin adjoining the large structure and called in at the open door a short stoop-shouldered white man clad in faded linsey appeared on the threshold his serious lined face had the unmistakable benevolent aspect peculiar to most teachers of the gospel 
Mr. Zeisberger, I fetched a party from Fort Henry, said Zane, indicating those he had guided. Then, without another word, never turning his dark face to the right or left, he hurried down the lane through the throng of Indians. Jim remembered, as he saw the guide vanish over the bank of the creek, that he had heard Colonel Zane say that Jonathan, as well as Wetzel, hated the sight of an Indian. No doubt long years of war and bloodshed had rendered these two great hunters callous. To them there could be no discrimination. An Indian was an Indian. "'Mr. Wells, welcome to the village of peace!' exclaimed Mr. Zeisberger, wringing the old missionary's hand. "'The years have not been so long but that I remember you.' "'Happy indeed am I to get here after all these dark, dangerous journeys,' returned Mr. Wells. "'I have brought my nieces, Nell and Kate, who were children when you left Williamsburg, and this young man, James Downs, a minister of God, and earnest in his hope for our work. A glorious work it is. Welcome, young ladies, to our peaceful village. And, young men, I greet you with heartfelt thankfulness. We need young men. Come in, all of you, and share my cabin. I'll have your luggage brought up. I have lived in this hut alone. With some little labor and the magic touch women bring to the making of a home, we can be most comfortable here. Mr. Zeisberger gave his own room to the girls, assuring them with a smile that it was the most luxurious in the village. The apartment contained a chair, a table, and a bed of Indian blankets and buffalo robes. A few pegs driven in the chinks between the logs completed the furnishings. Sparse as were the comforts, they appealed warmly to the girls, who, weary from their voyage, lay down to rest. "'I am not fatigued,' said Mr. Wells to his old friend. "'I want to hear all about your work, what you have done, and what you hope to do.' "'We have met with wonderful success, far beyond our wildest dreams,' responded Mr. Zeisberger. "'Certainly we have been blessed of God.' Then the missionary began a long, detailed account of the Moravian mission's efforts among the western tribes. The work lay chiefly among the Delawares, a noble nation of red men, intelligent and wonderfully susceptible to the teaching of the gospel. Among the eastern Delawares, living on the other side of the Allegheny Mountains, the missionaries had succeeded in converting many, and it was chiefly through the western explorations of Frederick Post that his church decided the Indians of the West could as well be taught to lead Christian lives. The first attempt to convert the western red men took place upon the upper Allegheny, where many Indians, including Alamewi, a blind Delaware chief, accepted the faith. The mission decided, however, it would be best to move farther west, where the Delawares had migrated and were more numerous. In April 1770, more than ten years before, sixteen canoes, filled with converted Indians and missionaries, drifted down the Allegheny to Fort Pitt, thence down the Ohio to the Big Beaver, up that stream and far into the Ohio wilderness. Upon a tributary of the Muskingong, called the Tuscarawas, a settlement was founded. Near and far the news was circulated. Red men from all tribes came flocking to the new colony. Chiefs and warriors, squaws and maidens, were attracted by the new doctrine of the converted Indians. They were astonished at the missionaries' teachings. Many doubted. Some were converted. All listened. Great excitement prevailed when old Glickhican, one of the wisest chiefs of the Turtle tribe of the Delawares, became a convert to the Pale Faces' religion. The interest widened, and in a few years a beautiful, prosperous town arose which was called Village of Peace. The Indians of the warlike tribes bestowed the appropriate name. The vast forests were rich in every variety of game. The deep, swift streams were teeming with fish, meat and grain in abundance, buckskin for clothing and soft furs for winter garments were to be had for little labor. At first only a few wigwams were erected, Soon a large log structure was thrown up, 
and used as a church then followed a school a mill and a workshop the verdant fields were cultivated and surrounded by rail fences horses and cattle grazed with the timid deer on the grassy plains the village of peace blossomed as a rose the reports of the love and happiness existing in this converted community spread from mouth to mouth from town to town with the result that inquisitive savages journeyed from all points to see this haven peaceful and hostile indians were alike amazed at the change in their brethren the good fellowship and industry of the converts had a widespread and wonderful influence more perhaps than any other thing the great fields of waving corn the hills covered with horses and cattle those evidences of abundance impress the visitors with the well-being of the christians bands of traveling indians whether friendly or otherwise were treated with hospitality and never sent away empty-handed they were asked to partake of the abundance and solicited to come again a feature by no means insignificant in the popularity of the village was the church bell the indians loved music and this bell charmed them on still nights the savages in distant towns could hear at dusk the deep-toned mellow notes of the bell summoning the worshippers to the evening service its ringing clang so strange so sweet so solemn breaking the vast dead wilderness quiet haunted the savage ear as though it were a call from a woodland god you have arrived most opportunely continued mr zeisberger mr edwards and mr young are working to establish other missionary posts heckevelder is here now in the interest of this branching out how long will it take me to learn the delaware language inquired jim not long you do not however need to speak the indian tongue for we have excellent interpreters we heard much at fort pitt and fort henry about the danger as well as uselessness of our venture jim continued the frontiersmen declared that every rod of the way was beset with savage foes and that even in the unlikely event of our arriving safely at the village of peace we would then be hemmed in by fierce vengeful tribes the hostile savages are bound here of course but we do not fear them we invite them our work is to convert the wicked to teach them to lead good useful lives we will succeed jim could not help warming to the minister for his unswervable faith his earnest belief that the work of god could not fail nevertheless while he felt no fear and intended to put all his heart in the work he remembered with disquietude colonel zane's warnings he thought of the wonderful precaution and eternal vigilance of jonathan and wetzel men of all men who most understood indian craft and cunning it might well be possible that these good missionaries wrapped up in saving the souls of these children of the forest so full of god's teachings as to have little mind for aught else had no knowledge of the indian nature beyond what the narrow scope of their work invited if what these frontiersmen asserted was true then the minister's zeal had struck them blind jim had a growing idea of the way in which the savages could be best taught he resolved to go slowly to study the red men's natures not to preach one word of the gospel to them until he had mastered their language and could convey to their simple minds the real truth he would make christianity as clear to them as were the deer trails on the moss and leaves of the forest ah here you are i hope you have rested well said mr zeisberger when at the conclusion of this long recital nell and kate came into the room thank you we feel much better answered kate the girl certainly looked refreshed the substitution of clean gowns for their former travel-stained garments made a change that called forth the minister's surprise and admiration my my won't edwards and young beg me to keep them here now he exclaimed his pleased eyes resting on nell's piquant beauty and kate's noble proportions and rich coloring come i will show you over the village of peace 
are all these indians christians asked jim no indeed these indians you see here and out yonder under the shade though they are friendly they are not christians our converts employ themselves in the fields or shops come take a peep in here this is where we preach in the evenings and during inclement weather on pleasant days we use the maple grove yonder jim and the others looked in at the door of the large log structure they saw an immense room the floor covered with benches and a raised platform at one end a few windows let in the light spacious and barn-like was this apartment but undoubtedly seen through the beaming eyes of the missionary it was a grand amphitheatre for worship the hard-packed clay floor was velvet carpet the rude seats soft as eiderdown the platform with its white oak cross an altar of marble and gold this is one of our shops said mr zeisberger leading them to a cabin here we make brooms harness for the horses farming implements everything useful that we can we have a forge here behold an indian blacksmith the interior of the large cabin presented a scene of bustling activity twenty or more indians bent their backs in earnest employment in one corner a savage stood holding a piece of red-hot iron on an anvil while a brawny brave wielded a sledge-hammer the sparks flew the anvil rang in another corner a circle of braves sat around a pile of dried grass and flags they were twisting and fashioning these materials into baskets at a bench three indian carpenters were pounding and sawing young braves ran back and forth carrying pails rough-hewn boards and blocks of wood instantly struck by two things jim voiced his curiosity oh, why do these indians all wear long hair smooth and shiny without adornment they are christians they wear neither headdress war bonnet nor scalp lock replied mr zeisberger with unconscious pride i did not expect to see a blacksmith's anvil out here in the wilderness where did you procure these tools we have been years gathering them here some came by the way of the ohio river others overland from detroit that anvil has a history it was lost once and lay for years in the woods until some injuns found it again it is called the ringing stone and injuns come from miles around to see and hear it the missionary pointed out wide fields of corn now growing yellow and hillsides dotted with browsing cattle droves of sturdy-limbed horses and pins of fat grunting pigs all of which attested to the growing prosperity of the village of peace on the way back to the cabin while the others listened to and questioned mr zeisberger jim was silent and thoughtful for his thoughts reverted to his brother later as he walked with nell by the golden fringed stream he spoke of joe joe wanted so much to hunt with wetzel he will come back surely he will return to us when he has satisfied his wild craving for adventure do you not think so there was an eagerness that was almost pleading in jim's voice what he so much hoped for that no harm had befallen joe and that he would return he doubted he needed the encouragement of his hope never answered nell solemnly oh why why do you say that i saw him look at you a strange intent glance he gazed long at me as we separated oh i can feel his eyes no he will never come back nell nell you do not mean he went away deliberately because oh i cannot say it for no reason except that the wilderness called him more than love for you or me no no returned jim his face white you do not understand he really loved you i know it he loved me too ah how well he has gone because i can't tell you oh jim i hope he loved me sobbed nell bursting into tears his coldness 
his neglect those last few days hurt me so if he cared as you say i won't be so miserable we are both right you when you say he will never return and i when i say he loved us both said jim sadly as the bitter certainty forced itself into his mind as she sobbed softly and he gazed with set stern face into the darkening forest the deep mellow notes of the church bell pealed out so thrilled so startled were they by this melody wondrously breaking the twilight stillness that they gazed mutely at each other then they remembered it was the missionary's bell summoning the christian indians to the evening service end of chapter ten of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter eleven of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter eleven the sultry drowsy summer days passed with no untoward event to mar their slumbering tranquillity life for the newcomers to the village of peace brought a content the like of which they had never dreamed of mr wells at once began active work among the indians preaching to them through an interpreter nell and kate in hours apart from household duties busied themselves brightening their new abode and jem entered upon the task of acquainting himself with the modes and habits of the red men truly the young people might have found perfect happiness in this new and novel life if only joe had returned his disappearance and subsequent absence furnished a theme for many talks and many a quiet hour of dreamy sadness the fascination of his personality had been so impelling that long after it was withdrawn a charm lingered around everything which reminded them of him a subtle and sweet memory with perverse and half bitter persistence returned hauntingly no trace of joe had been seen by any of the friendly indian runners he was gone into the mazes of deep shadowed forests where to hunt for him would be like striving to trail the flight of a swallow two of those he had left behind always remembered him and in their thoughts followed him in his wanderings jim settled down to his study of indians with single-heartedness of purpose he spent part of every morning with the interpreters with whose assistance he rapidly acquired the delaware language he went freely among the indians endeavoring to win their good will there were always fifty to an hundred visiting indians at the village sometimes when the missionaries had advertised a special meeting there were assembled in the shady maple grove as many as five hundred savages jim had therefore opportunities to practice his offices of friendliness fortunately for him he at once succeeded in establishing himself in the good graces of glickhican the converted delaware chief the wise old indian was of inestimable value to jim early in their acquaintance he evinced an earnest regard for the young minister and talked with him for hours from glickhican jim learned the real nature of the red men the indian's love of freedom and honor his hatred of subjection and deceit as explained by the good old man recalled to jim colonel zane's estimate of the savage character surely as the colonel had said the indians had reason for their hatred of the pioneers truly they were a blighted race seldom had the rights of the red men been thought of the settler pushed onward plodding as it were behind his plough with a rifle he regarded the indian as little better than a beast he was easier to kill than to tame how little the settler knew the proud independence the wisdom the stainless chastity of honor which belongs so truly to many indian chiefs the red men were driven like hounded deer into the untrodden wilds from free men of the forests from owners of the great boundless plains they passed to stern enduring fugitives on their own lands 
small wonder that they became cruel where once they had been gentle stratagem and cunning the night assault the daylight ambush took the place of their one-time open warfare their chivalrous courage that sublime inheritance from ancestors who had never known the pale-faced foe degenerated into a savage ferocity interesting as was this history to jim he cared more for glickikon's rich portrayal of the red men's domestic life for the beautiful poetry of his tradition and legends he heard with delight the exquisite fanciful indian lore from these romantic legends beautiful poems and marvelous myths he hoped to get ideas of the indian's religion sweet and simple as childless dreams were these quaint tales tales of how the woodland fairies dwelt in fern-carpeted dells how at sunrise they came out to kiss open the flowers how the forest walks were spirit-haunted paths how the leaves whispered poetry to the winds how the rocks harbored indian gods and masters who watched over their chosen ones glickikon wound up his long discourses by declaring he had never lied in the whole course of his seventy years had never stolen never betrayed never murdered never killed save in self-defense gazing at the chief's fine features now calm yet showing traces of past storms jim believed he spoke the truth when the young minister came however to study the hostile indians that flocked to the village any conclusive delineation of character or any satisfactory analysis of their mental state in regard to the pale-face religion eluded him their passive silent sphinx-like secretiveness was baffling glickikon had taught him how to propitiate the friendly braves and with these he was successful little he learned however from the unfriendly ones when making gifts to these red men he could never be certain that his offerings were appreciated the jewels and gold he had brought west with him went to the french traders who in exchange gave him trinkets baubles bracelets and weapons jim made hundreds of presents boldly going up to befeathered and befringed chieftains he offered them knives hatchets or strings of silvery beads sometimes his kindly offerings were repelled with a haughty stare at other times they would be accepted coldly suspiciously as if the gifts brought some unknown obligation for a white man it was a never-to-be-forgotten experience to see eight or ten of these grim slowly stepping forest kings arrayed in all the rich splendor of their costume stalking among the tepees of the village of peace somehow such a procession always made jim shiver the singing praying and preaching they heard unmoved no emotion was visible on their bronzed faces nothing changed their unalterable mien had they not moved or gazed with burning eyes they would have been statues when these chieftains looked at the converted indians some of whom were braves of their nations the contempt in their glances betrayed that they now regarded these christian indians as belonging to an alien race among the chiefs glickakon pointed out to jim were wingenund the delaware telhane the half king shingis and katoxen all of the wolf tribe of the delawares Glickakan was careful to explain that the Delaware nation had been divided into the Wolf and Turtle tribes, the former warlike people, and the latter peaceable. Few of the Wolf tribe had gone over to the new faith, and those who had were scorned. Wingenund, the great power of the Delawares, indeed the greatest of all the western tribes, maintained a neutral attitude toward the village of peace but it was well known that his right-hand war chiefs pipe and wishtona remained coldly opposed jim turned all he had learned over and over in his mind trying to construct part of it to fit into a sermon that would be different from any the indians had ever heard he did not want to preach far over their heads if possible he desired to keep to their ideals for he deemed them more beautiful than his own and to conduct his teaching along the simple lines of their belief 
so that when he stimulated and developed their minds he could pass from what they knew to the unknown christianity of the white man his first address to the indians was made one day during the indisposition of mr wells who had been overworking himself and the absence of the other missionaries he did not consider himself at all ready for preaching and confined his efforts to simple earnest talk a recital of the thoughts he had assimilated while living here among the indians amazement would not have described the state of his feelings when he learned that he had made a powerful impression the converts were loud in his praise the unbelievers silent and thoughtful in spite of himself long before he had been prepared he was launched on his teaching every day he was called upon to speak every day one savage at least was convinced every day the throng of interested indians was augmented the elder missionaries were quite overcome with joy they pressed him day after day to speak until at length he alone preached during the afternoon service the news flew apace the village of peace entertained more red men than ever before day by day the faith gained a stronger foothold a kind of religious trance affected some of the converted indians and this greatly influenced the doubting ones many of them half believed the great manitou had come heckewelder the acknowledged leader of the western moravian mission visited the village at this time and struck by the young missionary's success arranged a three days religious festival indian runners were employed to carry invitations to all the tribes the wyandots in the west the shawnees in the south and the delawares in the north were especially requested to come no deception was practiced to lure the distant savages to the village of peace they were asked to come partake of the feasts and listen to the white man's teaching end of chapter eleven of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter twelve of the spirit of the border by zane gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 12. The Groves Were God's First Temples. From dawn until noon on Sunday, bands of Indians arrived at the village of peace. Hundreds of canoes glided down the swift stream and bumped their prows into the pebbly beach. Groups of mounted warriors rode out of the forests into the clearing squaws with papooses maidens carrying wicker baskets and children playing with rude toys came trooping along the bridle paths gifts were presented during the morning after which the visitors were feasted in the afternoon all assembled in the grove to hear the preaching the maple grove wherein the service was to be conducted might have been intended by nature for just such a purpose as it now fulfilled these trees were large spreading and situated far apart mossy stones and the thick carpet of grass afforded seats for the congregation heckwelder a tall spare and kindly appearing man directed the arranging of the congregation he placed the converted indians just behind the knoll upon which the presiding minister was to stand in a half circle facing the knoll he seated the chieftains and important personages of the various tribes he then made a short address in the indian language speaking of the work of the mission what wonders it had accomplished what more good work it hoped to do and concluded by introducing the young missionary while heckwelder spoke jim who stood just behind employed the few moments in running his eye over the multitude the sight which met his gaze was one he thought he would never forget an involuntary word escaped him magnificent he exclaimed the shady glen had been transformed into a theatre from which gazed a thousand dark still faces a thousand eagle plumes waved and ten thousand bright-hued feathers quivered in the soft breeze the fantastically dressed scalps presented a contrast to the smooth unadorned heads of the converted red men these proud plumes and defiant feathers told the difference between savage and christian 
In front of the knoll sat fifty chiefs, attentive and dignified. Representatives of every tribe as far west as the Scioto River were numbered in that circle. There were chiefs renowned for war, for cunning, for valor, for wisdom. Their stately presence gave the meeting tenfold importance. Could these chiefs be interested, moved, the whole western world of Indians might be civilized. Hepote, a Maumee chief of whom it was said he had never listened to words of the pale-face, had the central position in this circle. On his right and left, respectively, sat Shoshoto and Pipe, implacable foes of all white men. The latter's aspect did not belie his reputation. His copper-colored, repulsive visage compelled fear. It breathed vindictiveness and malignity. A singular action of his was that he always, in what must have been his arrogant vanity, turned his profile to those who watched him, and it was a remarkable one. It sloped in an oblique line from the top of his forehead to his protruding chin, resembling somewhat the carved bowl of his pipe, which was of flint, and a famed inheritance from his ancestors. From it he took his name. One solitary eagle plume, its tip stained vermilion, stuck from his scalp lock. It slanted backward on a line with his profile. Among all these chiefs, striking as they were, the figure of Wingenund, the Delaware, stood out alone. His position was at the extreme left of the circle, where he leaned against a maple. A long black mantle, trimmed with spotless white, enveloped him. One bronzed arm, circled by a heavy bracelet of gold, held the mantle close about his lofty form. His headdress, which trailed to the ground, was exceedingly beautiful. The eagle plumes were of uniform length and pure white, except the black-pointed tips. At his feet sat his daughter, whispering winds. Her maidens were gathered around her. She raised her soft black eyes, shining with the wondrous light of surprise and expectation, to the young missionary's face. Beyond the circle the Indians were massed together, even beyond the limits of the glade. Under the trees on every side sat warriors astride their steeds. Some lounged on the green turf, many reclined in the branches of low-spreading maples. As Jem looked out over the sea of faces, he started in surprise. The sudden glance of fiery eyes had impelled his gaze. He recognized Silvertip, the Shawnee chief. The Indian sat motionless on a powerful black horse. Jim started again, for the horse was Joe's thoroughbred, Lance. But Jim had no further time to think of Joe's enemy, for Heckwelder stepped back. Jim took the vacated seat, and with a far-reaching, resonant voice, began his discourse to the Indians. Chieftains, warriors, maidens, Children of the forest, listen, and your ears shall hear no lie. I am come from where the sun rises to tell you of the great spirit of the white man. Many, many moons ago, as many as blades of grass grow on yonder plain, the great spirit of whom I shall speak created the world. He made the sparkling lakes and swift rivers, the boundless plains and tangled forests over which he caused the sun to shine and the rain to fall. He gave life to the kingly elk, the graceful deer, the rolling bison, the bear, the fox, all the beasts and birds and fishes. But he was not content, for nothing he made was perfect in his sight. He created the white man in his own image, and from this first man's rib he created his mate, a woman. He turned them free in a beautiful forest. Life was fair in the beautiful forest. The sun shone always, the birds sang, the waters flowed with music, the flowers cast sweet fragrance on the air. In this forest, where fruit bloomed always, was one tree, the tree of life, the apple of which they must not eat. In all this beautiful forest of abundance, 
this apple alone was forbidden them now evil was born with woman a serpent tempted her to eat of the apple of life and she tempted the man to eat for their sin the great spirit commanded the serpent to crawl forever on his belly and he drove them from the beautiful forest the punishment for their sin was to be visited on their children's children always until the end of time the two went afar into the dark forest to learn to live as best they might from them all tribes descended the world is wide a warrior might run all his days and not reach the setting sun where tribes of yellow skins live he might travel half his days toward the south wind where tribes of black skins abound people of all colors inhabited the world they lived in hatred toward one another they shed each other's blood they stole each other's lands gold and women they sinned many moons ago the great spirit sorrowed to see his chosen tribe the pale faces living in ignorance and sin he sent his only son to redeem them and said if they would listen and believe and teach the other tribes he would forgive their sin and welcome them to the beautiful forest that was moons and moons ago when the pale-faced killed his brother for gold and lands and beat his women slaves to make them plant his corn the son of the great spirit lifted the cloud from the pale faces eyes and they saw and learned so pleased was the great spirit that he made the pale faces wiser and wiser and master of the world he bid them go afar to teach the ignorant tribes to teach you is why the young pale-face journeyed from the rising sun he wants no lands or power he has given all that he had he walks among you without gun or knife he can gain nothing but the happiness of opening the red men's eyes the great spirit of whom i teach and the great manitou your idol are the same the happy hunting ground of the indian and the beautiful forest of the pale-face are the same the pale-face and the red man are the same there is but one great spirit that is god but one eternal home that is heaven but one human being that is man the indian knows the habits of the beaver he can follow the paths of the forest he can guide his canoe through the foaming rapids he is honest he is brave he is great but he is not wise his wisdom is clouded with the original sin he lives in idleness he paints his face he makes his squaw labor for him instead of laboring for her he kills his brothers he worships the trees and rocks if he were wise he would not make gods of the swift arrow and bounding canoe of the flowering ash and the flaming flint for these things have not life in his dreams he sees his arrow speed to the reeling deer in his dreams he sees his canoe shoot over the crest of shining waves and in his mind he gives them life when his eyes are opened he will see they have no spirit the spirit is in his own heart it guides the arrow to the running deer and steers the canoe over the swirling current the spirit makes him find the untrodden paths and do brave deeds and love his children and his honor it makes him meet his foe face to face and if he is to die it gives him strength to die a man the spirit is what makes him different from the arrow the canoe the mountain and all the birds and beasts for it is born of the great spirit the creator of all him you must worship red men this worship is understanding your spirit and teaching it to do good deeds it is called christianity christianity is love if you will love the great spirit you will love your wives your children your brothers your friends your foes you will love the pale faces 
no more will you idle in winter and wage wars in summer you will wear your knife and tomahawk only when you hunt for meat you will be kind gentle loving virtuous you will have grown wise when your days are done you will meet all your loved ones in the beautiful forest there where the flowers bloom the fruits ripen always where the pleasant water glides and the summer winds whisper sweetly there peace will dwell forever comrades be wise think earnestly forget the wicked pale-face for there are many wicked pale-faces they sell the serpent fire-water they lie and steal and kill these pale-faces eyes are still clouded if they do not open they will never see the beautiful forest you have much to forgive but those who forgive please the great spirit you must give yourselves to love but those who love are loved you must work but those who work are happy behold the village of peace once it contained few now there are many where once the dark forest shaded the land see the cabins the farms the horses the cattle field on field of waving golden grain shine there under your eyes the earth has blossomed abundance idling and fighting made not these rich harvests belief made love love made wise eyes wise eyes saw and lo there came plenty the proof of love is happiness these christian indians are happy they are at peace with the red man and the pale face they till the fields and work in the shops in days to come cabins and farms and fields of corn will be theirs they will bring up their children not to hide in the forest to slay but to walk hand in hand with the pale faces as equals oh open your ears god speaks to you peace awaits you cast the bitterness from your hearts it is the serpent poison while you hate god shuts his eyes you are great on the trail in the council in war now be great in forgiveness forgive the pale faces who have robbed you of your lands then will come peace if you do not forgive the war will go on you will lose lands and homes to find unmarked graves under the forest leaves revenge is sweet but it is not wise the price of revenge is blood and life root it out of your hearts love these christian indians love the missionaries as they love you love all living creatures your days are but few therefore cease the strife let us say brothers that is god's word his law that is love that is christianity if you will say from your heart brother you are a christian brothers the pale-faced teacher beseeches you think not of this long bloody war of your dishonored dead of your silenced wigwams of your nameless graves of your homeless children think of the future one word from you will make peace over all this broad land the pale face must honor a christian he can steal no christian's land all the pale faces as many as the stars of the great white path dare not invade the village of peace for god smiles here listen to his words come unto me all that are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest over the multitude brooded an impressive solemn silence then an aged delaware chief rose with a mien of profound thought and slowly paced before the circle of chiefs presently he stopped turned to the waiting indians and spoke netawatwees is almost persuaded to be 
a Christian. He resumed his seat. Another interval of penetrating quiet ensued. At length the venerable-looking chieftain got up. White eyes hears the rumbling thunder in his ears. The smoke blows from his eyes. White eyes is the oldest chief of the Leni Lenape. His days are many. They are full. They draw near the evening of his life. He rejoices that wisdom is come before his son is set. White eyes believes the young white father. The ways of the great spirit are many as the fluttering leaves. They are strange and secret as the flight of a loon. White eyes believes the red man's happy hunting grounds need not be forgotten to love the pale faces God. As a young brave pants and puzzles over his first trail, so the grown warrior feels in his understanding of his God. He gropes blindly through dark ravines. White Eyes speaks few words today, for he is learning wisdom. He bids his people hearken to the voice of the White Father. War is wrong. Peace is best love is the way to peace the pale face advances one step nearer his god he labors for his home he keeps the peace he asks but little he frees his women that is well white eyes has spoken the old chief slowly advanced toward the christian indians he laid aside his knife and tomahawk, and then his eagle plumes and war bonnet. Bareheaded, he seated himself among the converted red men. They began chanting in low murmuring tones. Amid the breathless silence that followed this act of such great significance, Wingenund advanced toward the knoll with slow, stately step. His dark eye swept the glade with lightning scorn. His glance alone revealed the passion that swayed him. Wigelon's ears are keen. They have heard a feather fall in the storm. Now they hear a soft-voiced thrush. Wigelon thunders to his people, to his friends, to the chiefs of other tribes. Do not bury the hatchet. The young white father's tongue runs smooth like the gliding brook. It sings as the thrush calls its mate. Listen, but wait, wait. Let time prove his beautiful tale. Let the moons go by over the village of peace. Wingenon does not flaunt his wisdom. He has grown old among the warriors. He loves them. He fears for them. The dream of the pale faces beautiful forest glimmers as the rainbow glows over the laughing falls of the river. The dream of the pale face is too beautiful to come true. In the days of long ago, when Wingenon's forefathers heard not the pale faces' axe, they lived in love and happiness, such as the young white father dreams may come again. They waged no wars. A white dove sat in every wigwam. The lands were theirs, and they were rich. The pale face came with his leaden death, his burning firewater, his ringing axe, and the glory of the red men faded forever. Wingenon seeks not to inflame his braves to anger. He is sick of blood spilling, not from fear, for Wingenon cannot feel fear. But he asks his people to wait. Remember the gifts of the pale face ever contained a poisoned arrow. Wingenon's heart is sore. The day of the red man is gone. His sun is setting. Wingenon feels already the gray shades of evening. He stopped one long moment, as if to gather breath for his final charge to his listeners. Then, with a magnificent gesture, he thundered, Is the Delaware a fool? When Wingenund can cross 
unarmed to the big water he shall change his mind when death wind ceases to blow his bloody trail over the fallen leaves wiganund will believe end of chapter twelve of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter thirteen of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter thirteen as the summer waned each succeeding day with its melancholy calm its changing lights and shades its cool damp evening winds growing more and more suggestive of autumn the little colony of white people in the village of peace led busy eventful lives upwards of fifty indians several of them important chiefs had become converted since the young missionary began preaching heckwelder declared that this was a wonderful showing and if it could be kept up would result in gaining a hold on the indian tribes which might not be shaken heckwelder had succeeded in interesting the savages west of the village of peace to the extent of permitting him to establish missionary posts in two other localities one near goshhawking a delaware town and one on the muskingong the principal river running through central ohio he had with his helpers young and edwards journeyed from time to time to these points preaching making gifts and soliciting help from chiefs the most interesting feature perhaps of the varied life of the missionary party was a rivalry between young and edwards for the elder miss wells usually nell's attractiveness appealed more to men than kate's however in this instance although the sober teachers of the gospel admired nell's winsome beauty they fell in love with kate the missionaries were both under forty and good honest men devoted to the work which had engrossed them for years although they were ardent lovers certainly they were not picturesque two homelier men could hardly have been found moreover the sacrifice of their lives to missionary work had taken them far from the companionship of women of their own race so that they lacked the ease of manner which women like to see in men young and edwards were awkward almost uncouth embarrassment would not have done justice to their state of feeling while basking in the shine of kate's quiet smile they were happy foolish and speechless if kate shared in the merriment of the others heckwelder could not conceal his and nell did not try very hard to hide hers she never allowed a suspicion of it to escape she kept the easy even tenor of her life always kind and gracious in her quaint way and precisely the same to both her lovers no doubt she well knew that each possessed under all his rough exterior a heart of gold one day the genial heckwalder lost or pretended to lose his patience say you worthy gentlemen are becoming ornamental instead of useful all this changing of coats trimming of mustaches and eloquent sighing doesn't seem to have affected the young lady i've a notion to send you both to maumee town one hundred miles away this young lady is charming i admit but if she is to keep on seriously hindering the work of the moravian mission i must object as for that matter i might try conclusions myself i'm as young as either of you and i flatter myself much handsomer you'll have a dangerous rival presently settle it you can't both have her settle it this outburst from their usually kind leader placed the earnest but awkward gentleman in a terrible plight on the afternoon following the crisis heckwelder took mr wells to one of the indian shops and jim and dell went canoeing young and edwards after conferring for one long trying hour determined on settling the question young was a pale slight man very homely except when he smiled his smile not only broke up the plainness of his face but seemed to chase away a serious shadow allowing his kindly gentle spirit to shine through he was nervous and had a timid manner 
Edwards was his opposite, being a man of robust frame with a heavy face and a manner that would have suggested self-confidence in another man. They were true and tried friends. "'Dave, I couldn't ask her,' said Young, trembling at the very thought. "'Besides, there's no hope for me. I know it. That's why I'm afraid, why I don't want to ask her. What did such a glorious creature see in a poor, puny little thing like me?' "'George, you're not over-handsome,' admitted Dave, shaking his head. "'But you can never tell about women. "'Sometimes they like even little insignificant fellows. "'Don't be too scared about asking her. "'Besides, it will make it easier for me. "'You might tell her about me, you know, sort of feel her out, so I'd—' "'Dave's voice failed him here, but he had said enough, "'and that was most discouraging to poor George. "'Dave was so busy screwing up his courage— that he forgot all about his friend. "'No, I couldn't,' gasped George, falling into a chair. He was ghastly pale. "'I couldn't ask her to accept me, let alone do another man's wooing. "'She thinks more of you. She'll accept you.' "'You really think so?' whispered Dave nervously. "'I know she will. You're such a fine, big figure of a man. She'll take you, and I'll be glad. This fever and fretting has about finished me.' When she's yours, I'll not be so bad. I'll be happy in your happiness. But, Dave, you'll let me see her occasionally, won't you? Go, hurry, get it over. Yes, we must have it over, replied Dave, getting up with a brave effort. Truly, if he carried that determined front to his lady love, he would look like a masterful lover. But when he got to the door, he did not at all resemble a conqueror. You're sure she cares for me asked dave for the hundredth time this time as always his friend was faithful and convincing i know she does go hurry i tell you i can't stand this any longer cried george pushing dave out of the door you won't go first whispered dave clinging to the door i won't go at all i couldn't ask her i don't want her go get out dave started reluctantly toward the adjoining cabin from the open window of which came the song of the young woman who was responsible for all this trouble. George flung himself on his bed. What a relief to feel it was all over. He lay there with eyes shut for hours, as it seemed. After a time, Dave came in. George leaped to his feet and saw his friend stumbling over a chair. Somehow Dave did not look as usual. He seemed changed or shrunken, and his face wore a discomfited, miserable expression well cried george sharply even to his highly excited imagination this did not seem the proper condition for a victorious lover she refused refused me faltered dave she was very sweet and kind said something about being my sister i don't remember just what but she wouldn't have me well, what did you say to her whispered george a paralyzing hope almost rendering him speechless. I, I told her everything I could think of, replied Dave despondently, even what you said. What I said? Dave, what did you tell her I said? Why, you know, about she cared for me, that you were sure of it, and that you didn't want her. Jackass! roared George, rising out of his meekness like a lion roused from slumber. Oh, didn't you say so? inquired Dave weakly no 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 idiot as one possessed george rushed out of the cabin and a moment later stood disheveled and frantic before kate did that fool say i didn't love you he demanded kate looked up startled but as an understanding of george's wild aspect and wilder words stoned upon her she resumed her usual calm demeanor looking again to see if this passionate young man was indeed george she turned her face as she said if you mean mr edwards yes i believe he did say as much indeed from his manner he seemed to have monopolized all the love near the village of peace but it's not true i do love you i love you to distraction i have loved you ever since i first saw you i told dave that heckwelder knows it even the indians know it cried george protesting vehemently against the disparaging allusion to his affections he did not realize he was making a most impassioned declaration of love. When he was quite out of breath, he sat down and wiped his moist brow. 
A pink bloom tinged Kate's cheeks, and her eyes glowed with a happy light. But George never saw these womanly evidences of pleasure. Of course, I know you don't care for me. Did Mr. Edwards tell you so? asked Kate, glancing up quickly. Why, yes, he's often said he thought that. Indeed, he always seemed to regard himself as the fortunate object of your affections. I always believed he was. But it wasn't true. What? It's not true. What's not true? Oh, about my not caring. Kate, cried George, quite overcome with rapture. He fell over two chairs getting to her but he succeeded and fell on his knees to kiss her hand foolish boy it has been you all the time whispered kate with her quiet smile look here downs come to the door see there said heckwelder to jim somewhat surprised at heckwelder's grave tone jim got up from the supper table and looked out of the door he saw two tall indians pacing to and fro under the maples it was still early twilight, and light enough to see clearly. One Indian was almost naked, the lithe, graceful symmetry of his dark figure standing out in sharp contrast to the gaunt, gaudily costumed form of the other. "'Silvertip! Gertie!' exclaimed Jim in a low voice. "'Gertie I know, of course, but I was not sure the other was the Shawnee who captured you and your brother,' replied Heckwelder, drawing Jim into another room. "'What do they mean by loitering around the village?' inquired Jim, apprehensively. Whenever he heard Gertie's name mentioned, or even thought of him, he remembered with a shudder the renegade's allusion to the buzzards. Jim never saw one of these carrion birds soaring overhead, but his thoughts instantly reverted to the frontier ruffian and his horrible craving. "'I don't know,' answered Heckwelder. "'Gertie has been here several times of late.' I saw him conferring with Pipe at Gosh Hawking. I hope there's no deviltry afoot. Pipe is a relentless enemy of all Christians, and Gertie is a fiend, a hyena. I think perhaps it will be well for you and the girls to stay indoors while Gertie and Silvertip are in the village. That evening the entire missionary party were gathered in Mr. Wells' room. Heckwelder told stories of Indian life. Nell sang several songs and Kate told many amusing things said and done by the little Indian boys in her class at the school. Thus the evening passed pleasantly for all. "'So next Wednesday I am to perform the great ceremony,' remarked Heckwelder, laying his hand kindly on Young's knee. "'We'll celebrate the first white wedding in the village of peace.' Young looked shyly down at his boots. Edwards crossed one leg over the other and coughed loudly to hide his embarrassment. Kate wore, as usual, her pensive smile. Nell's eyes twinkled, and she was about to speak, when Heckwelder's quizzical glance in her direction made her lips mute. "'I hope I'll have another wedding on my hands soon,' he said placidly. This ordinary remark had an extraordinary effect. Nell turned with burning cheeks and looked out of the window. Jim frowned fiercely and bit his lips. Edwards began to laugh, and even Mr. Wells' serious face lapsed into a smile. "'I mean I've picked out a nice little Delaware squaw for Dave,' said Heckwelder, seeing his badinage had somehow gone amiss. "'Oh!' suddenly cried Nell in shuddering tones. They all gazed at her in amazement. Every vestige of color had receded from her face, leaving it marble-like. Her eyes were fixed in startled horror. Suddenly she relaxed her grasp on the window sill and fell back limp and senseless. Heckwelder ran to the door to look out, while the others bent over the unconscious girl, endeavoring to revive her. Presently a fluttering breath and a quivering of her dark lashes noted a return of suspended life. Then her beautiful eyes opened wide to gaze with wonder and fear into the grave faces bent so anxiously over her. "'Nell, dearest, you are safe. What was it? What frightened you so?' said Kate tenderly. "'Oh, it was fearful,' gasped Nell, sitting up. She clung to her sister with one hand, while the other grasped Jim's sleeve. "'I was looking out into the dark when suddenly I beheld a face, 
a terrible face cried nell those who watched her marveled at the shrinking awful fear in her eyes it was right by the window i could have touched it such a greedy wolfish face with a long hooked nose the eyes oh the eyes i'll never forget them they made me sick they paralyzed me it wasn't an indian's face it belonged to that white man that awful white man i never saw him before but i knew him gertie said heckwelder who had come in with his quiet step he looked in at the window calm yourself nelly the renegade has gone the incident worried them all at the time and made nell nervous for several days but as gertie had disappeared and nothing more was heard of him gradually they forgot kate's wedding day dawned with all the little party well and happy early in the afternoon jim and nell accompanied by kate and her lover started out into the woods just beyond the clearing for the purpose of gathering wild flowers to decorate the cabin we are both thinking of him jim said after he and nell had walked some little distance in silence yes answered nell simply i hope i pray joe comes back but if he doesn't nell won't you care a little for me he received no answer but nell turned her face away we both loved him if he's gone forever our very love for him should bring us together i know i know he would have wished that jim don't speak of love to me now she whispered then she turned to the others come quickly here are great clusters of wild clematis and goldenrod how lovely let us gather a quantity the young men had almost buried the girls under huge masses of the beautiful flowers when the soft tread of moccasined feet caused them all to turn in surprise six savages stood waist-deep in the bushes where they had lain concealed fierce painted visages scowled from behind leveled rifles don't yell cried a hoarse voice in english following the voice came a snapping of twigs and then two other figures came into view they were gertie and silvertip don't yell or i'll leave you layin here for the buzzards said the renegade he stepped forward and grasped young at the same time speaking in the indian language and pointing to a nearby tree strange to relate the renegade apparently wanted no bloodshed while one of the savages began to tie young to the tree gertie turned his gaze on the girls his little yellow eyes glinted he stroked his chin with a bony hand and his dark repulsive face was wreathed in a terrible meaning smile i've been layin for you he croaked eyeing nell you're the prettiest lass except that maybe bet zane i ever seed on the border i got cheated out in her but i've got you arter i feed your injun preacher to the buzzards maybe you'll learn to love me nell gazed one instant into the monster's face her terror-stricken eyes were piteous to behold she tried to speak but her voice failed then like a stricken bird she fell on the grass end of chapter thirteen of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter fourteen of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter fourteen not many miles from the village of peace rose an irregular chain of hills the first faint indications of the grand appalachian mountain system these ridges were thickly wooded with white oak poplar and hickory among which a sentinel pine reared here and there its evergreen head there were clefts in the hills passes lined by gray stone cliffs below which ran clear brooks tumbling over rocks in a hurry to meet their majestic father the ohio one of these valleys so narrow that the sun seldom brightened the merry brook made a deep cut in the rocks the head of this valley tapered until the walls nearly met it seemed to lose itself in the shade of fern-faced cliffs shadowed as they were by fir trees leaning over the brink 
as though to search for secrets of the ravine so deep and dark and cool was this sequestered nook that here late summer had not dislodged early spring everywhere was a soft fresh bright green the old gray cliffs were festooned with ferns lichens and moss under a great shelving rock damp and stained by the copper-colored water dripping down its side was a dewy dell into which the sunshine had never peeped here the swift brook tarried lovingly making a wide turn under the cliff as though loath to leave this quiet nook and then leaped once more to enthusiasm in its murmuring flight life abounded in this wild beautiful almost inaccessible spot little brown and yellow birds flitted among the trees thrushes ran along the leaf-strewn ground orioles sang their melancholy notes robins and flickers darted beneath the spreading branches squirrels scurried over the leaves like little whirlwinds and leaped daringly from the swinging branches or barked noisily from woody perches rabbits hopped inquisitively here and there while nibbling at the tender shoots of sassafras and laurel along this flower-skirted stream a tall young man carrying a rifle cautiously stepped peering into the branches overhead a gray flash shot along a limb of a white oak then the bushy tail of a squirrel flitted into a well-protected notch from whence no doubt a keen little eye watched the hunter's every movement the rifle was raised then lowered the hunter walked around the tree presently up in the treetop snug under a knotty limb he spied a little ball of gray fur grasping a branch of underbrush he shook it vigorously the thrashing sound worried the gray squirrel for he slipped from his retreat and stuck his nose over the limb crack with a scratching and tearing of bark the squirrel loosened his hold and then fell alighting with a thump as the hunter picked up his quarry a streak of sunshine glinting through the treetop brightened his face the hunter was joe he was satisfied now for after stowing the squirrel in the pocket of his hunting coat he shouldered his rifle and went back up the ravine presently a dull roar sounded above the babble of the brook it grew louder as he threaded his way carefully over the stones spots of white foam flecked the brook passing under the gray stained cliff joe turned around a rocky corner and came to an abrupt end of the ravine a waterfall marked the spot where the brook entered the water was brown as it took the leap light green when it thinned out and below as it dashed on the stones it became a beautiful sheeny white upon a flat rock so near the cascade that spray flew over him sat another hunter the roaring falls drowned all other sounds yet the man roused from his dreamy contemplation of the waterfall when joe rounded the corner i heard four shots he said as joe came up yes i got a squirrel with every shot wetzel led the way along a narrow foot trail which gradually wound toward the top of the ravine this path emerged presently some distance above the falls on the brink of a bluff it ran along the edge of the precipice a few yards then took a course back into densely wooded thickets just before stepping out on the open cliff wetzel paused and peered keenly on all sides there was no living thing to be seen the silence was the deep unbroken calm of the wilderness wetzel stepped to the bluff and looked over the stony wall opposite was only thirty feet away and somewhat lower from wetzel's action it appeared as if he intended to leap the fissure in truth many a band of indians pursuing the hunter into this rocky fastness had come out on the bluff and marveling at what they thought wetzel's prowess believed he had made a wonderful leap thus eluding them but he had never attempted that leap first because he knew it was well nigh impossible and secondly there had never been any necessity for such risk any one leaning over this cliff would have observed perhaps ten feet below a narrow ledge projecting from the face of the rock he would have imagined if he were to drop on that ledge there would be no way to get off and he would be in a worse predicament without a moment's hesitation wetzel swung himself over the ledge 
Joe followed suit. At one end of this lower ledge grew a hardy shrub of the ironwood species, and above it a scrub pine leaned horizontally out over the ravine. Laying his rifle down, Wetzel grasped a strong root and cautiously slid over the side. When all of his body had disappeared, with the exception of his sinewy fingers, they loosened their hold on the root, grasped the rifle, and dragged it down out of sight. Quietly, with similar caution, Joe took hold of the same root, let himself down, and when at full length swung himself in under the ledge. His feet found a pocket in the cliff. Letting go of the root, he took his rifle, and in another second was safe. Of all Wetzel's retreats, for he had many, he considered this one the safest. The cavern under the ledge he had discovered by accident. One day, being hotly pursued by Shawnees, he had been headed off on this cliff, and had let himself down on the ledge, intending to drop from it to the tops of the trees below. Taking advantage of every little aid, he hung over by means of the shrub, and was in the act of leaping, when he saw that the cliff shelved under the ledge, while within reach of his feet was the entrance to a cavern. He found the cave to be small, with an opening at the back into a split in the rock. Evidently the place had been entered from the rear by bears, who used the hole for winter sleeping quarters. By crawling on his hands and knees, Wetzel found the rear opening. Thus he had established a hiding place where it was almost impossible to locate him. He provisioned his retreat, which he always entered by the cliff and left by the rear. An evidence of Wetzel's strange nature and of his love for this wild home manifested itself when he bound Joe to secrecy. It was unlikely, even if the young man ever did get safely out of the wilderness, that any stories he might relate would reveal the hunter's favorite rendezvous. But Wetzel seriously demanded this secrecy, as earnestly as if the forest were full of Indians and white men, all prowling in search of his burrow. Joe was in the seventh heaven of delight, and took to the free life as a wild gosling takes to the water. No place had ever appealed to him, as did this dark, silent hole far up on the side of a steep cliff. His interest in Wetzel soon passed into a great admiration, and from that deepened to love. This afternoon, when they were satisfied that all was well within their refuge, Joe laid aside his rifle, and whistling softly began to prepare supper. The back part of the cave permitted him to stand erect, and was large enough for comparative comfort. There was a neat little stone fireplace, and several cooking utensils and gourds. From time to time Wetzel had brought these things. A pile of wood and a bundle of pine cones lay in one corner. Haunches of dried beef, bear, and buffalo meat hung from pegs. A bag of parched corn, another of dried apples, lay on a rocky shelf. Nearby hung a powder horn filled with salt and pepper. In the cleft back of the cave was a spring of clear cold water. The wants of woodsmen are few and simple. Joe and Wetzel, with appetites whetted by their stirring outdoor life, relished the frugal fare as they could never have enjoyed a feast. As the shadows of evening entered the cave, they lighted their pipes to partake of the hunter's sweetest solace, a quiet smoke. Strange as it may appear, this lonely, stern Indian hunter and the reckless, impulsive boy were admirably suited for companionship. Wetzel had taken a liking to the young man when he led the brothers to Fort Henry. Subsequent events strengthened his liking, and now, many days after, Joe having followed him into the forest, a strong attachment had been insensibly forged between them. Wetzel understood Joe's burning desire to roam the forest but he half expected the lad would soon grow tired of this roving life. But exactly the opposite symptoms were displayed. The hunter had intended to take his comrade on a hunting trip, and to return with him, after that was over, to Fort Henry. They had now been in the wood for weeks, and every day, in some way, Joe had showed his mettle. Wetzel finally admitted him into the secrets of his most cherished hiding place. He did not want to hurt the lad's feelings by taking him back to the settlement. He could not send him back. So the days wore on swiftly. Full of heart-satisfying incident and life, 
with man and boy growing closer in an intimacy that was as warm as it was unusual two reasons might account for this first there is no sane human being who is not better off for companionship an exile would find something of happiness in one who shared his misery and secondly joe was a most acceptable comrade even for a slayer of indians wedded as wetzel was to the forest trails to his lonely life to the nemesis pursuit he had followed for eighteen long years he was still a white man kind and gentle in his quiet hours and because of this though he knew it not still capable of affection he had never known youth his manhood had been one pitiless warfare against his sworn foes but once in all those years had his sore cold heart warmed and that was toward a woman who was not for him his life had held only one purpose a bloody one yet the man had a heart and he could not prevent it from responding to another in his simple ignorance he rebelled against this affection for anything other than his forest homes man is weak against hate what can he avail against love the dark caverns of wetzel's great heart opened admitting to their gloomy depths this stranger so now a new love was born in that cheerless heart where for so long a lonely inmate the ghost of old love had dwelt in chill seclusion the feeling of comradeship which wetzel had for joe was something altogether new in the hunter's life true he had hunted with jonathan zane and accompanied expeditions where he was forced to sleep with another scout but a companion not to say friend he had never known joe was a boy wilder than an eagle yet he was a man he was happy and enthusiastic still his good spirits never jarred on the hunter they were restrained he never asked questions as would seem the case in any eager lad he waited until he was spoken to he was apt he never forgot anything he had the eye of a born woodsman and lastly perhaps what went far with wetzel he was as strong and supple as a young lynx and absolutely fearless on this evening wetzel and joe followed their usual custom they smoked a while before lying down to sleep to-night the hunter was even more silent than usual and the lad tired out with his day's tramp lay down on a bed of fragrant boughs wetzel sat there in the gathering gloom while he pulled slowly on his pipe the evening was very quiet the birds had ceased their twittering the wind had died away it was too early for the bay of a wolf the wail of a panther or hoot of an owl there was simply perfect silence the lad's deep even breathing caught wetzel's ear and he found himself meditating as he had often of late on this new something that had crept into his life for joe loved him he could not fail to see that the lad had preferred to roam with the lonely indian hunter through the forest to encounter the perils and hardships of a wild life rather than accept the smile of fortune and of love wetzel knew that colonel zane had taken a liking to the boy and had offered him work and a home and also the hunter remembered the warm light he had seen in nell's hazel eyes musing thus the man felt stir in his heart an emotion so long absent that it was unfamiliar the avenger forgot for a moment his brooding plans he felt strangely softened when he laid his head on the rude pillow it was with some sense of gladness that although he had always desired a lonely life and wanted to pass it in the fulfillment of his vow his loneliness was now shared by a lad who loved him joe was awakened by the merry chirp of a chipmunk that every morning ran along the seamy side of the opposite wall of the gorge getting up he went to the back of the cave where he found wetzel combing out his long hair the lad thrust his hands into the cold pool and bathed his face the water was icy cold and sent an invigorating thrill through him then he laughed as he took a rude comb wetzel handed to him 
My scalp is nothing to make an Indian very covetous, is it? said he, eyeing in admiration the magnificent black hair that fell over the hunter's shoulders. It'll grow, answered Wetzel. Joe did not wonder at the care Wetzel took of his hair, nor did he misunderstand the hunter's simple pride. Wetzel was very careful of his rifle. He was neat and clean about his person. He brushed his buckskin costume, he polished his knife and tomahawk, but his hair received more attention than all else. It required much care. When combed out, it reached fully to his knees. Joe had seen him, after he returned from a long hunt, work patiently for an hour with his wooden comb, and not stop until every little burr was gone or tangle smoothed out. Then he would comb it again in the morning. This, of course, when time permitted, and twist and tie it up so as to offer small resistance to his slipping through the underbrush. Joe knew the hunter's simplicity was such that if he cut off his hair, it would seem he feared the Indians. For that streaming black hair the Indians had long coveted and sworn to take. It would make any brave a famous chief, and was the theme of many a savage war tale. After breakfast, Wetzel said to Joe, You stay here, and I'll look round some. Maybe I'll come back soon, and we'll go out and kill a buffalo. Injuns sometimes follow up a buffalo trail, and I want to be sure none of the varlets are chasing that herd we saw today. Wetzel left the cave by the rear. It took him fifteen minutes to crawl to the head of the tortuous, stony passage. Lifting the stone which closed up the aperture, he looked out and listened. Then, rising, he replaced the stone and passed down the wooded hillside. It was a beautiful morning. The dew glistened on the green leaves. The sun shone bright and warm. The birds warbled in the trees. The hunter's moccasins pressed so gently on the moss and leaves that they made no more sound than the soft foot of a panther. His trained ear was alert to catch any unfamiliar noise. His keen eyes sought first the remoter open glades and glens, then bent their gaze on the mossy bluff beneath his feet. Fox squirrels dashed from before him into bushy retreats. Grouse whirred away into the thickets. Startled deer whistled and loped off with their white flags upraised. Wetzel knew from the action of these denizens of the woods that he was the only creature not native to these haunts who had disturbed them this morning. Otherwise the deer would not have been grazing, but lying low in some close thicket. Fox squirrels seldom or never were disturbed by a hunter twice in one day, for after being frightened these little animals, wilder and shyer than gray squirrels, remained hidden for hours and grouse that have been flushed a little while before always get up unusually quick and fly very far before alighting. Wetzel circled back over the hill, took a long survey from a rocky eminence, and then reconnoitered the lowland for several miles. He located the herd of buffalo, and satisfying himself there were no Indians near, for the bison were grazing quietly, he returned to the cave. A soft whistle into the back door of the rocky home told Joe that the hunter was waiting. "'Coast clear?' whispered the lad, thrusting his head out of the entrance. His gray eyes gleamed brightly, showing his eager spirit. The hunter nodded, and throwing his rifle in the hollow of his arm, proceeded down the hill. Joe followed closely, endeavoring, as Wetzel had trained him, to make each step precisely in the hunter's footprints. The lad had soon learned to step nimbly and softly as a cat. When halfway down the hill, Wetzel paused. "'See anything?' he whispered. Joe glanced on all sides. Many mistakes had taught him to be cautious. He had learned from experience that for every woodland creature he saw, there were ten watching his every move. Just now he could not see even a little red squirrel. Everywhere were sturdy hickory and oak trees, thickets and hazelnuts, slender ash saplings, and in the open glades patches of sumac. Rotting trees lay on the ground, while ferns nodded long, slender heads over the fallen monarchs. Joe could make out nothing but the colors of the woods, the gray of the tree trunks, and in the openings through the forest green, the dead purple haze of forests farther on. 
he smiled and shaking his head at the hunter by his action admitted failure try again dead ahead whispered wetzel joe bent a direct gaze on the clump of sassafras one hundred feet ahead he searched the open places the shadows even the branches then he turned his eyes slowly to the right whatever was discernible to human vision he studied intently suddenly his eye became fixed on a small object protruding from behind a beech tree it was pointed and in color darker than the gray bark of the beech it had been a very easy matter to pass over this little thing but now that the lad saw it he knew to what it belonged that's a buck's ear he replied hardly had he finished speaking when wetzel intentionally snapped a twig there was a crash and commotion in the thicket branches moved and small saplings waved then out into the open glade bounded a large buck with a whistle of alarm throwing his rifle to a level joe was trying to cover the bounding deer when the hunter struck up his piece lad don't kill for the sake of killin he said quietly we have plenty of venison we'll go order a buffalo i have a hankerin for a good rump steak half an hour later the hunters emerged from the forest into a wide plain of waving grass it was a kind of oval valley encircled by hills and had been at one time perhaps covered with water joe saw a herd of large animals browsing like cattle in a meadow his heart beat high for until that moment the only buffalo he had seen were the few which stood on the river banks as the raft passed down the ohio he would surely get a shot at one of these huge fellows wetzel bade joe do exactly as he did whereupon he dropped on his hands and knees and began to crawl through the long grass this was easy for the hunter but very hard for the lad to accomplish still he managed to keep his comrade in sight which was a matter for congratulation because the man crawled as fast as he walked at length after what to joe seemed a very long time the hunter paused are we near enough whispered joe breathlessly nope we're just circling on em. the wind's not right and i'm afeard they'll get our scent wetzel rose carefully and peeped over the top of the grass then dropping on all fours he resumed the advance he paused again presently and waited for joe to come up see here young feller remember never hurry unless the business calls for speed and then act like lightning thus admonishing the eager lad wetzel continued to crawl it was easy for him joe wondered how those wide shoulders got between the weeds and grasses without breaking or at least shaking them but so it was flat now whispered wetzel putting his broad hand on joe's back and pressing him down now's your time for good practice trail your rifle over your back if you're careful it won't slide off and reach out far with one arm and dig your fingers in deep then pull yourself forward wetzel slipped through the grass like a huge buckskin snake his long lithe body wormed its way among the reeds but for joe even with the advantage of having the hunter's trail to follow it was difficult work the dry reeds broke under him and the stalks of sawgrass shook he worked persistently at it learning all the while and improving with every rod he was surprised to hear a swish followed by a dull blow on the ground raising his head he looked forward he saw the hunter wipe his tomahawk on the grass snake whispered wetzel joe saw a huge black snake squirming in the grass its head had been severed he caught glimpses of other snakes gliding away and glossy round moles darting into their holes a gray rabbit started off with a leap we're near enough whispered wetzel stopping behind a bush he rose and surveyed the plain then motioned joe to look joe raised himself on his knees as his gaze reached the level of the grassy plain his heart leaped not fifty yards away was a great shaggy black buffalo he was the king of the herd but ill at ease for he pawed the grass and shook his huge head near him were several cows and a half-grown calf beyond was the main herd extending as far as joe could see a great sea of black humps the lad breathed hard as he took in the grand sight pick out the little feller the reddish brown one and plug him behind the shoulder 
shoot close now for if we miss maybe i can't hit one because i'm not used to shooting at such small marks wetzel's rare smile lighted up his dark face probably he could have shot a fly off the horn of the bull if one of the big flies or bees plainly visible as they swirled around the huge head had alighted there joe slowly raised his rifle he had covered the calf and was about to pull the trigger when with a sagacity far beyond his experience as hunter he whispered to wetzel if i fire they may run toward us nope they'll run away answered wetzel thinking the lad was as keen as an indian joe quickly covered the calf again and pulled the trigger bellowing loud the big bull dashed off the herd swung around toward the west and soon were galloping off with a lumbering roar the shaggy humps bobbed up and down like hot angry waves on a storm-blackened sea upon going forward wetzel and joe found the calf lying dead in the grass you might have did better than that remarked the hunter as he saw where the bullet had struck you went a little too fur back but maybe that was cause the calf stepped as you shot End of chapter 14 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter 15 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 15. So the days pass swiftly, dreamily, each one bringing Joe a keener delight. In a single month he was as good a woodsman as many pioneers who had passed years on the border, for he had the advantage of a teacher whose woodcraft was incomparable. Besides, he was naturally quick in learning, and with all his interests centered upon forest lore, it was no wonder he assimilated much of Wetzel's knowledge. He was ever willing to undertake anything whereby he might learn. Often, when they were miles away in the dense forest, far from their cave, he asked Wetzel to let him try to lead the way back to camp, and he never failed once, though many times he got off a straight course, thereby missing the easy traveling. Joe did wonderfully well, but he lacked, as nearly all white men do, the subtler, intuitive forest instinct which makes the Indian as much at home in the woods as in his teepee. Wetzel had this developed to a high degree. It was born in him years of training years of passionate unrelenting search for indians had given him a knowledge of the woods that was incomprehensible to white men and appalling to his red foes joe saw how wetzel used this ability but what it really was baffled him he realized that words were not adequate to explain fully this great art its possession required a marvelously keen vision an eye perfectly familiar with every creature tree rock shrub and thing belonging in the forest an eye so quick in flight as to detect instantly the slightest change in nature or anything unnatural to that environment the hearing must be delicate like that of a deer and the finer it is the keener will be the woodsman lastly there is the feeling that prompts the old hunter to say no game today it is something in him that speaks when, as he sees a night hawk circling low near the ground, he says, A storm tomorrow. It is what makes an Indian at home in any wilderness. The clouds may hide the guiding star, the northing may be lost, there may be no moss on the trees or difference in their bark, the ridges may be flat or lost altogether, and there may be no water courses. Yet the Indian brave always goes for his teepee straight as a crow flies it was this voice which rightly bade wetzel when he was baffled by an indian's trail fading among the rocks to cross or circle or advance in the direction taken by his wily foe joe had practiced trailing deer and other hoofed game until he was true as a hound then he began to perfect himself in the art of following a human being through the forest Except a few old Indian trails, which the rain had half obliterated, he had no tracks to discover, save Wetzel's, and these were as hard to find as the airy course of a grosbeak. On soft ground or marshy grass, 
which Wetzel avoided where he could, he left a faint trail, but on a hard surface, for all the traces he left, he might as well not have gone over the ground at all. Joe's persistence stood him in good stead. He hung on, and the more he failed, the harder he tried. Often he would slip out of the cave after Wetzel had gone, and try to find which way he had taken. In brief, the lad became a fine marksman, a good hunter, and a close, persevering student of the wilderness. He loved the woods and all they contained. He learned the habits of the wild creatures. Each deer, each squirrel, each grouse that he killed taught him some lesson. He was always up with the lark to watch the sun rise red and grand over the eastern hills and chase away the white mist from the valleys. Even if he was not hunting or roaming the woods, if it was necessary for him to lie low in camp awaiting Wetzel's return, he was always content. Many hours he idled away lying on his back, with the west wind blowing softly over him, his eye on the distant hills where the cloud shadows swept across with slow majestic movement like huge ships at sea. If Wetzel and Joe were far distant from the cave, as was often the case, they made camp in the open woods, and it was here that Joe's contentment was fullest. Twilight shades stealing down over the campfire, the cheery glow of red embers, the crackling of dry stalks, the sweet smell of wood smoke, all had for the lad a subtle, potent charm. The hunter would broil a venison steak or a partridge on the coals, then they would light their pipes and smoke while twilight deepened. The oppressive stillness of the early evening hour always brought to the younger man a sensation of awe. At first he attributed this to the fact that he was new to this life. However, as the days passed and the emotion remained, nay, grew stronger, he concluded it was imparted by this close communion with nature. Deep, solemn, tranquil, the gloaming hour brought him no ordinary fullness of joy and clearness of perception. "'Do you ever feel this stillness?' he asked Wetzel one evening as they sat near their flickering fire. The hunter puffed his pipe, and like an Indian, seemed to let the question take deep root. "'I've scalped redskins every hour in the day, except in twilight,' he replied. Joe wondered no longer whether the hunter was too hardened to feel this beautiful tranquillity. That hour which wooed Wetzel from his implacable pursuit was indeed a bewitching one. There was never a time when Joe lay alone in camp waiting for Wetzel that he did not hope the hunter would return with information of Indians. The man never talked about the savages, and if he spoke at all, it was to tell of some incident of his day's travel. One evening he came back with a large black fox that he had killed. "'What beautiful glossy fur,' said Joe. "'I never saw a black fox before.' "'I've been laying for this feller some time,' replied Wetzel, as he began his first evening task, that of combing his hair. "'Just back here in a clump of cottonwoods there's a holler log full of leaves. Happened to see a black snake sneaking around, I thought maybe he was up to something. So I investigated and found a nest full of young rabbits. I killed a snake, and arter that took an interest in him. Every time I passed I'd look in at the bunnies, and each time I seen signs that some tarnal varmint had been prowling round. One day I missed a bunny, and next day another so on until only one was left a pert white and gray little scamp something was stealing of em and it made me mad so yesterday and today i watched and finally i plugged this black thief yes he's got a glossy coat but he's a bad un for all his fine looks these black foxes are bigger stronger and cunninger than red ones in every litter you'll find a dark one the black sheep of the family because he grows so much faster and steals all the food from the others. The mother just takes him by the nape of the neck and chucks him out in the world to shift for herself. And it's a good thing. The next day Wetzel told Joe they would go across country to seek new game fields. Accordingly the two set out and tramped industriously until evening. They came upon a country no less beautiful than the one they had left, though the picturesque cliffs and rugged hills had given way to a rolling land 
the luxuriance of which was explained by the abundant springs and streams forests and fields were thickly interspersed with bubbling springs narrow and deep streams and here and there a small lake with a running outlet wetzel had said little concerning this region but that little was enough to rouse all joe's eagerness for it was to the effect that they were now in a country much traversed by indians especially runners and hunting parties traveling from north to south the hunter explained that through the center of this tract ran a buffalo road that the buffalo always picked out the straightest lowest and driest path from one range to another and the indians followed these first pathfinders joe and wetzel made camp on the bank of a stream that night and as the lad watched the hunter build a hidden campfire he peered furtively around half expecting to see dark forms scurrying through the forest wetzel was extremely cautious he stripped pieces of bark from fallen trees and built a little hut over his firewood he rubbed some powder on a piece of punk and then with flint and steel dropped two or three sparks on the inflammable substance soon he had a blaze he arranged the covering so that not a ray of light escaped when the flames had subsided and the wood had burned down to a glowing bed of red he threw aside the bark and broiled the strips of venison they had brought with him they rested on a bed of boughs which they had cut and arranged alongside a huge log for hours joe lay awake he could not sleep he listened to the breeze rustling the leaves and shivered at the thought of the sighing wind he had once heard moan through the forest presently he turned over the slight noise instantly awakened wetzel who lifted his dark face while he listened intently he spoke one word sleep and lay back again on the leaves joe forced himself to be quiet relaxed all his muscles and soon slumbered on the morrow wetzel went out to look over the hunting prospects about noon he returned joe was surprised to find some slight change in the hunter he could not tell what it was i seen injun signs said wetzel there's no tellin how soon we may run again the snakes we can't hunt here like as not there's hurons and delawares skulkin round i think i better take you back to the village it's all on my account you say that said joe sure wetzel replied if you were alone what would you do i calculate i'd hunt for some redskin game the supreme moment had come joe's heart beat hard he could not miss this opportunity he must stay with the hunter he looked closely at wetzel i won't go back to the village he said the hunter stood in his favorite position leaning on his long rifle and made no response i won't go continued joe earnestly let me stay with you if at any time i hamper you or cannot keep the pace then leave me to shift for myself but don't make me go until i weaken let me stay fire and fearlessness spoke in joe's every word and his gray eyes contracted with their peculiar steely flash plain it was that while he might fail to keep pace with wetzel he did not fear this dangerous country and if it must be would face it alone wetzel extended his broad hand and gave his comrades a vice-like squeeze to allow the lad to remain with him was more than he would have done for any other person in the world far better to keep the lad under his protection while it was possible for joe was taking the war trail which had for every hunter somewhere along its bloody course a bullet a knife or a tomahawk wetzel knew that joe was conscious of this inevitable conclusion for it showed in his white face and in the resolve of his big gray eyes so there in the shade of a towering oak the indian killer admitted the boy into his friendship and into a life which would no longer be play but eventful stirring hazardous well lad stay he said with that rare smile which brightened his dark face like a ray of stray sunshine we'll hang round these diggings a few days first off we'll take in the lay of the land you go downstream a ways and scout round some while i go up and then circle down move slow now and don't miss nothing joe followed the stream a mile or more 
he kept close in the shade of willows and never walked across an open glade without first waiting and watching he listened to all sounds but none were unfamiliar he closely examined the sand along the stream and the moss and leaves under the trees when he had been separated from wetzel several hours and concluded he would slowly return to camp he ran across a well-beaten path winding through the forest this was perhaps one of the bridle trails wetzel had referred to he bent over the worn grass with keen scrutiny Quack! the loud report of a heavily charged rifle rang out joe felt the zip of a bullet as it fanned his cheek with an agile leap he gained the shelter of a tree from behind which he peeked to see who had shot at him he was just in time to detect the dark form of an indian dart behind the foliage a hundred yards down the path joe expected to see other indians and to hear more shots but he was mistaken evidently the savage was alone for the tree joe had taken refuge behind was scarcely large enough to screen his body which disadvantage the other indians would have been quick to note joe closely watched the place where his assailant had disappeared and presently saw a dark hand then a naked elbow and finally the ramrod of a rifle the savage was reloading soon a rifle barrel protruded from behind the tree with his heart beating like a trip hammer and the skin tightening on his face joe screened his body as best he might the tree was small but it served as a partial protection rapidly he revolved in his mind plans to outwit the enemy the indian was behind a large oak with a low limb over which he could fire without exposing his own person to danger bang the indian's rifle bellowed the bullet crumbled the bark close to joe's face the lad yelled loudly staggered to his knees and then fell into the path where he lay quiet the redskin gave an exultant shout seeing that the fallen figure remained quite motionless he stepped forward drawing his knife as he came he was a young brave quick and eager in his movements and came nimbly up the path to gain his coveted trophy the pale-face's scalp joe suddenly sat up raised his rifle quickly as thought and fired point black at the indian but he missed the redskin stopped aghast when he saw the lad thus seemingly come back to life then realizing that joe's aim had been futile he bounded forward brandishing his knife and uttering infuriated yells joe rose to his feet with rifle swung high above his head when the savage was within twenty feet so near that his dark face swollen with fierce passion could be plainly discerned a peculiar whistling noise sounded over joe's shoulder it was accompanied rather than followed by a clear ringing rifle shot the indian stopped as if he had encountered a heavy shock from a tree or stone barring his way clutching at his breast he uttered a weird cry and sank slowly on the grass joe ran forward to bend over the prostrate figure the indian a slender handsome young brave had been shot through the breast he held his hand tightly over the wound while bright red blood trickled between his fingers flowed down his side and stained the grass the brave looked steadily up at joe shot as he was dying as he knew himself to be there was no yielding in the dark eye only an unquenchable hatred then the eyes glazed the fingers ceased twitching joe was bending over a dead indian it flashed into his mind of course that wetzel had come up in time to save his life but he did not dwell on the thought he shrank from this violent death of a human being but it was from the aspect of the dead not from remorse for the deed his heart beat fast his fingers trembled yet he felt only a strange coldness in all his being the savage had tried to kill him perhaps even now had it not been for the hunter's unerring aim would have been gloating over a bloody scalp joe felt rather than heard the approach of someone and turned to see wetzel coming down the path he's a lone shawnee runner said the hunter gazing down at the dead indian he was trying to win his eagle plumes i seen you both from the hillside you did exclaimed joe then he laughed it was lucky for me i tried the dodge you taught me but in my eagerness i missed well you had no call for hurry 
You worked the trick clever, but you missed him when there was plenty of time. I had to shoot over your shoulder, or I'd have plugged him sooner. Oh, where were you? asked Joe. Up there by that bit of sumac, said Wetzel, pointing to an open ridge on a hillside not less than a hundred and fifty yards distant. Joe wondered which of the two bullets, the death-seeking one fired by the savage, or the life-saving missile from Wetzel's fatal weapon, had passed nearest to him. Come, said the hunter, after he had scalped the Indian. What's to be done with this savage? inquired Joe, as Wetzel started up the path. Let him lay. They returned to camp without further incident, while the hunter busied himself reinforcing their temporary shelter, for the clouds looked threatening. Joe cut up some buffalo meat, and then went down to the brook for a gourd of water. He came hurriedly back to where Wetzel was working, and spoke in a voice which he vainly endeavored to hold steady. "'Come quickly. I've seen something which may mean a good deal.' He led the way down to the brookside. "'Look,' Joe said, pointing at the water. Here the stream was about two feet deep, perhaps twenty wide, and had just a noticeable current. Shortly before it had been as clear as a bright summer sky. It was now tinged with yellow clouds that slowly floated downstream, each one enlarging and becoming fainter as the clear water permeated and stained. Grains of sand glided along with the current. Little pieces of bark floated on the surface, and minnows darted to and fro, nibbling at these drifting particles. "'Deer wouldn't roil the water like that. What does it mean?' asked Joe. "'Engines, and not fur away.' Wetzel returned to the shelter and tore it down. Then he bent the branch of a beech tree low over the place. He pulled down another branch over the remains of the campfire. These precautions made the spot less striking. Wetzel knew that an Indian scout never glances casually. His roving eyes survey the forest, perhaps quickly, but thoroughly. An unnatural position, a bush or log, always leads to an examination. This done, the hunter grasped Joe's hand and led him up the knoll. Making his way behind a well-screened tree which had been uprooted, he selected a position where, hidden themselves, they could see the creek. Hardly had Wetzel admonished Joe to lie perfectly still, when from a short distance up the stream came the sound of splashing water. But nothing could be seen above the open glade, as in that direction willows lined the creek in dense thickets. The noise grew more audible. Suddenly Joe felt a muscular contraction pass over the powerful frame lying close beside him. It was a convulsive thrill, such as passes through a tiger when he is about to spring upon his quarry. So subtle and strong was its meaning, so clearly did it convey to the lad what was coming, that he felt it himself, save that in his case it was a cold, chill shudder. Breathless suspense followed. Then into the open space along the creek glided a tall Indian warrior. He was knee-deep in the water, where he waded with low, cautious steps. His garish, befurled costume seemed familiar to Joe. He carried a rifle at a low trail, and passed slowly ahead with evident distrust. The lad believed he recognized that head, with his tangled black hair, and when he saw the swarthy, villainous countenance turned full toward him, he exclaimed, Dirty! By Wetzel's powerful arm forced him so hard against the log that he could not complete the exclamation. But he could still see. Gertie had not heard the stifled cry, for he continued his slow waiting, and presently his tall, gaudily decorated form passed out of sight. Another savage appeared in the open space, and then another. Close between them walked a white man, with hands bound behind him. The prisoner and guards disappeared downstream among the willows. The splashing continued, grew even louder than before. A warrior came into view, then another and another. They walked close together. Two more followed. They were waiting by the side of a raft made of several logs, upon which were two prostrate figures that closely resembled human beings. Joe was so intent upon the lithe forms of the Indians that he barely got a glimpse of their floating prize, whatever it might have been. Bringing up the rear was an athletic warrior whose broad shoulders, sinewy arms, and shaved, polished head Joe remembered well. 
it was the shawnee chief silvertip when he too passed out of sight in the curve of the willows joe found himself trembling he turned eagerly to wetzel but instantly recoiled terrible indeed had been the hunter's transformation all calmness of facial expression was gone he was now stern somber an intense emotion was visible in his white face his eyes seemed reduced to two dark shining points and they emitted so fierce so piercing a flash so deadly a light that joe could not bear their glittering gaze three white captives two of em women uttered the hunter as if weighing in his mind the importance of this fact were those women on the raft questioned joe and as wetzel only nodded he continued a white man and two women six warriors silvertip and that renegade jim girty wetzel deigned not to answer joe's passionate outburst but maintained silence and his rigid posture joe glanced once more at the stern face considering we'd go after girty and his redskins if they were alone we're pretty likely to go quicker now that they've got white women prisoners eh and joe laughed fiercely between his teeth the lad's heart expanded while along every nerve tingled an exquisite thrill of excitement he had yearned for wild border life here he was in it with the hunter whose name alone was to the savages a symbol for all that was terrible wetzel evidently decided quickly on what was to be done for in few words he directed joe to cut up so much of the buffalo meat as they could stow in their pockets then bidding the lad to follow he turned into the woods walking rapidly and stopping now and then for a brief instant soon they emerged from the forest into more open country they faced a wide plain skirted on the right by a long winding strip of bright green willows which marked the course of the stream on the edge of this plain wetzel broke into a run he kept his pace for a distance of a hundred yards then stopped to listen intently as he glanced sharply on all sides after which he was off again halfway across this plain joe's wind began to fail and his breathing became labored but he kept close to the hunter's heels once he looked back to see a great wide expanse of waving grass they had covered perhaps four miles at a rapid pace and were nearing the other side of the plain the lad felt as if his head was about to burst a sharp pain seized upon his side a blood-red film obscured his sight he kept doggedly on and when utterly exhausted fell to the ground when a few minutes later having recovered his breath he got up they had crossed the plain and were in a grove of beeches directly in front of him ran a swift stream which was divided at the rocky head of what appeared to be a wooded island there was only a slight ripple and fall of the water and after a second glance it was evident that the point of land was not an island but a portion of the mainland which divided the stream the branches took almost opposite courses joe wondered if they had headed off the indians certainly they had run fast enough he was wet with perspiration he glanced at wetzel who was standing near the man's broad breast rose and fell a little faster that was the only evidence of exertion the lad had a painful feeling that he could never keep pace with the hunter if this five-mile run was a sample of the speed he would be forced to maintain they got ahead of us but which quick did they take queried wetzel as though debating the question with himself uh, how do you know they passed we circled answered wetzel as he shook his head and pointed into the bushes joe stepped over and looked into the thicket he found a quantity of dead leaves sticks and litter thrown aside exposing to light a long hollowed place on the ground it was what would be seen after rolling over a log that had lain for a long time little furrows in the ground holes mounds and curious winding passages showed where grubs and crickets had made their homes the frightened insects were now running around wildly what was here a log a twenty-foot canoe was hid under that stuff the engines has taken one of these streams how can we tell which one maybe we can't but we'll try grab up a few of them bugs go below that rocky point and crawl close to the bank so you can just peep over be careful not to show the tip of your head and don't knock nothing off the bank into the water 
watch for trout look everywheres and drop in a bug now and then i'll do the same for the other stream then we'll come back here and talk over what the fish has to say about the engines joe walked down the stream a few paces and dropping on his knees crawled carefully to the edge of the bank he slightly parted the grass so he could peep through and found himself directly over a pool with a narrow shoal running out from the opposite bank the water was so clear he could see the pebbly bottom in all parts except a dark hole near a bend in the shore close by he did not see a living thing in the water not a crawfish turtle nor even a frog he peered round closely then flipped in one of the bugs he had brought along a shiny yellow fish flared up from the depths of the deep hole and disappeared with the cricket but it was a bass or a pike not a trout wetzel had said there were a few trout living near the cool springs of these streams the lad tried again to coax one to the surface this time the more fortunate cricket swam and hopped across the stream to safety when joe's eyes were thoroughly accustomed to the clear water with its deceiving lights and shades he saw a fish lying snug under the side of a stone the lad thought he recognized the snub nose the hooked wolfish jaw but he could not get sufficient of a view to classify him he crawled to a more advantageous position farther downstream then he peered again through the woods yes sure enough he had espied a trout he well knew those spotted silver sides that broad square tail such a monster in his admiration for the fellow and his wish for a hook and lime to try conclusions with him joe momentarily forgot his object remembering he tossed out a big fat cricket which alighted on the water just above the fish the trout never moved nor even blinked the lad tried again with no better success the fish would not rise thereupon joe returned to the point where he had left wetzel i didn't see nothing over there said the hunter who was waiting did you see any one and a big fellow did he see you no did he rise to a bug no he didn't but then maybe he wasn't hungry answered joe who could not understand what wetzel was driving at tell me exactly what he did well, that's just the trouble he didn't do anything replied joe thoughtfully he just lay low stiff-like under a stone he never batted an eye but his side fins quivered like an aspen leaf them side fins tell us the story gertie and his redskins have took this branch said wetzel positively the other leads to the huron towns gertie's got a place near the delaware camp somewheres i've tried to find it a good many times he's took more'n one white lass there and nobody ever seen her again fiend to think of a white woman maybe a girl like nell wells at the mercy of those red devils the young feller don't go wrong i'll allow injuns is bad enough but i never hearn tell of one abusin a white woman as mayhap you mean injuns marry white women sometimes kill and scalp em often but that's all it's men of our own color renegades like this gertie as do worse than murder here was the amazing circumstance of lewis wetzel the acknowledged insatiable foe of all red men speaking a good word for his enemies joe was so astonished he did not attempt to answer here's where they got in the canoe one more look and then we're off said wetzel he strode up and down the sandy beach examined the willows and scrutinized the sand suddenly he bent over and picked up an object from the water his sharp eyes had caught the glint of something white which upon being examined proved to be a small ivory or bone buckle with the piece broken out he showed it to joe by heavens wetzel that's the buckle off nell wells shoe i've seen it too many times to mistake it i was afeard gertie had your friends the sisters and and maybe your brother too jack zane said the renegade was hanging round the village and that couldn't be for no good come on let's kill the fiend cried joe white to the lips i calculate they're about a mile downstream making camp for the night i know the place there's a fine spring and look do you see them crows flying round that big oak with the bleached top hear them calling you might think they was chasing a hawk or kingbirds were arterin 
but that fuss they're making is because they see injuns well asked joe impatiently it'll be moonlight a while arter midnight we'll lay low and wait and then the sharp click of his teeth like the snap of a steel trap completed the sentence joe said no more but followed the hunter into the woods stopping near a fallen tree wetzel raked up a bundle of leaves and spread them on the ground then he cut a few spreading branches from a beech and leaned them against the log bidding the lad crawl in before he took one last look around and then made his way under the shelter it was yet daylight which seemed a strange time to creep into this little nook but joe thought it was not to sleep only to wait 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 for the long hours to pass he was amazed once more because by the time twilight had given place to darkness wetzel was asleep the lad said then to himself that he would never again be surprised at the hunter he assumed once and for all that wetzel was capable of anything yet how could he lose himself in slumber feeling as he must over the capture of the girls eager to draw a bead on the black-hearted renegade hating indians with all his soul and strength and lying there but a few hours before what he knew would be a bloody battle wetzel calmly went to sleep knowing the hunter to be as bloodthirsty as a tiger joe had expected he would rush to a combat with his foes but no this man with his keen sagacity knew when to creep upon his enemy he bided that time and while he waited slept joe could not close his eyes in slumber through the interstices and the branches he saw the stars come out one by one the darkness deepened and the dim outline of tall trees over the dark hill came out sharply the moments dragged each one an hour he heard a whippoorwill call lonely and dismal then an owl hoot monotonously a stealthy-footed animal ran along the log sniffed at the boughs and then scurried away over the dry leaves by and by the dead silence of night fell over all still joe lay there wide awake listening his heart on fire he was about to rescue nell to kill that hawk-nosed renegade to fight silver tip to the death the hours passed but not joe's passionate eagerness when at last he saw the crescent moon gleam silver white over the black hilltop he knew the time was nigh and over him ran thrill on thrill End of chapter 15 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter 16 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 16 When the waning moon rose high enough to shed a pale light over forest and field, two dark figures, moving silently from the shade of the trees, crossed the moonlit patches of ground, out to the open plain, where low on the grass hung silver mists. A timber wolf, gray and gaunt, came loping along with lowered nose. A new scent brought the animal to a standstill his nose went up his fiery eyes scanned the plain two men had invaded his domain and with a short dismal bark he dashed away like spectres gliding swiftly with noiseless tread the two vanished the long grass had swallowed them deserted once again seemed the plain it became unutterably lonely no stir no sound no life nothing but a wide expanse bathed in sad gray light the moon shone steadily the silver radiance mellowed the stars paled before this brighter glory slowly the night hours wore away on the other side of the plain near where the adjoining forest loomed darkling the tall grass parted to disclose a black form was it only a deceiving shade cast by a leafy branch only a shadow slowly it sank and was lost once more the gray unwavering line of silver-crested grass tufts was unbroken only the night breeze wandering caressingly over the grass 
might have told of two dark forms gliding 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 so softly so surely so surely toward the forest only the moon and the pale stars had eyes to see these creeping figures like avengers they moved on a mission to slay and to save on over the dark line where plain merged into forest they crawled no whispering no hesitating but a silent slow certain progress showed their purpose in single file they slipped over the moss the leader clearing the path inch by inch they advanced tedious was this slow movement difficult and painful this journey which must end in lightning-like speed they rustled no leaf nor snapped a twig nor shook a fern but passed onward slowly like the approach of death the seconds passed as minutes minutes as hours an entire hour was spent in advancing twenty feet at last the top of the knoll was reached the avenger placed his hand on his follower's shoulder the strong pressure was meant to remind to warn to reassure then like a huge snake the first glided away he who was left behind raised his head to look into the open place called the glade of the beautiful spring an oval space lay before him exceedingly lovely in the moonlight a spring as if a pearl gemmed the centre an indian guard stood statue-like against a stone other savages lay in a row their polished heads shining one slumbering form was bedecked with feathers and frills near him lay an indian blanket from the border of which peered two faces gleaming white and sad in the pitying moonlight the watcher quivered at the sight of those pale faces but he must wait while long moments passed he must wait for the avenger to creep up silently kill the guard and release the prisoners without awakening the savages if that plan failed he was to rush into the glade and in the excitement make off with one of the captives he lay there waiting listening wrought up to the intensest pitch of fierce passion every nerve was alert every tendon strung and every muscle strained ready for the leap only the faint rustling of leaves the low swish of swaying branches the soft murmur of falling water and over all the sigh of the night wind proved to him that this picture was not an evil dream his gaze sought the quiet figures lingered hopefully on the captives menacingly on the sleeping savages and glowered over the gaudily arrayed form his glance sought the upright guard as he stood a dark blot against the gray stone he saw the indian's plume a single feather waving silver white then it became riveted on the bubbling refulgent spring the pool was round perhaps five feet across and shone like a burnished shield it mirrored the moon the twinkling stars the spectre trees an unaccountable horror suddenly swept over the watching man his hair stood straight up a sensation as of cold stole chillingly over him whether it was the climax of this long night's excitement or anticipation of the bloody struggle soon to come he knew not did this boiling spring shimmering in the silver moon rays hold in its murky depths a secret did these lonesome shadowing trees with their sad drooping branches harbor a mystery if a future tragedy was to be enacted here in this quiet glade could the murmuring water or leaves whisper its portent no they were only silent only unintelligible with nature's mystery the waiting man cursed himself for a craven coward he fought back the benumbing sense he steeled his heart was this his vaunted willingness to share the avenger's danger his strong spirit rose up in arms once more he was brave and fierce he fastened a piercing gaze on the plumed guard the indian's lounging posture against the rock was the same as it had been before yet now it seemed to have a kind of strained attention the savage's head was poised like that of a listening deer the wary indian scented danger a faint moan breathed low above the sound of gently splashing water somewhere beyond the glade Woo! 
the guard's figure stiffened and became rigidly erect his blanket slowly slid to his feet oh sighed the soft breeze in the treetops louder than with a deep wail a moan arose out of the dark gray shadows swelling thrillingly on the still air and died away mournfully a moo the sentinel's form melted into the shade he was gone like a phantom another indian rose quickly and glanced furtively around the glade he bent over a comrade and shook him instantly the second indian was on his feet scarcely had he gained a standing posture when an object bounding like a dark ball shot out of the thicket and hurled both warriors to the earth a moonbeam glinted upon something bright it flashed again on a swift sweeping circle a short choking yell aroused the other savages up they sprang alarmed confused the shadow form darted among them it moved with inconceivable rapidity it became a monster terrible was the convulsive conflict dull blows the click of steel angry shouts agonized yells and thrashing wrestling sounds mingled together and half drowned by an awful roar like that of a mad bull the strife ceased as suddenly as it had begun warriors lay still on the grass others writhed in agony for an instant a fleeting shadow crossed the open lane leading out of the glade then it vanished three savages had sprung toward their rifles a blinding flash a loud report burst from the thicket overhead the foremost savage sank lifelessly the others were intercepted by a giant shadow with brandished rifle the watcher on the knoll had entered the glade he stood before the stacked rifles and swung his heavy gun crash an indian went down before that sweep but rose again the savages backed away from this threatening figure and circled round it the noise of the other conflict ceased more savages joined the three who glided to and fro before their desperate foe they closed in upon him only to be beaten back one savage threw a glittering knife another hurled a stone a third flung his tomahawk which struck fire from the swinging rifle he held them at bay while they had no firearms he was master of the situation with every sweep of his arms he brought the long rifle down and knocked a flint from the firelock of an enemy's weapon soon the indian's guns were useless slowly then he began to edge away from the stone toward the opening where he had seen the fleeting form vanish his intention was to make a dash for life for he had heard a noise behind the rock and remembered the guard he saw the savages glance behind him and anticipated danger from that direction but he must not turn a second there might be fatal he backed defiantly along the rock until he gained its outer edge but too late the indians glided before him now behind him he was surrounded he turned around and around with the ever circling rifle whirling in the faces of the baffled foe once opposite the lane leading from the glade he changed his tactics and plunged with fierce impetuosity into the midst of the painted throng then began a fearful conflict the indians fell before the sweep of his powerful arms but grappled with him from the ground he literally ploughed his way through the struggling mass warding off a hundred vicious blows savage after savage he flung off until at last he had a clear path before him freedom lay beyond that shiny path into it he bounded as he left the glade the plumed guard stepped from behind a tree near the entrance of the path and cast his tomahawk a white glittering flash it flew after the fleeing runner its aim was true suddenly the moonlight path darkened in the runner's sight he saw a million flashing stars a terrible pain assailed him he sank slowly slowly down then all was darkness End of chapter 16 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter 17 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Chapter 17 Joe awoke as from a fearsome nightmare returning consciousness brought a vague idea that he had been dreaming of clashing weapons of yelling savages 
of a conflict in which he had been clutched by sinewy fingers. An acute pain pulsed through his temples. A bloody mist glazed his eyes. A sore pressure cramped his arms and legs. Surely he dreamed this distress as well as the fight. The red film cleared from his eyes. His wandering gaze showed the stern reality. The bright sun, making the dewdrops glisten on the leaves, lighted up a tragedy. Near him lay an Indian whose vacant, sightless eyes were fixed in death. Beyond lay four more savages, the peculiar, inert position of whose limbs, the formlessness, as it were, as if they had been thrown from a great height and never moved again, attested that here, too, life had been extinguished. Joe took in only one detail, the cloven skull of the nearest, when he turned away sickened. He remembered it all now. The advance, the rush, the fight, all returned. He saw again Wetzel's shadowy form darting like a demon into the whirl of conflict. He heard again that hoarse, booming roar with which the Avenger accompanied his blows. Joe's gaze swept the glade, but found no trace of the hunter. He saw Silvertip and another Indian bathing a wound on Gertie's head. The renegade groaned and writhed in pain. Near him lay Kate, with white face and closed eyes. She was unconscious, or dead. Jim sat crouched under a tree to which he was tied. "'Joe, are you badly hurt?' asked the latter in deep solicitude. "'No, I guess not. I don't know,' answered Joe. "'Is poor Kate dead?' "'No, she has fainted.' "'Where's Nell?' gone replied jim lowering his voice and glancing at the indians they were too busy trying to bandage curdie's head to pay any attention to their prisoners that whirlwind was wetzel wasn't it yes how'd you know i was awake last night i had an oppressive feeling perhaps a presentiment anyway i couldn't sleep i heard that wind blow through the forest and thought my blood would freeze the moan is the same as the night wind the same soft sigh, only louder, and somehow pregnant with superhuman power. To speak of it in broad daylight, one seems superstitious, but to hear it in the darkness of this lonely forest, it is fearful. I hope I am not a coward. I certainly know I was deathly frightened. No wonder I was scared. Look at these dead Indians, all killed in a moment. I heard the moan. I saw Silvertip disappear and the other two savages rise. Then something huge dropped from the rock. A bright object seemed to circle round the savages. They uttered one short yell and sank to rise no more. Somehow at once I suspected that this shadowy form, with its lightning-like movements, its glittering hatchet, was Wetzel. When he plunged into the midst of the other savages, I distinctly recognized him and saw that he had a bundle, possibly his coat wrapped round his left arm, and his right hand held the glittering tomahawk. I saw him strike that big Indian there, the one lying with split skull. His wonderful daring and quickness seemed to make the savages turn at random. He broke through the circle, swung Nell under his arm, slashed at my bonds as he passed by, and then was gone as he had come. Not till after you were struck, and Silvertip came up to me, was I aware my bonds were cut. Wetzel's hatchet had severed them, it even cut my side, which was bleeding. I was free to help, to fight, and I did not know it. Fool that I am. I made an awful mess of my part of the rescue, groaned Joe. I wonder if the savages know it was Wetzel. Do they? Well, I rather think so. Did you not hear them scream that French name? As far as I am able to judge, only two Indians were killed instantly. The others died during the night. I had to sit here, tired and helpless, listening as they groaned and called the name of their slayer, even in their death throes, Death Wind. They have named him well. I guess he nearly killed Gertie. Evidently, but surely the evil one protects the renegade. Jim Gertie's doomed, whispered Joe earnestly. He's as good as dead already. I've lived with Wessel and know him. He told me Gertie had murdered a settler, 
a feeble old man who lived near Fort Henry with his son. The hunter has sworn to kill the renegade. But mind you, he did not tell me that. I saw it in his eyes. It wouldn't surprise me to see him jump out of these bushes at any moment. I'm looking for it. If he knows there are only three left, he'll be after them like a hound on a trail. Gertie must hurry. Where is he taking you? To the Delaware town. I don't suppose the chiefs will let any harm befall you, but Kate and I would be better off dead. If we can only delay the march, Wetzel will surely return. Hush! Gertie's up. The renegade staggered to an upright position and leaned on the Shawnee's arm. Evidently he had not been seriously injured, only stunned. Covered with blood from a swollen, gashed lump on his temple, he certainly presented a savage appearance. "'Where's the yellow-haired lass?' he demanded, pushing away Silverton's friendly arm. He glared around the glade. The Shawnee addressed him briefly, whereupon he raged to and fro under the tree, cursing with foam-flecked lips and actually howling with baffled rage. His fury was so great that he became suddenly weak and was compelled to sit down. "'She's safe, you villainous renegade!' cried Joe. "'Hush, Joe, do not anger him. It can do no good,' interposed Jim. "'Why not? We couldn't be worse off,' answered Joe. "'I'll get her! I'll get her again!' panted Gertie. "'I'll keep her, and she'll love me!' The spectacle of this perverted wretch speaking as if he had been cheated out of love was so remarkable, so pitiful, so monstrous, that for a moment Joe was dumbfounded. "'Bah, you white-livered murderer!' Joe hissed. He well knew it was not wise to give way to his passion, but he could not help it. This beast in human guise, whining for love, maddened him. Any white woman on earth would die a thousand deaths and burn for a million years afterward rather than love you. "'I'll see you killed at the stake, begging for mercy, and, and be feed for buzzards,' croaked the renegade. "'Then kill me now, or you may slip up on one of your cherished buzzard feasts,' cried Joe, with glinting eye and taunting voice. "'Then go sneaking back to your hole like a hyena and stay there. Wetzel is on your trail. He missed you last night, but it was because of the girl. He's after you, Gertie. He'll get you one of these days, and when he does, my God!' Nothing could be more revolting than that swarthy, evil face turned pale with fear. Gertie's visage was a ghastly, livid white. So earnest, so intense was Joe's voice, that it seemed to all as if Wetzel was about to dart into the glade, with his avenging tomahawk uplifted, to wreak an awful vengeance on the abductor. The renegade's white, craven heart contained no such thing as courage. If he ever fought, it was like a wolf, backed by numbers. The resemblance ceased here, for even a cornered wolf will show his teeth and Gertie, driven to bay, would have cringed and cowered. Even now, at the mention of Wetzel's enmity, he trembled. "'I'll shut your wind!' he cried, catching up his tomahawk and making for Joe. Silvertip intervened and prevented the assault. He led Gertie back to his seat and spoke low, evidently trying to soothe the renegade's feelings. "'Silvertip, give me a tomahawk and let me fight him,' implored Joe. Pale face brave, black Indian chief. Pale face Shawnee's prisoner. No speak more, answered Silvertip, with respect in his voice. Oh, where's Nellie? A grief stricken whisper caught Jim's ear. He turned to see Kate's wide, questioning eyes fixed upon him. Nell was rescued. Thank God, murmured the girl. Come along, shouted Gertie in his harsh voice as, grasping Kate's arm, he pulled the girl violently to her feet. Then, picking up his rifle, he led her into the forest. Silvertip followed with Joe, while the remaining Indian guarded Jim. The great council lodge of the Delawares rang with savage and fiery eloquence. Wingenund paced slowly before the orators. Wise as he was, he wanted advice before deciding what was to be done with the missionary. The brothers had been taken to the chief, who immediately called a council. The Indians sat in a half-circle around the lodge. The prisoners, with hands bound, guarded by two brawny braves, stood in one corner, gazing with curiosity and apprehension at this formidable array. 
Jim knew some of the braves, but the majority of those who spoke bitterly against the pale faces had never frequented the village of peace. Nearly all were of the wolf tribe of Delawares. Jim whispered to Joe, interpreting that part of the speeches bearing upon the disposal to be made of them. Two white men, dressed in Indian garb, held prominent positions before Wingenund. The boys saw a resemblance between one of these men and Jim Girty, and accordingly concluded he was the famous renegade, or so-called white Indian, Simon Girty. The other man was probably Elliot, the Tory, with whom Girty had deserted from Fort Pitt. Jim Girty was not present. Upon nearing the encampment, he had taken his captive and disappeared in a ravine. Shingis, seldom in favor of drastic measures with prisoners, eloquently urged initiating the brothers into the tribe. Several other chiefs were favorably inclined, though not so positive as Shingis. Kotoxen was for the death penalty, the implacable pipe for nothing less than burning at the stake. Not one was for returning the missionary to his Christian Indians. Gertie and Elliot, though requested to speak, maintained an ominous silence. Wingenund strode with thoughtful mien before his council. He had heard all his wise chiefs and his fiery warriors. Supreme was his power. Freedom or death for the captives awaited the wave of his hand. His impassive face gave not the slightest inkling of what to expect. Therefore the prisoners were forced to stand there with throbbing hearts, while the chieftain waited the customary dignified interval before addressing the council. Wingenund has heard the Delaware wise men and warriors. The white Indian opens not his lips. His silence moves evil for the pale faces. Pipe wants the blood of the white men. The Shawnee chief demands the stake. Wingenund says, Free the white father who harms no Indian. Wingenund hears no evil in the music of his voice. The white father's brother should die. Kill the companion of Deathwind. A plaintive murmur, remarkable when coming from an assembly of stern-browed chiefs, ran round the circle at the mention of the dread appellation. The white father is free, continued Wingenund. Let one of my runners conduct him to the village of peace. A brave entered and touched Jim on the shoulder. Jim shook his head and pointed to Joe. The runner touched Joe. No, no, I'm not the missionary, cried Joe, staring aghast at his brother. Jim, have you lost your senses? Jim sadly shook his head, and turning to Wingenund, made known in a broken Indian dialect that his brother was the missionary, and would sacrifice himself, taking this opportunity to practice the Christianity he had taught. The white father is brave, but he is known, broke in Wingenund's deep voice, while he pointed to the door of the lodge. Let him go back to his Christian Indians. The Indian runner cut Joe's bonds, and once more attempted to lead him from the lodge. Rage and misery shone in the lad's face. He pushed the runner aside. He exhausted himself, trying to explain to think of Indian words enough to show he was not the missionary. He even implored Gertie to speak for him. When the renegade sat there, stolidly silent, Joe's rage burst out. Curse you all for a lot of ignorant redskins! I am not a missionary. I am Deathwind's friend. I killed the Delaware. I was the companion of Levant de la Mort. Joe's passionate vehemence and the truth that spoke from his flashing eyes compelled the respect, if not the absolute belief, of the Indians. The savages slowly shook their heads. They beheld the spectacle of two brothers, one a friend, the other an enemy of all Indians, each willing to go to the stake to suffer an awful agony for love of the other. Chivalrous deeds always stir an Indian's heart. It was like a red man to die for his brother. The indifference, the contempt for death, won their admiration. Let the white father stand forth, sternly called Wingenund. A hundred somber eyes turned on the prisoners. Except that one wore a buckskin coat, 
the other a linsey one there was no difference the strong figures were the same the white faces alike the stern resolve in the gray eyes identical they were twin brothers wingenund once more paced before his silent chiefs to deal rightly with the situation perplexed him to kill both pale-faces did not suit him suddenly he thought of a way to decide let wingenund's daughter come he ordered a slight girlish figure entered it was whispering winds her beautiful face glowed while she listened to her father. Wingenund's daughter has her mother's eyes, that were beautiful as a doe's, keen as a hawk's, far-seeing as an eagle's. Let the Delaware maiden show her blood. Let her point out the white butter. Shyly but unhesitatingly, Whispering Winds laid her hand on Jim's arm. Missionary, be gone came the chieftain's command thank wingenund's daughter for your life not the god of your christians he waved his hand to the runner the brave grasped jim's arm good-bye joe brokenly said jim old fellow good-bye came the answer they took one last long look into each other's eyes jim's glance betrayed his fear he would never see his brother again the light in joe's eyes was the old steely flash the indomitable spirit while there was life there was hope let the shawnee chief paint his prisoner black commanded wingenund when the missionary left the lodge with the runner whispering winds had smiled for she had saved him whom she loved to hear speak but the dread command that followed paled her cheek black paint meant hideous death she saw this man so like the white father her piteous gaze tried to turn from that white face but the cold steely eyes fascinated her she had saved one only to be the other's doom she had always been drawn toward white men many prisoners had she rescued she had even befriended her nation's bitter foe death wind she had listened to the young missionary with rapture she had been his savior and now when she looked into the eyes of this young giant whose fate had rested on her all unwitting words she resolved to save him she had been a shy shrinking creature fearing to lift her eyes to a pale faces but now they were raised clear and steadfast as she stepped toward the captive and took his hand her whole person radiated with conscious pride in her power it was the knowledge that she could save when she kissed his hand and knelt before him she expressed a tender humility she had claimed the unquestionable right of an indian maiden she had asked what no indian dared refuse a chief's daughter she took the pale-face for her husband her action was followed by an impressive silence she remained kneeling wingenund resumed his slow march to and fro silvertip retired to his corner with gloomy face the others bowed their heads as if the maiden's decree was irrevocable once more the chieftain's sonorous command rang out an old indian wrinkled and worn weird of aspect fanciful of attire entered the lodge and waved his wampum wand he mumbled strange words and departed chanting a long song whispering winds arose a soft radiant smile playing over her face and still holding joe's hand she led him out of the lodge through long rows of silent indians down a lane bordered by tepees he following like one in a dream he expected to awaken at any minute to see the stars shining through the leaves yet he felt the warm soft pressure of a little hand surely this slender graceful figure was real she bade him enter a lodge of imposing proportions still silent in amazement and gratitude he obeyed the maiden turned to joe though traces of pride still lingered all her fire had vanished 
her bosom rose with each quick panting breath her lips quivered she trembled like a trapped doe but at last the fluttering lashes rose joe saw two velvety eyes dark with timid fear yet veiling in their lustrous depths an unuttered hope and love whispering winds save pale face she said in a voice low and tremulous fear father fear tell wiganon she christian indian summer that enchanted time unfolded its golden dreamy haze over the delaware village the forest blazed with autumn fire the meadows boomed in rich luxuriance all day low down in the valleys hung a purple smoke which changed as the cool evening shades crept out of the woodland into a cloud of white mist all day the asters along the brooks lifted golden-brown faces to the sun as if to catch the warning warmth of his smile all day the plains and forests lay in melancholy repose the sad swish of the west wind over the tall grass told that he was slowly dying away before his enemy the north wind the sound of dropping nuts was heard under the motionless trees for joe the days were days of enchantment his wild heart had found its mate a willing captive he was now all his fancy for other women all his memories faded into love for his indian bride whispering winds charmed the eye mind and heart every day her beauty seemed renewed she was as apt to learn as she was quick to turn her black crowned head but her supreme beauty was her loving innocent soul untainted as the clearest spring it mirrored the purity and simplicity of her life indian she might be one of a race whose morals and manners were alien to the man she loved yet she would have added honor to the proudest name when whispering winds raised her dark eyes they showed radiant as a lone star when she spoke low her voice made music beloved she whispered one day to him teach the indian maiden more love for you and truth and god whispering winds yearns to go to the christians but she fears her stern father when an aunt would burn the village of peace the indian tribes tremble before the thunder of his wrath be patient my chief time changes the leaves so it will the anger of the warriors whispering winds will set you free and be free herself to go far with you toward the rising sun would dwell your people she will love and be constant as the north and star her love will be an eternal spring where blossoms bloom ever anew and fresh and sweet she will love your people and raise christian children and sit ever in the door of your home praying for the west wind blow for if my chief wills we shall live the indian life free as two eagles on the lonely crack although joe gave himself up completely to his love for his bride he did not forget that kate was in the power of the renegade and that he must rescue her knowing gertie had the unfortunate girl somewhere near the delaware encampment he resolved to find the place plans of all kinds he resolved in his mind the best one he believed lay through whispering winds first to find the whereabouts of gertie kill him if possible or at least free kate and then get away with her and his indian bride sanguine as he invariably was he could not but realize the peril of this undertaking if whispering winds betrayed her people it meant death to her as well as to him he would far rather spend the remaining days of his life in the indian village than doom the maiden whose love had saved him yet he thought he might succeed in getting away with her and planned to that end his natural spirit daring reckless had gained 
while he was associated with wetzel meanwhile he mingled freely with the indians and here as elsewhere his winning personality combined with his athletic prowess soon made him well liked he was even on friendly terms with pipe the swarthy war chief liked joe because despite the animosity he had aroused in some former lovers of whispering winds he actually played jokes on them in fact joe's pranks raised many a storm but the young braves who had been suitors for wingenund's lovely daughter feared the muscular pale-face and the tribe's ridicule more so he continued his trickery unmolested joe's idea was to lead the savages to believe he was thoroughly happy in his new life and so he was but it suited him better to be free he succeeded in misleading the savages at first he was closely watched then the vigilance relaxed and finally ceased this last circumstance was owing no doubt to a ferment of excitement that had suddenly possessed the delawares council after council was held in the big lodge the encampment was visited by runner after runner some important crisis was pending joe could not learn what it all meant and the fact that whispering winds suddenly lost her gladsome spirit and became sad caused him further anxiety when he asked her the reason for her unhappiness she was silent moreover he was surprised to learn when he questioned her upon the subject of their fleeing together that she was eager to go immediately while all this mystery puzzled joe it did not make any difference to him or in his plans it rather favored the latter he understood that the presence of simon gertie and elliot with several other renegades unknown to him was significant of unrest among the indians these presagers of evil were accustomed to go from village to village exciting the savages to acts of war peace meant the downfall and death of these men they were busy all day and far into the night often joe heard gertie's hoarse voice lifted in the council lodge pipe thundered incessantly for war but joe could not learn against whom elliot's suave oily oratory exhorted the indians to vengeance but joe could not guess upon whom he was however destined to learn the third day of the councils a horseman stopped before whispering wind's lodge and called out stepping to the door joe saw a white man whose dark keen handsome face seemed familiar yet joe knew he had never seen this stalwart man a word with you said the stranger his tone was curt authoritative as that of a man used to power as many as you like who are you i am isaac zane are you wetzel's companion or the renegade deering i am not a renegade any more than you are i was rescued by the indian girl who took me as her husband said joe coldly he was surprised and did not know what to make of zane's manner good i am glad to meet you instantly replied zane his tone and expression changing he extended his hand to joe i wanted to be sure i never saw the renegade deering he's here now i'm on my way to the wyandot town i've been to fort henry where my brother told me of you and the missionaries when i arrived here i heard your story from simon gertie if you can you must get away from here if i dared i'd take you to the huron village but it's impossible go while you have a chance zane i thank you i've suspected something was wrong what is it couldn't be worse whispered zane glancing round to see if he were overheard gertie and elliot backed by this deering are growing jealous of the influence of christianity on the indians they are plotting against the village of peace tarhe the huron chief has been approached and asked to join in a concerted movement against religion seemingly it is not so much the missionaries as the converted indians that the renegades are fuming over they know if the christian savages are killed the strength of the missionary's hold will be forever broken pipe is wild for blood these renegades are slowly poisoning the minds of the few chiefs who are favorably disposed the outlook is bad bad well what can i do 
Cut out for yourself. Get away, if you can, with the gun. Take the creek below, follow the current down to the Ohio, and then make east for Fort Henry. But I want to rescue the white girl Jim Girty has concealed here somewhere. Impossible! Don't attempt it unless you want to throw your life away. Buzzard Jim, as we call Girty, is a butcher. He has probably murdered the girl. I won't leave without trying. And there's my wife, the Indian girl, who saved me. Zane, she's a Christian. She wants to go with me. I can't leave her. I'm warning you, that's all. If I were you, I'd never leave without a try to find the white girl, and I'd never forsake my Indian bride. I've been through the same thing. You must be a good woodsman, or Wetzel wouldn't have let you stay with him. Pick out a favorable time and make the attempt. I suggest you make your Indian girl show you where Gertie is. She knows, but is afraid to tell you, for she fears Gertie. Get your dog and horse from the Shawnee. That's a fine horse. He can carry you both to safety. Take him away from Silvertip. How? Go right up and demand your horse and dog. Most of these Delawares are honest, for all their bloodshedding and cruelty. With them, might is right. The Delawares won't try to get your horse for you, but they'll stick to you when you assert your rights. They don't like the Shawnee anyhow. If Silvertip refuses to give you the horse, grab him before he can draw a weapon and beat him good. You're big enough to do it. The Delawares will be tickled to see you pound him. He's thick with Gertie. That's why he lays around here. Take my word, it's the best way. Do it openly, and no one will interfere. By heaven, Zane, I'll give him a drubbing. I owe him one, and am itching to get hold of him. I must go now. I shall send a Wyandot runner to your brother at the village. They shall be warned. Good-bye, good luck. May we meet again. Joe watched Zane ride swiftly down the lane and disappear in the shrubbery. Whispering winds came to the door of the lodge. She looked anxiously at him. He went within, drawing her along with him and quickly informed her that he had learned the cause of the council, that he had resolved to get away, and she must find out Gertie's hiding place. Whispering Winds threw herself into his arms, declaring with an energy and passion unusual to her that she would risk anything for him. She informed Joe that she knew the direction from which Gertie always returned to the village. No doubt she could find his retreat. With the cunning that showed her Indian nature, she suggested a plan which Joe at once saw was excellent. After Joe got his horse, she would ride around the village, then off into the woods, where she could leave the horse and return to say he had run away from her. As was their custom during afternoons, they would walk leisurely along the brook, and trusting to the excitement created by the councils, get away unobserved, find the horse, if possible rescue the prisoner, and then travel east with all speed. Joe left the lodge at once to begin the working out of the plan. Luck favored him at the outset, for he met Silvertip before the council lodge. The Shawnee was leading Lance, and the dog followed at his heels. The spirit of Mose had been broken. Poor dog, Joe thought he had been beaten until he was afraid to wag his tail at his old master. Joe's resentment blazed into fury, but he kept cool outwardly. Right before a crowd of Indians waiting for the council to begin, Joe planted himself in front of the Shawnee, barring his way. "'Silvertip has the pale-faces horse and dog,' said Joe in a loud voice. The chief stared haughtily, while the other Indians sauntered nearer. They all knew how the Shawnee had got the animals, and now awaited the outcome of the white man's challenge. "'Pale-faced heap liar!' growled the Indian. His dark eyes glowed craftily while his hand dropped, apparently in careless habit, through the haft of his tomahawk. Joe swung his long arm. His big fist caught the Shawnee on the jaw, sending him to the ground. Uttering a frightful yell, Silvertip drew his weapon and attempted to rise, but the moment's delay in seizing the hatchet was fatal to his design. Joe was upon him with tiger-like suddenness. One kick set the tomahawk spinning. Another landed the Shawnee again on the ground. Blind with rage, Silvertip leaped up, and without a weapon rushed at his antagonist. But the Indian was not a boxer, and he failed to get his hands on Joe. Shifty and elusive, the lad dodged around the struggling savage. 
one two three hard blows staggered silvertip and a fourth delivered with the force of joe's powerful arm caught the indian when he was off balance and felled him battered and bloody on the grass the surrounding indians looked down at the vanquished shawnee expressing their approval in characteristic grunts with lance prancing proudly and mose leaping lovingly beside him joe walked back to his lodge whispering winds sprang to meet him with joyful face she had feared the outcome of trouble with the shawnee but no queen ever bestowed upon returning victorious lord a loftier look of pride a sweeter glance of love than the indian maiden bent upon her lover whispering winds informed joe that an important council was to be held that afternoon it would be wise for them to make the attempt to get away immediately after the convening of the chiefs accordingly she got upon lance and rode him up and down the village lane much to the pleasure of the watching indians she scattered the idle crowds on the grass plots she dashed through the side streets and let every one in the encampment see her clinging to the black stallion then she rode him out along the creek accustomed to her imperious will the indians thought nothing unusual when she returned an hour later with flying hair and disheveled costume no one paid particular attention to her that afternoon joe and his bride were the favored of fortune with mose running before them they got clear of the encampment and into the woods once in the forest whispering winds rapidly led the way east when they climbed to the top of a rocky ridge she pointed down into a thicket before her saying that somewhere in this dense hollow was gertie's hut joe hesitated about taking mose he wanted the dog but in case he had to run it was necessary whispering winds should find his trail and for this he left the dog with her he started down the ridge and had not gone a hundred paces when over some gray boulders he saw the thatched roof of a hut so wild and secluded was the spot that he would never have discovered the cabin from any other point than this which he had been so fortunate as to find his study and practice under wetzel now stood him in good stead he picked out the best path over the rough stones and through the brambles always keeping under cover he stepped as carefully as if the hunter was behind him soon he reached level ground a dense laurel thicket hid the cabin but he knew the direction in which it lay throwing himself flat on the ground he wormed his way through the thicket carefully yet swiftly because he knew there was no time to lose finally the rear of the cabin stood in front of him it was made of logs rudely hewn and as rudely thrown together in several places clay had fallen from chinks between the timbers leaving small holes like a snake joe slipped close to the hut raising his head he looked through one of the cracks instantly he shrank back into the grass shivering with horror he almost choked in his attempt to prevent an outcry end of chapter seventeen of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Chapter eighteen of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter eighteen. The sight which Joe had seen horrified him for several moments into helpless inaction. He lay breathing heavily, impotent in an awful rage. As he remained there, stunned by the shock, he gazed up through the open space in the leaves trying to still his fury to realize the situation to make no hasty move the soft blue of the sky the fleecy clouds drifting eastward the fluttering leaves and the twittering birds all assured him he was wide awake he had found gertie's den where so many white women had been hidden to see friends and home no more he had seen the renegades sleeping calmly sleeping like any other man how could the wretch sleep he had seen kate it had been the sight of her that had paralyzed him to make a certainty of his fears he again raised himself to peep into the hole 
as he did so a faint cry came from within gertie lay on a buffalo robe near a barred door behind him sat kate huddled in one corner of the cabin a long buckskin thong was knotted around her waist and tied to a log her hair was matted and tangled and on her face and arms were many discolored bruises worse still in her plaintive moaning in the meaningless movement of her head in her vacant expression was proof that her mind had gone she was mad even as an agonizing pity came over joe to be followed by the surging fire of rage blazing up in his breast he could not but thank god that she was mad it was merciful that kate was no longer conscious of her suffering like leaves in a storm wavered joe's hands as he clenched them until the nails brought blood be calm be cool whispered his monitor wetzel ever with him in spirit but god could he be cool bounding with lion spring he hurled his heavy frame against the door crash the door was burst from its fastenings gertie leaped up with startled yell drawing his knife as he rose it had not time to descend before joe's second spring more fierce even than the other carried him directly on top of the renegade as the two went down joe caught the villain's wrist with a grip that literally cracked the bones the knife fell and rolled away from the struggling men for an instant they tumbled about on the floor clasped in a crushing embrace the renegade was strong supple slippery as an eel twice he wriggled from his foe gnashing his teeth he fought like a hyena he was fighting for life life which is never so dear as to a coward and a murderer doom glared from joe's big eyes at scream after scream issued from the renegade's white lips terrible was this struggle but brief joe seemingly had the strength of ten men twice he pulled gertie down as a wolf drags a deer he dashed him against the wall throwing him nearer and nearer the knife once within reach of the blade joe struck the renegade a severe blow on the temple and the villain's wrestling became weaker planting his heavy knee on gertie's breast joe reached for the knife and swung it high exultantly he cried mad with lust for the brute's blood but the slight delay saved gertie's life the knife was knocked from joe's hand and he leaped erect to find himself confronted by silvertip the chief held a tomahawk with which he had struck the weapon from the young man's grasp and to judge from his burning eyes and malignant smile he meant to brain the now defenseless pale-face in a single fleeting instant joe saw that gertie was helpless for the moment that silvertip was confident of his revenge and that the situation called for wetzel's characteristic advice act like lightning swifter than the thought was the leap he made past silvertip it carried him to a wooden bar which lay on the floor escape was easy for the door was before him and the shawnee behind but joe did not flee he seized the bar and rushed at the indian then began a duel in which the savage's quickness and cunning matched the white man's strength and fury silvertip dodged the vicious swings joe aimed at him he parried many blows any one of which would have crushed his skull nimble as a cat he avoided every rush while his dark eyes watched for an opening he fought wholly on the defensive craftily reserving his strength until his opponent should tire at last catching the bar on his hatchet he broke the force of the blow and then with agile movement dropped to the ground and grappled joe's legs long before this he had drawn his knife and now he used it plunging the blade into the young man's side cunning and successful as was the savage's ruse it failed signally for to get hold of the shawnee was all joe wanted feeling the sharp pain as they fell together he reached his hand behind him and caught silvertip's wrist exerting all his power he wrenched the indian's arm so that it was not only dislocated but the bones cracked silvertip saw his fatal mistake but he uttered no sound crippled though he was he yet made a supreme effort but it was as if he had been in the hands of a giant the lad handled him with remorseless and resistless fury suddenly he grasped the knife which silvertip had been unable to hold with his crippled hand 
and thrust it deeply into the Indian's side. All Silvertip's muscles relaxed, as if a strong tension had been removed. Slowly his legs straightened, his arms dropped, and from his side gushed a dark flood. A shadow crept over his face, not dark nor white, but just a shadow. His eyes lost their hate. They no longer saw the foe. They looked beyond with gloomy question, and then were fixed cold in death. Silvertip died as he had lived, a chief. Joe glared round for Gertie. He was gone, having slipped away during the fight. The lad turned to release the poor prisoner when he started back with a cry of fear. Kate lay bathed in a pool of blood, dead. The renegade, fearing she might be rescued, had murdered her, and then fled from the cabin. Almost blinded by horror and staggering with weakness, Joe turned to leave the cabin. Realizing that he was seriously, perhaps dangerously, wounded, he wisely thought he must not leave the place without weapons. He had marked the pegs where the renegade's rifle hung, and had been careful to keep between that and his enemies. He took down the gun and horns which were attached to it, and with one last shuddering glance at poor Kate left the place. He was conscious of a queer lightness in his head, but he suffered no pain. His garments were dripping with blood. He did not know how much of it was his or the Indian's. Instinct rather than sight was his guide. He grew weaker and weaker. His head began to whirl, yet he kept on, knowing that life and freedom were his if he found whispering winds. He gained the top of the ridge. His eyes were blurred, his strength gone. He called aloud, and then plunged forward on his face. He heard dimly, as though the sound were afar off, the whine of a dog. He felt something soft and wet on his face. Then consciousness left him. When he regained his senses, he was lying on a bed of ferns under a projecting rock. He heard the gurgle of running water mingling with the song of birds. Near him lay Mose, and beyond rose a wall of green thicket. Neither whispering winds nor his horse was visible. He felt a dreamy lassitude. He was tired, but had no pain. Finding he could move without difficulty, he concluded his weakness was more from loss of blood than a dangerous wound. He put his hand on the place where he had been stabbed, and felt a soft, warm compress, such as might have been made by a bunch of wet leaves. Someone had unlaced his hunting shirt, for he saw the strings were not as he usually tied them, and had dressed the wound. Joe decided after some deliberation that Whispering Winds had found him, made him as comfortable as possible, and leaving Mose on guard, had gone out to hunt for food or perhaps back to the Indian encampment. The rifle and horns he had taken from Gertie's hut, together with Silvertip's knife, lay beside him. As Joe lay there, hoping for Whispering Wind's return, his reflections were not pleasant. Fortunate, indeed, he was to be alive, but he had no hope he could continue to be favored by fortune. Odds were now against his escape. Gertie would have the Delawares on his trail like a pack of hungry wolves. He could not understand the absence of whispering winds. She would have died sooner than desert him. Gertie had perhaps captured her, and was now scouring the woods for him. "'I'll get him next time, or he'll get me,' muttered Joe in bitter wrath. He could never forgive himself for his failure to kill the renegade. The recollection of how nearly he had forever ended Gertie's brutal career brought before Joe's mind the scene of the fight. He saw again Buzzard Jim's face revolting unlike anything human. There stretched Silvertip's dark figure, lying still and stark, and there was Kate's white form in its winding crimson wreath of blood. Hauntingly her face returned, sad, stern in its cold rigidity. Poor girl, better for her to be dead, he murmured. Not long will she be unavenged. His thoughts drifted to the future. He had no fear of starvation, 
for Mose could catch a rabbit or woodchuck at any time. When the strips of meat he had hidden in his coat were gone, he could start a fire and roast more. What concerned him most was pursuit. His trail from the cabin had been a bloody one, which would render it easily followed. He dared not risk exertion until he had given his wound time to heal. Then, if he did escape from Gertie and the Delawares, his future was not bright. His experiences of the last few days had not only sobered, but brought home to him this real border life. With all his fire and daring, he knew he was no fool. He had eagerly embraced a career which, at the present stage of his training, was beyond his scope. Not that he did not know how to act in sudden crises, but because he had not had the necessary practice to quickly and surely use his knowledge. Bitter indeed was his self-scorn when he recalled that of the several critical positions he had been in since his acquaintance with Wetzel, he had failed in all but one. The exception was the killing of Silvertip. Here his fury had made him fight as Wetzel fought with only his everyday incentive. He realized that the border was no place for any save the boldest and most experienced hunters, men who had become inured to hardship, callous as to death, keen as Indians. Fear was not in Joe, nor lack of confidence. But he had good sense, and realized he would have done a wiser thing had he stayed at Fort Henry. Colonel Zane was right. The Indians were tigers, the renegades vultures, the vast untrammeled forests and plains their covert. Ten years of war had rendered this wilderness a place where those few white men who had survived were hardened to the spilling of blood, stern even in those few quiet hours which peril allowed them, strong in their sacrifice of all for future generations. A low growl from Mose broke into Joe's reflections. The dog had raised his nose from his paws and sniffed suspiciously at the air. The lad heard a slight rustling outside, and in another moment was overjoyed at seeing whispering winds. She came swiftly, with a lithe, graceful motion, and flying to him like a rush of wind, knelt beside him. She kissed him, and murmured words of endearment. "'Winds, where have you been?' he asked her, in the mixed English and Indian dialect in which they conversed. She told him the dog had led her to him two evenings before. He was insensible. She had bathed and bandaged his wound, and remained with him all that night. The next day, finding he was ill and delirious, she decided to risk returning to the village. If any questions arose, she could say he had left her. Then she would find a way to get back to him, bringing healing herbs for his wound and a soothing drink. As it turned out, Gertie had returned to the camp. He was battered and bruised, and in a white heat of passion. Going at once to Wingenund, the renegade openly accused Whispering Winds of aiding her pale-faced lover to escape. Wingenund called his daughter before him and questioned her. She confessed all to her father. "'Why is the daughter of Wingenon the traitor to her race?' demanded the chief. "'Whispering Winds is a Christian.' Wingenon received this intelligence as a blow. He dismissed Gertie and sent his braves from his lodge, facing his daughter alone. Gloomy and stern, he paced before her. "'Wingenon's blood might change, but would never betray.' Wingenund is the Delaware chief, he said. Go, darken no more the door of Wingenund's wigwam. Let the flower of the Delawares fade in alien pastures. Go, whispering winds is free. Tears shone brightly in the Indian girl's eyes while she told Joe her story. She loved her father, and she would see him no more. Winds is free she whispered when strength returns to her master she can follow him to the white villages winds will live her life for him then we have no one to fear asked joe no red man now that the shawnee chief is dead will gertie follow us he is a coward he will fear to come alone the white savage is a speck in the grass Two long days followed, during which the lovers lay quietly in hiding. 
on the morning of the third day joe felt that he might risk the start for the village of peace whispering winds led the horse below a stone upon which the invalid stood thus enabling him to mount then she got on behind him the sun was just gilding the horizon when they rode out of the woods into a wide plain no living thing could be seen along the edge of the forest the ground was level and the horse traveled easily several times during the morning joe dismounted beside a pile of stones or a fallen tree the miles were traversed without serious inconvenience to the invalid except that he grew tired toward the middle of the afternoon when they had ridden perhaps twenty-five miles they crossed a swift narrow brook the water was a beautiful clear brown joe made note of this as it was an unusual circumstance nearly all the streams when not flooded were green in color he remembered that during his wanderings with wetzel they had found one stream of this brown copper-colored water the lad knew he must take a roundabout way to the village so that he might avoid indian runners or scouts and he hoped this stream would prove to be the one he had once camped upon as they were riding toward a gentle swell or knoll covered with trees and shrubbery whispering winds felt something warm on her hand and looking was horrified to find it covered with blood joe's wound had opened she told him they must dismount here and remain until he was stronger the invalid himself thought this conclusion was wise they would be practically safe now since they must be out of the indian path and many miles from the encampment accordingly he got off the horse and sat down on a log while whispering winds searched for a suitable place in which to erect a temporary shelter joe's wandering gaze was arrested by a tree with a huge knotty formation near the ground it was like many trees but this peculiarity was not what struck joe he had seen it before he never forgot anything in the woods that once attracted his attention he looked around on all sides just behind him was an opening in the clump of trees within this was a perpendicular stone covered with moss and lichens above it a beech tree spread long graceful branches he thrilled with the remembrance these familiar marks brought this was beautiful spring the place where wetzel rescued nell where he had killed the indians in that night attack he would never forget End of chapter 18 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter 19 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Leonard Wilson Chapter 19 one evening a week or more after the disappearance of jim and the girls george young and david edwards the missionaries sat on the cabin steps gazing disconsolately upon the forest scenery hard as had been the ten years of their labor among the indians nothing had shaken them as the loss of their young friends dave i tell you your theory about seeing them again is absurd asserted george i'll never forget that wretch gertie as he spoke to nell why she just wilted like a flower blasted by fire i can't understand why he let me go and kept jim unless the shawnee had something to do with it i never wished until now that i was a hunter i'd go after gertie you've heard as well as i of his many atrocities i'd rather have seen kate and nell dead and have them fall into his power i'd rather have killed them myself young had aged perceptibly in these last few days the blue veins showed at his temples his face had become thinner and paler and his eyes had a look of pain the former expression of patience which had set so well on him was gone george i can't account for my fancies or feelings else perhaps i'd be easier in mind answered dave his face too showed the ravages of grief i've had queer thoughts lately and dreams such as i never had before 
Perhaps it's this trouble which has made me so nervous. I don't seem able to pull myself together. I can neither preach nor work. Neither can I. This trouble has hit you as hard as it has me. But, Dave, we've still our duty to endure, to endure. That is our life, because a beam of sunshine brightened for a brief time the gray of our lives and then faded away. We must not shirk nor grow sour and discontented. But how cruel is this border life? Nature itself is brutal. Yes, I know, and we have elected to spend our lives here in the midst of this ceaseless strife, to fare poorly, to have no pleasure, never to feel the comfort of a woman's smiles nor the joy of a child's caress, all because out in the woods are ten or twenty or a hundred savages we may convert. That is why, and it is enough. It is hard to give up the women you love to a black-souled renegade but that is not for my thought. What kills me is the horror for her, for her. I, too, suffer with that thought. More than that, I'm morbid and depressed. I feel as if some calamity awaited us here. I've never been superstitious, nor have I had presentiments, but of late there are strange fears in my mind. At this juncture, Mr. Wells and Heckwelder came out of the adjoining cabin. I have had word of a trustworthy runner today. Gertie and his captives have not been seen in the Delaware towns, said Heckwelder. It is most unlikely that he will take them to the towns, replied Edwards. What do you make of his capturing Jim? For Pipe, perhaps. The Delaware's wolf is snapping his teeth. Pipe is particularly opposed to Christianity, and what's that? A low whistle from the bushes near the creek bank attracted the attention of all. The younger men got up to investigate, but Heckwelder detained them. Wait, he added. There is no telling what that signal may mean. They waited with breathless interest. Presently the whistle was repeated, and an instant later the tall figure of a man stepped from behind a thicket. He was a white man but not recognizable at that distance, even if a friend. The stranger waved his hand, as if asking them to be cautious and come to him. They went toward the thicket, and when within a few paces of the man, Mr. Wells exclaimed, It's the man who guided my party to the village. It is Wetzel. The other missionaries had never seen the hunter, though, of course they were familiar with his name, and looked at him with great curiosity. The hunter's buckskin garments were wet, torn, and covered with burrs. Dark spots, evidently bloodstains, showed on his hunting shirt. Wetzel? interrogated Heckwelder. The hunter nodded and took a step behind the bush. Bending over, he lifted something from the ground. It was a girl. It was Nell. She was very white, but alive. A faint, glad smile lighted up her features. Not a word was spoken. With an expression of tender compassion, Mr. Wells received her into his arms. The four missionaries turned fearful, questioning eyes upon the hunter, but they could not speak. "'She's well and unharmed,' said Wetzel, reading their thoughts. "'Only worn out. I've carried her these ten miles.' "'God bless you,' Wetzel exclaimed the old missionary. "'Nellie, Nellie, can you speak?' "'Uncle, dear, I'm all right.' came the faint whisper. "'Kate, what of her?' whispered George Young, with lips as dry as corn husks. "'I did my best,' said the hunter, with a simple dignity. Nothing but the agonized appeal in the young man's eyes could have made Wetzel speak of his achievement. "'Tell us,' broke in Heckwelder, seeing that fear had stricken George dumb. "'We trailed him and got away with the golden-haired lass.' The last I saw of Joe, he was braced up again a rock, fighting like a wildcat. I tried to cut Jim loose as I was going by. I spect the worst for the brothers and the other lass. Can we do nothing? asked Mr. Wells. Nothing. Wetzel, has the capturing of James Downs any significance to you? inquired Heckwelder. I reckon so. What? 
pipe and his white breadstone allies are again christianity do you think we are in danger i reckon so what do you advise pack up a few of your traps take the lash and come with me i'll see you back in fort henry Eckwelder nervously walked up to the tree and back again young and edwards looked blankly at one another they both remembered edwards presentiment mr wells uttered an angry exclamation you ask us to fail in our duty no never to go back to the white settlements and acknowledge we were afraid to continue teaching the gospel to the indians you cannot understand christianity if you advise that you have no religion you are a killer of indians a shadow that might have been one of pain flitted over the hunter's face no i ain't a christian and i am a killer of injuns said wetzel and his deep voice had a strange tremor i don't know nothing much except the woods and fields and if there's a god for me he's out there under the trees and grass mr wells you're the first man has ever called me a coward and i overlook it because of your calling i advise you to go back to fort henry because if you don't go now the chances are against your ever going Christianity or no Christianity, such men as you have no business in these woods. I thank you for your advice, and bless you for your rescue of this child, but I cannot leave my work, nor can I understand why all this good work we have done should be called useless. We have converted Indians, saved their souls. Is that not being of some use, of some good here? it's according to how you look at it now i know the bark of an oak is different according to the side we see from i'll allow hatin indians as i do is no reason you ought to try and convert em but you're bringing on a war these engines won't allow this village a piece here with its big fields of corn and shops and work and redskins it's again their nature you're only sacrificing your christian indians what do you mean asked mr wells startled by wetzel's words enough i'm ready to guide you to fort henry i'll never go wetzel looked at the other men no one would have doubted him no one could have failed to see he knew that some terrible danger hovered over the village of peace i believe you wetzel but i cannot go said heckwelder with white face i will stay said george steadily and i said dave wetzel nodded and turned to depart when george grasped his arm the young missionary's face was drawn and haggard he fixed an intense gaze upon the hunter wetzel listen his voice was low and shaken with deep feeling i am a teacher of god's word and i am as earnest in that purpose as you are in your life work i shall die here i shall fill an unmarked grave but i shall have done the best i could this is the life destiny has marked out for me and i will live it as best i may but in this moment preacher as i am i would give all i have or hope to have all the little good i may have done all my life to be such a man as you for i would avenge the woman i loved to torture to kill gertie i am only a poor weak fellow who would be lost a mile from this village and if not would fall before the youngest brave but you with your glorious strength your incomparable woodcraft you are the man to kill gertie rid the frontier of this fiend kill him wetzel kill him i beseech you for the sake of some sweet girl who even now may be on her way to this terrible country and who may fall into gertie's power for her sake wetzel kill him trail him like a bloodhound and when you find him remember my broken heart remember nell remember oh god remember poor kate young's voice broke into dry sobs he had completely exhausted himself so that he was forced to lean against the tree for support wetzel never spoke a word he stretched out his long brawny arm and gripped the young missionary's shoulder his fingers clasped hard simple without words as the action was it could not have been more potent and then as he stood the softer look faded slowly from his face 
a ripple seemed to run over his features which froze as it subsided into a cold stone rigidity his arm dropped he stepped past the tree and bounding lightly as a deer cleared the creek and disappeared in the bushes mr wells carried nell to his cabin where she lay for hours with wan face and listless languor she swallowed the nourishing drink an old indian nurse forced between her teeth she even smiled weakly when the missionaries spoke to her but she said nothing nor seemed to rally from her terrible shock a dark shadow lay always before her conscious of nothing present living over again her frightful experience again she seemed sunk in dull apathy dave we're going to lose nell she's fading slowly said george one evening several days after the girl's return wetzel said she was unharmed yet she seems to have received a hurt more fatal than a physical one it's her mind her mind if we cannot brighten her up to make her forget she'll die we've done all within our power if she could only be brought out of this trance she lies there all day long with those staring eyes i can't look into them they're the eyes of a child who has seen murder we must try in some way to get her out of this stupor and i have an idea have you noticed that mr wells has failed very much in the last few weeks indeed i have and i'm afraid he's breaking down he has grown so thin eats very little and doesn't sleep he's old you know and despite his zeal this border life is telling on him dave i believe he knows it poor earnest old man he never says a word about himself yet he must know that he is going downhill well we all begin sooner or later that descent which ends in the grave i believe we might stir nelly by telling her mr wells health is breaking let us try a hurried knock on the door interrupted their conversation come in said edwards the door opened to admit a man who entered eagerly jim jim exclaimed both missionaries throwing themselves upon the newcomer it was indeed jim but no answering smile lighted his worn distressed face while he wrung his friend's hands you're not hurt asked dave no i'm uninjured tell us all did you escape did you see your brother did you know wetzel rescued nell wingenon set me free in spite of many demands for my death he kept joe a prisoner and intends to kill him for the lad was wetzel's companion i saw the hunter come into the glade where we camped break through the line of fighting indians and carry nell off kate faltered young with ashen face george i wish to god i could tell you she is dead answered jim nervously pacing the room but she was well when i last saw her she endured the hard journey better than either nell or i gertie did not carry her into the encampment as silvertip did joe and me but the renegade left us on the outskirts of the delaware town there was a rocky ravine with dense undergrowth where he disappeared with his captive i suppose he has his den somewhere in that ravine george sank down and buried his face in his arms neither movement nor sound betokened consciousness as wetzel come in with nell joe said he had a cave where he might have taken her in case of illness or accident uh, yes he brought her back answered edward slowly i want to see her said jim his haggard face expressing a keen anxiety she's not wounded hurt ill no nothing like that it's a shock which she can't get over can't forget i must see her cried jim moving toward the door uh, don't go replied dave detaining him wait we must see what's best to be done wait till heckwelder comes he'll be here soon nell thinks you're dead and the surprise might be bad for her heckwelder came in at that moment and shook hands warmly with jim the delaware runner told me you were here i am overjoyed that wingenund freed you said the missionary it is a most favorable sign i have heard rumors from goshocking and sandusky that have worried me 
this good news more than offsets the bad i'm sorry about your brother are you well well but miserable i want to see nell dave tells me she is not exactly ill but something is wrong with her perhaps i ought not to see her just yet it'll be exactly the tonic for her replied heckewelder she'll be surprised out of herself she is morbid apathetic and try as we may we can't interest her come at once heckewelder had taken jim's arm and started for the door when he caught sight of young sitting bowed and motionless turning to jim he whispered kate gertie did not take her into the encampment answered jim in a low voice i hoped he would because the indians are kind but he didn't he took her to his den just then young raised his face the despair in it would have melted a heart of stone it had become the face of an old man if only you'd told me she had died he said to jim i'd have been man enough to stand it but this this kills me i can't breathe he staggered into the adjoining room where he flung himself upon a bed it's hard and he won't be able to stand up under it for he's not strong whispered jim heckwelder was a mild pious man in whom no one would ever expect strong passion but now depths were stirred within his heart that had ever been tranquil he became livid and his face was distorted with rage it's bad enough to have these renegades plotting and working against our religion to have them so discontent spread lies make the indians think we have axes to grind to plant the only obstacle in our path all this is bad but to doom an innocent white woman to worse than death what can i call it what can we do asked jim do that's the worst of it we can do nothing nothing we dare not move is there no hope of getting kate back hope none that villain is surrounded by his savages he'll lie low now for a while i've heard of such deeds many a time but it never before came so close home kate wells was a pure loving christian woman she'll live an hour a day a week perhaps in that snake's clutches and then she'll die thank god wetzel has gone on gertie's trail i know that from his manner when he left us said edwards wetzel may avenge her but he can never save her it's too late hello the exclamation was called forth by the appearance of young who entered with a rifle in his hands george where are you going with that gun asked edwards grasping his friend by the arm i'm going after her answered george wildly he tottered as he spoke but wrenched himself free from dave come george listen listen to reason interposed heckwelder laying hold of young you're frantic with grief now so are all of us but calm yourself why man you're a preacher not a hunter you'd be lost you'd starve in the woods before getting halfway to the indian town this is terrible enough don't make it worse by throwing your life away think of us your friends think of your indian pupils who rely so much on you think of the village of peace we can pray but we can't prevent these border crimes with civilization with the spread of christianity they will pass away bear up under this blow for the sake of your work remember we alone can check such barbarity but we must not fight we must sacrifice all that men hold dear for the sake of the future he took the rifle away from george and led him back into the little dark room closing the door he turned to jim and dave he's in a bad way and we must carefully watch him for a few days think of george starting out to kill gertie exclaimed dave i never fired a gun but yet i'd go too so would we all if we did as our hearts dictate retorted heckwelder turning fiercely upon dave as if stung man we have a village full of christians to look after what would become of them i tell you we've all we can do here to outwit those border ruffians simon gertie is plotting our ruin i heard it to-day from the delaware runner who is my friend 
he is jealous of our influence when all we desire is to save these poor indians and jim girty has killed our happiness can we ever recover from the misery brought upon us by poor kate's fate the missionary raised his hand as if to exhort some power above curse the girties he exclaimed in a sudden burst of uncontrollable passion having conquered all other obstacles must we fail because of wicked men of our own race oh curse them come he said presently in a voice which trembled with the effort he made to be calm we'll go in to nelly the three men entered mr wells cabin the old missionary with bowed head and hands clasped behind his back was pacing to and fro he greeted jim with glad surprise we want nelly to see him whispered heckewelder we think the surprise will do her good i trust it may said mr wells leave it to me they followed heckewelder into an adjoining room a torch flickered over the rude mantel-shelf lighting up the room with fitful flare it was a warm night and the soft breeze coming in the window alternately paled and brightened the flame jim saw nell lying on the bed her eyes were closed and her long dark lashes seemed black against the marble paleness of her skin stand behind me whispered heckwelder to jim nelly he called softly but only a faint flickering of her lashes answered him nelly nelly repeated heckwelder his deep strong voice thrilling her eyes opened they gazed at mr wells on one side at edward standing at the foot of the bed at heckwelder leaning over her but there was no recognition or interest in her look nelly can you understand me asked heckwelder putting into his voice all the power and intensity of feeling of which he was capable an almost imperceptible shadow of understanding shone in her eyes listen you have had a terrible shock and it has affected your mind you are mistaken in what you think what you dream of all the time do you understand you are wrong nell's eyes quickened with a puzzled questioning doubt the minister's magnetic penetrating voice had pierced her dull brain see i have brought you jim heckwelder stepped aside as jim fell on his knees by the bed he took her cold hands in his and bent over her for the moment his voice failed the doubt in nell's eyes changed to a wondrous gladness it was like the rekindling of a smoldering fire jim she whispered yes nelly it's jim alive and well it's jim come back to you a soft flush stained her white face she slipped her arm tenderly around his neck and held her cheek close to his jim she murmured nelly don't you know me asked mr wells trembling excited this was the first word she had spoken in four days uncle she exclaimed suddenly loosening her hold on jim and sitting up in bed then gazing wildly at the others was it all a horrible dream mr wells took her hand soothingly but he did not attempt to answer her question he looked helplessly at heckwelder but that missionary was intently studying the expression on nell's face part of it was a dream he answered impressively then that horrible man did take us away yes oh but we're, we're free now this is my room oh tell me yes nelly you're safe at home now tell tell me she cried shudderingly as she leaned close to jim and raised a white imploring face to his where is kate oh jim say say she wasn't left with gertie kate is dead answered jim quickly he could not endure the horror in her eyes he deliberately intended to lie as had heckwelder it was as if the tension of nell's nerves was suddenly relaxed the relief from her worst fear was so great that her mind took in only the one impression then presently a choking cry escaped her to be followed by a paroxysm of sobs end of chapter nineteen of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio
Chapter Twenty of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Twenty. Early on the following day, Heckwelder, astride his horse, appeared at the door of Edward's cabin. How is George? He inquired of Dave when the latter had opened the door. He had a bad night, but he's sleeping now. I think he'll be all right after a time, answered Dave. That's well. Nevertheless, keep a watch on him for a few days. I'll do so. Dave, I leave matters here to your good judgment. I'm off to Goshocking to join Zeisberger. Affairs there demand our immediate attention, and we must make haste. How long do you intend to be absent? A few days, possibly a week. In case of any unusual disturbance among the Indians, the appearance of Pipe and his tribe, or any of the opposing factions, send a fleet runner at once to warn me. Most of my fears have been allayed by Wingenon's attitude toward us. His freeing gem in face of the opposition of his chiefs is a sure sign of friendliness. More than once I have suspected that he was interested in Christianity. His daughter, Whispering Winds, exhibited the same intense fervor in religion as has been manifested by all our converts. It may be that we have not appealed in vain to Wingenund and his daughter, but their high position in the Delaware tribe makes it impolitic for them to reveal a change of heart. If we could win over those two, we'd have every chance to convert the whole tribe. Well, as it is, we must be thankful for Wingenund's friendship. We have two powerful allies now. Tarhe, the Wyandot chieftain, remains neutral, to be sure, but that's almost as helpful as friendship. I, too, take a hopeful view of the situation, replied Edwards. We'll trust in Providence and do our best, said Hackwelder, as he turned his horse. Good-bye. Godspeed, called Edwards, as his chief rode away. The missionary resumed his work of getting breakfast. He remained indoors all that day, except for the few moments when he ran over to Mr. Wells' cabin to inquire regarding Nell's condition. He was relieved to learn she was so much better that she had declared her intention of moving about the house. Dave kept a close watch on Young. He himself was suffering from the same blow which had prostrated his friend, but his physical strength and fortitude were such that he did not weaken. He was overjoyed to see that George rallied and showed no further indications of breaking down. True it was, perhaps, that Heckwelder's earnest prayer on behalf of the converted Indians had sunk deeply into George's heart, and thus kept it from breaking. No stronger plea could have been made than the allusion to those gentle, dependent Christians. No one but a missionary could realize the sweetness, the simplicity, the faith, the eager hope for a good true life which had been implanted in the hearts of these Indians. To bear it in mind, to think of what he, as a missionary and teacher, was to them, relieved him of half his burden, and for strength to bear the remainder, he went to God. For all worry there is a sovereign cure, for all suffering there is a healing balm. It is religious faith. Happiness had suddenly flashed with a meteor-like radiance into Young's life, only to be snuffed out like a candle in a windy gloom. But his work, his duty, remained. So in his trial he learned the necessity of resignation. He chaffed no more at the mysterious, seemingly brutal methods of nature. He questioned no more. He wondered no more at the apparent indifference of providence. He had one hope which was to be true to his faith, and teach it to the end. Nell mastered her grief by an astonishing reserve of strength. Undoubtedly it was that marvelously merciful power which enables a person, for the love of others, to bear up under a cross, or even to fight death himself. As young had his bright-eyed Indian boys and girls, who had learned Christianity from him, and whose future depended on him, so Nell had her aged and weakening uncle to care for and cherish. Jim's attentions to her before the deep affliction had not been slight, but now they were so marked as to be unmistakable. In some way Jim seemed changed since he had returned from the Delaware encampment. 
although he went back to the work with his old aggressiveness he was not nearly so successful as he had been before whether or not this was his fault he took his failure deeply to heart there was that in his tenderness which caused nell to regard him in one sense as she did her uncle jim too leaned upon her and she accepted his devotion where once she had repelled it she had unconsciously betrayed a great deal when she had turned so tenderly to him in the first moments after her recognition and he remembered it he did not speak of love to her he let a thousand little acts of kindness a constant thoughtfulness of her plead his cause the days succeeding heckwelder's departure were remarkable for several reasons although the weather was enticing the number of visiting indians gradually decreased not a runner from any tribe came into the village and finally the day dawned when not a single indian from the outlying towns was present to hear the preaching jem spoke as usual after several days had passed and none but converted indians made up the congregation the young man began to be uneasy in mind young and edwards were unable to account for the unusual absence from worship yet they did not see in it anything to cause especial concern often there had been days without visitation to the village of peace finally jem went to consult glickikan he found the delaware at work in the potato patch the old indian dropped his hoe and bowed to the missionary a reverential and stately courtesy always characterized the attitude of the indians toward the young white father glickican can you tell me why no indians have come here lately the old chief shook his head does their absence signify ill to the village of peace glickican saw a blackbird flitting in the shadow of the moon the bird hovered above the village of peace but sang no song the old delaware vouchsafed no other than this strange reply jem returned to his cabin decidedly worried he did not at all like glickican's answer the purport of it seemed to be that a cloud was rising on the bright horizon of the christian village he confided his fears to young and edwards after discussing the situation the three missionaries decided to send for heckwelder he was the leader of the mission he knew more of indian craft than any of them and how to meet it if this calm in the heretofore busy life of the mission was the lull before a storm heckwelder should be there with his experience and influence for nearly ten years heckwelder has anticipated trouble from hostile savages said edwards but so far he has always averted it as you know he has confined himself mostly to propitiating the indians and persuading them to be friendly and listen to us we'll send for him accordingly they dispatched a runner to goshocking in due time the indian returned with the startling news that heckewelder had left the indian village days before as had in fact all the savages except the few converted ones the same held true in the case of sandusky the adjoining town moreover it had been impossible to obtain any news in regard to zeisberger the missionaries were now thoroughly alarmed and knew not what to do they concealed the real state of affairs from nell and her uncle desiring to keep them from anxiety as long as possible that night the three teachers went to bed with heavy hearts the following morning at daybreak jim was awakened from a sound sleep by some one calling at his window he got up to learn who it was and in the gray light saw edward standing outside what's the matter questioned jim hurriedly matter enough hurry get into your clothes replied edwards as soon as you are dressed quietly awaken mr wells and nelly but do not frighten them but what's the trouble queried jim as he began to dress the indians are pouring into the village as thickly as flying leaves in autumn edwards exaggerated assertion proved to be almost literally true no sooner had the rising sun dispelled the mist than it shone on long lines of marching braves mounted warriors hundreds of pack-horses approaching from the forest the orderly procession was proof of a concerted plan on the part of the invaders 
From their windows the missionaries watched with bated breath. With wonder and fear they saw the long lines of dusky forms. When they were in the clearing, the savages busied themselves with their packs. Long rows of teepees sprung up as if by magic. The savages had come to stay. The number of incoming visitors did not lessen until noon, when a few straggling groups marked the end of the invading host. Most significant of all was the fact that neither child, maiden, nor squaw accompanied this army. Jim appraised the number at six or seven hundred, more than had ever before visited the village at one time. They were mostly Delawares, with many Shawnees, and a few Hurons among them. It was soon evident, however, that for the present, at least, the Indians did not intend any hostile demonstration. They were quiet in manner, and busy about their teepees and campfires. But there was an absence of the curiosity that had characterized the former sojourns of Indians at the peaceful village. After a brief consultation with his brother missionaries, who all were opposed to his preaching that afternoon, Jim decided he would not deviate from his usual custom. He held the afternoon service and spoke to the largest congregation that had ever sat before him. He was surprised to find that the sermon, which heretofore so strongly impressed the savages, did not now arouse the slightest enthusiasm. It was followed by a brooding silence of a boding, ominous import. Four white men dressed in Indian garb had been the most attentive listeners to Jem's sermon. He recognized three as Simon Gerty, Elliot, and Deering, the renegades, and he learned from Edwards that the other was the notorious McKee. These men went through the village, stalking into the shops and cabins, and acting as do men who are on a tour of inspection. So intrusive was their curiosity that Jem hurried back to Mr. Wells' cabin, and remained there in seclusion. Of course, by this time, Nell and her uncle knew of the presence of the hostile savages. They were frightened, and barely regained their composure when the young man assured them he was certain they had no real cause for fear. Jem was sitting at the doorstep with Mr. Wells and Edwards when Gertie, with his comrades, came toward them. The renegade leader was a tall, athletic man with a dark, strong face. There was in it none of the brutality and ferocity which marked his brother's visage. Simon Gertie appeared keen, forceful, authoritative, as indeed he must have been, to have attained the power he held in the confederated tribes. His companions presented wide contrasts. Elliot was a small, spare man, of cunning, vindictive aspect. McKee looked as might have been supposed from his reputation, and Deering was a fit mate for the absent Gertie. Simon appeared to be a man of some intelligence, who had used all his power to make that position a great one. The other renegades were desperadoes. "'Where's Heckwelder?' asked Gertie, curtly, as he stopped before the missionaries. Uh, "'He started out for the Indian towns on the Muskingong,' answered Edwards. "'But we have had no word from either him or Zeisberger. "'When do you expect him?' I can't say, perhaps tomorrow, and then again, maybe not for a week. He's in authority here, ain't he? Yes, but he left me in charge of the mission. Can I serve you in any way? I reckon not, said the renegade, turning to his companions. They conversed in low tones for a moment. Presently, McKee, Elliot, and Deering went toward the newly erected teepees. Gertie, do you mean us any ill will? earnestly asked Edwards. He had met the man on more than one occasion, and had no hesitation about questioning him. I can't say as I do, answered the renegade, and those who heard him believed him. But I am again this redskin preaching, and have been all along. The engines are mad clear through, and I ain't saying I've tried to quiet him any. This missionary work has got to be stopped one way or another. Now, what I waited here to say is this. I ain't quite forgot I was white once, and I believe you fellers are honest. I'm willing to go out of my way to help you get away from here. Go away, echoed Edwards. That's it, answered Gertie, shouldering his rifle. 
but why we are perfectly harmless we are only doing good and hurt no one why should we go cause there's liable to be trouble said the renegade significantly edwards turned slowly to mr wells and jim the old missionary was trembling visibly jim was pale but more with anger than fear thank you gertie but we'll stay and jim's voice rang clear End of chapter twenty of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter twenty one of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter twenty one jim come out here called edwards at the window of mr wells cabin the young man arose from the breakfast table and when outside found edwards standing by the door with an indian brave he was a wyandot lightly built lithe and wiry easily recognizable as an indian runner when jim appeared the man handed him a small packet he unwound a few folds of some oily skin to find a square piece of birch bark upon which were scratched the following words rev j downs greeting your brother is alive and safe whispering winds rescued him by taking him as her husband leave the village of peace pipe and half king have been influenced by gertie zane now what do you think of that exclaimed jim handing the message to edwards thank heaven joe was saved zane that must be the zane who married tarhe's daughter answered edwards when he had read the note i'm rejoiced to hear of your brother joe married to that beautiful indian maiden well of all wonderful things mused jim what will nell say we're getting warnings enough do you appreciate that asked edwards pipe and half king have been influenced by gertie evidently the writer deemed that brief sentence of sufficient meaning edwards we're preachers we can't understand such things i am learning at least something every day colonel zane advised us not to come here wetzel said go back to fort henry gertie warned us and now comes this peremptory order from isaac zane well it means that these border men see what we will not admit we ministers have such hope and trust in god that we cannot realize the dangers of this life I fear that our work has been in vain. Never. We have already saved many souls. Do not be discouraged. All this time the runner had stood near at hand, straight as an arrow. Presently Edward suggested that the Wyandot was waiting to be questioned, and accordingly he asked the Indian if he had anything further to communicate. Yorong go by pale face. Here he held up both hands and shut his fists several times evidently enumerating how many white men he had seen here when high sun with that he bounded lightly past them and loped off with an even swinging stride what did he mean asked jim almost sure he had not heard the runner aright he meant that a party of white men are approaching and will be here by noon i never knew an indian runner to carry unreliable information we have joyful news both in regard to your brother and the village of peace let us go in to tell the others the huron runner's report proved to be correct shortly before noon signals from indian scouts proclaimed the approach of a band of white men evidently gertie's forces had knowledge beforehand of the proximity of this band for the signals created no excitement the indians expressed only a lazy curiosity soon several delaware scouts appeared escorting a large party of frontiersmen these men turned out to be captain williamson's force which had been out on an expedition after a marauding tribe of chippewas this last named tribe had recently harried the remote settlers and committed depredations on the outskirts of the white settlements eastward the company was composed of men who had served in the garrison at fort pitt and hunters and backwoodsmen from yellow creek and fort henry the captain himself was a typical border man rough and bluff hardened by long years of border life 
and like most pioneers having no more use for an indian than for a snake he had led his party after the marauders and surprised and slaughtered nearly all of them returning eastward he had passed through Gashating, where he learned of the muttering storm rising over the village of peace and had come more out of curiosity than hope to avert misfortune the advent of so many frontiersmen seemed a godsend to the perplexed and worried missionaries they welcomed the newcomers most heartily beds were made in several of the newly erected cabins the village was given over for the comfort of the frontiersmen edwards conducted captain williamson through the shops and schools and the old borderman's weather-beaten face expressed a comical surprise well i'll be durned if i ever expected to see a redskin work was his only comment on the industries we are greatly alarmed by the presence of gertie and his followers said edwards we have been warned to leave but have not been actually threatened what do you infer from the appearance here of these hostile savages it hardly appears to me they'll bother you preachers there are again the christian redskins that's plain why have you been warned to go well that's natural seeing they're again the preaching or what will they do with the converted indians mighty uncertain they might let them go back to the tribes but appears to me these good injuns won't go another thing gertie is afeard of the spread of christianity then you think our christians will be made prisoners appears likely and you also think we'd do well to leave here i do sartin we're sartin for fort henry soon you better come along with us captain williamson we're going to stick it out gertie or no gertie you can't do no good staying here pipe and half king won't stand for the singin prayin redskins especially when they've got all these cattle and fields of grain wetzel said the same have you seen wetzel yes he rescued a girl from jim gertie and returned her to us that's so i met wetzel and jack zane back a few miles in the woods they're layin for somebody because when i asked them to come along they refused saying they had work as must be done they looked like it too i never heard tell of wetzel advising any one before but i'll say if he told me to do a thing by gosh i'd do it as men we might very well take the advice given us but as preachers we must stay here to do all we can for these christian indians one more thing will you help us i reckon i'll stay here to see the thing out answered williamson edwards made a mental note of the frontiersman's evasive answer jim had meanwhile made the acquaintance of a young minister john christie by name who had lost his sweetheart in one of the chippewa raids and had accompanied the williamson expedition in the hope he might rescue her how long have you been out asked jim about four weeks now answered christie my betrothed was captured five weeks ago yesterday i joined williamson's band which made up at short creek to take the trail of the flying chippewas in the hope i might find her but not a trace the expedition fell upon a band of redskins over on the wall haunting and killed nearly all of them i learned from a wounded indian that a renegade had made off with a white girl about a week previous perhaps it was poor lucy jim related the circumstances of his own capture by jim gertie the rescue of nell and kate's sad fate could jim gertie have gotten your girl inquired jim in conclusion it's hardly probable the description doesn't tally with gertie's this renegade was short and heavy and noted especially for his strength of course an indian would first speak of some such distinguishing feature there are however ten or twelve renegades on the border and excepting jim gertie one's as bad as another then it's a common occurrence this abducting girls from the settlements yes and the strange thing is that one never hears of such doings until he gets out on the frontier for that matter you don't hear much of anything except of the wonderful richness and promise of the western country you are right rumors of fat fertile lands induce the colonist to become a pioneer he comes west with his family two out of every ten lose their scalps 
and in some places the average is much greater. The wives, daughters, and children are carried off into captivity. I have been on the border two years, and know that the rescue of any captive, as Wetzel rescued your friend, is a remarkable exception. If you have so little hope of recovering your sweetheart, what then is your motive for accompanying this band of hunters? Revenge. And you are a preacher? Jim's voice did not disguise his astonishment. I was a preacher, and now I am thirsting for vengeance, answered Christie, his face clouding darkly. Wait until you learn what frontier life means. You are young here yet. You are flushed with the success of your teaching. You have lived a short time in this quiet village, where until the last few days all has been serene. You know nothing of the strife, of the necessity of fighting, of the cruelty which makes up this border existence. Only two years have hardened me so that I actually pant for the blood of the renegade who has robbed me. A frontiersman must take his choice of succumbing or cutting his way through flesh and bone. Blood will be spilled. If not yours, then your foes. The pioneers run from the plow to the fight. They halt in the cutting of corn to defend themselves, and in winter must battle against cold and hardship, which would be less cruel if there was time in summer to prepare for winter, for the savages leave them hardly an opportunity to plant crops. How many pioneers have given up and gone back east? Find me any who would not return home to-morrow if they could. All that brings them out here is a chance for a home, and all that keeps them out here is the poor hope of finally attaining their object. Always there is a possibility of future prosperity. But this generation, if it survives, will never see prosperity and happiness. What does this border life engender in a pioneer who holds his own in it? Of all things, not Christianity. He becomes a fighter, keen as the redskin who steals through the coverts. The serene days of the village of peace had passed into history. Soon that depraved vagabond, the French trader, with cheap trinkets and vile whiskey, made his appearance. This was all that was needed to inflame the visitors. Where they had been only bold and impudent, they became insulting and abusive. They execrated the Christian Indians for their neutrality, scorned them for worshipping this unknown god, and denounced a religion which made women of strong men. The slaughtering of cattle commenced. The despoiling of maize fields and robbing of corn cribs began with the drunkenness. All this time it was seen that Gertie and Elliot consulted often with Pipe and Half-King. The latter was the only Huron chief opposed to neutrality toward the village of peace, and he was, if possible, more fierce in his hatred than Pipe. The future of the Christian settlement rested with these two chiefs. Gertie and Elliot, evidently, were the designing schemers, and they worked diligently on the passions of these simple-minded but fierce warlike chiefs. Greatly to the relief of the distracted missionaries, Heckwelder returned to the village. Jaded and haggard, he presented a travel-worn appearance. He made the astonishing assertions that he had been thrice waylaid and assaulted on his way to Goshocking, then detained by a roving band of Chippewas, and soon after his arrival at their camping ground, a renegade had run off with a white woman captive, while the Indians west of the village were in an uproar. Zeisberger, however, was safe in the Moravian town of Salem, some miles west of Goshocking. Heckwalder had expected to find the same condition of affairs as existed in the village of Peace, but he was bewildered by the great array of hostile Indians. Chiefs who had once extended friendly hands to him now drew back coldly as they said, Washington is dead. The American armies are cut to pieces. The few thousands who had escaped the British are collecting at Fort Pitt to steal the Indian's land. Heckwelder vigorously denied all these assertions, knowing they had been invented by Gertie and Elliot. He exhausted all his skill and patience in the vain endeavor to show Pipe where he was wrong. Half King had been so well coached by the renegades that he refused to listen. The other chiefs maintained a cold reserve that was baffling and exasperating. 
Wingenund took no active part in the councils, but his presence apparently denoted that he had sided with the others. The outlook was altogether discouraging. "'I'm completely fagged out,' declared Eckwelder that night, when he returned to Edward's cabin. He dropped into a chair as one whose strength is entirely spent, whose indomitable spirit has at last been broken. "'Lie down to rest,' said Edwards. "'Oh, I can't. Matters look so black. "'You're tired out and discouraged. You'll feel better tomorrow. "'The situation is not, perhaps, so hopeless. "'The presence of these frontiersmen should encourage us.' "'What will they do? What can they do?' cried Heckwelder bitterly. "'I tell you, never before have I encountered such gloomy, stony Indians. "'It seems to me that they are in no vacillating state.' They act like men whose course is already decided upon, and who are only waiting. "'For what?' asked Jim, after a long silence. "'God only knows. Perhaps for a time. Possibly for a final decision. And it may be for a reason, the very thought of which makes me faint.' "'Tell us,' said Edwards, speaking quietly, for he had ever been the calmest of the missionaries. "'Never mind.' Perhaps it's only my nerves. I'm all unstrung, and could suspect anything to-night. Heckwelder, tell us, Jem asked earnestly. My friends, I pray I am wrong. God help us if my fears are correct. I believe the Indians are waiting for Jem Gertie. End of chapter 21 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter 22 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Leonard Wilson. Chapter 22. Simon Gertie lolled on a blanket in Half King's teepee. He was alone, awaiting his allies. Rings of white smoke curled lazily from his lips as he puffed on a long Indian pipe and gazed out over the clearing that contained the village of peace. Still water has something in its placid surface significant of deep channels, of hidden depths. The dim outline of the forest is dark with meaning, suggestive of its wild internal character. So Simon Gertie's hard bronzed face betrayed the man, his degenerate brother's features were revolting, but his own were striking and fell short of being handsome only because of their craggy hardness. Years of revolt, of bitterness, of consciousness of wasted life had graven their stern lines on that copper mask-like face. Yet despite the cruelty there, the forbidding shade on it as if a reflection from a dark soul, it was not wholly a bad countenance. Traces still lingered, faintly, of a man in whom kindlier feelings had once predominated. In a moment of pique, Gertie had deserted his military post at Fort Pitt and become an outlaw of his own volition. Previous to that time, he had been an able soldier and a good fellow. When he realized that his step was irrevocable and that even his best friends condemned him, he plunged, with anger and despair in his heart, into a war upon his own race. Both of his brothers had long been border ruffians, whose only protection from the outraged pioneers lay in the faraway camps of hostile tribes. George Gertie had so sunk his individuality into the savages that he was no longer a white man. Jim Gertie stalked over the borderland with a bloody tomahawk, his long arm outstretched to clutch some unfortunate white woman, and with his hideous smile of death. Both of these men were far lower than the worst savages, and it was almost wholly to their deeds of darkness that Simon Gertie owed his infamous name. Today White Chief, as Gertie was called, awaited his men. A slight tremor of the ground caused him to turn his gaze. The Huron Chief, half-king, resplendent in his magnificent array, had entered the teepee. He squatted in a corner, rested the bowl of his great pipe on his knee, and smoked in silence. 
the habitual frown of his black brow like a shaded overhanging cliff the fire flashing from his eyes as a shining light is reflected from a dark pool his closely shut bulging jaw all bespoke a nature lofty in its indian pride and arrogance but more cruel than death another chief stalked into the tepee and seated himself it was pipe his countenance denoted none of the intelligence that made wingenund's face so noble it was even coarser than half kings and his eyes resembling live coals in the dark the long cruel lines of his jaw the thin tightly closed lips which looked as if they could relax only to utter a savage command expressed fierce cunning and brutality white chief is idle to-day said half king speaking in the indian tongue king i am waiting gertie is slow but sure answered the renegade the eagle sails slowly round and round up and up replied half king with majestic gestures until his eye sees all until he knows his time then he folds his wings and swoops down from the blue sky like the forked fire so does white chief but half king is impatient to-day decides the fate of the village of peace answered gertie imperturbably ah oh, grunted pipe half king vented his approval in the same meaning exclamation an hour passed the renegade smoked in silence the chiefs did likewise a horseman rode up to the door of the tepee dismounted and came in it was elliot he had been absent twenty hours his buckskin suit showed the effect of hard riding through the thickets hello bill any sign of jim was gertie's greeting to his lieutenant nary he's not been seen near the delaware camp he's after that chap who married winds i thought so jim's rounding up a tenderfoot who will be a bad man to handle if he has half a chance i saw as much the day he took his horse away from silver he finally did for the shawnee and almost put jim out my brother oughtn't to give rein to personal revenge at a time like this gertie's face did not change but his tone was one of annoyance well, jim said he'd be here today didn't he today is as long as we allowed to wait he'll come where's jake and mac they're here somewhere drinking like fish and raising hell two more renegades appeared at the door and entering the tepee squatted down in indian fashion the little wiry man with a wizened face was mckee the other was the latest acquisition to the renegade force jake deering deserter thief murderer everything that is bad in appearance he was of medium height but very heavily compactly built and evidently as strong as an ox he had a tangled shock of red hair a broad bloated face big dull eyes like the openings of empty furnaces and an expression of beastliness deering and mckee were intoxicated bad time for drinking said gertie with disapproval in his glance what's that to you growled deering i'm here to do your work and i reckon it'll be done better if i'm drunk don't get careless replied gertie with that cool tone and dark look such as dangerous men use i'm only saying it's a bad time for you because if this bunch of frontiersmen happened to get on to you being the renegade that was with the chippewas and got that young feller's girl there's liable to be trouble they ain't a going to find out where is she back there in the woods maybe it's as well now don't get so drunk you blab all you know we've lots of work to do without having to clean up williamson's bunch rejoined gertie bill tie up the tent flaps and we'll get to council elliot arose to carry out the order and had pulled in the deer hide flaps when one of them was jerked outward to disclose the befrilled person of jem gertie except for a discoloration over his eye he appeared as usual ah, grunted pipe who was glad to see his renegade friend half king evinced the same feeling hello was simon gertie's greeting "'Pears I'm on time for the picnic,' said Jim Curdy, with his ghastly leer. 
Bill Elliott closed the flaps after giving orders to the guard to prevent any Indians from loitering near the teepee. Listen, said Simon Gertie, speaking low in the Delaware language, the time is ripe. We've come here to break forever the influence of the white man's religion. Our councils have been held. We shall drive away the missionaries and burn the village of peace. He paused, leaning forward in his exceeding earnestness, with his bronzed face lined by swelling veins, his whole person made rigid by the murderous thought. Then he hissed between his teeth, What shall we do with these Christian Indians? Pipe raised his war club, struck it upon the ground, then handed it to Half King. Half King took the club and repeated the action. Both chiefs favored the death penalty. Feed them to their buzzards, croaked Jim Gertie. Simon Gertie knitted his brow in thought. The question of what to do with the converted Indians had long perplexed him. No, said he. Let us drive away the missionaries, burn the village, and take the Indians back to camp. We'll keep them there. They'll soon forget. Pipe does not want them, declared the Delaware. Western Injuns shall never sit around half King's fire, cried the Huron. Simon Gertie knew the crisis had come, that but few moments were left him to decide as to the disposition of the Christians, and he thought seriously. Certainly he did not want the Christians murdered. However cruel his life and great his misdeeds, he was still a man. If possible, he desired to burn the village and ruin the religious influence, but without shedding blood. Yet with all his power, he was handicapped, and that by the very chiefs most nearly under his control. He could not subdue this growing Christian influence without the help of Pipe and Half-King. To these savages, a thing was either right or wrong. He had sown the seed of unrest and jealousy in the savage breasts, and the fruit was the decree of death. As far as these Indians were concerned, this decision was unalterable. On the other hand, if he did not spread ruin over the village of peace, the missionaries would soon get such a grasp on the tribes that their hold would never be broken. He could not allow that, even if he was forced to sacrifice the missionaries along with their converts, for he saw in the growth of this religion his own downfall. The border must be hostile to the whites, or it could no longer be his home. To be sure, he had aided the British in the revolution, and could find a refuge among them. But this did not suit him. He became an outcast because of failure to win the military promotion which he had so much coveted. He had failed among his own people. He had won a great position in an alien race, and he loved his power. To sway men, Indians, if not others, to his will, to avenge himself for the fancied wrong done to him, to be great, had been his unrelenting purpose. He knew he must sacrifice the Christians, or eventually lose his own power. He had no false ideas about the converted Indians. He knew they were innocent, that they were a thousand times better off than the pagan Indians, that they had never harmed him, nor would they ever do so. But if he allowed them to spread their religion, there was an end of Simon Gertie. His decision was characteristic of the man. He would sacrifice anyone, or all, to retain his supremacy. He knew the fulfillment of the decree as laid down by Pipe and Half-King would be known as his work. His name, infamous now, would have an additional horror, and ever be remembered by posterity in unspeakable loathing, in unsoftening wrath. He knew this and deep down in his heart awoke a numbed chord of humanity that twinged with strange pain. What awful work he must sanction to keep his vaunted power! More bitter than all was the knowledge that to retain this hold over the Indians he must commit a deed which, so far as the whites were concerned, would take away his great name and brand him a coward. He briefly reviewed his stirring life, singularly fitted for a leader in a few years he had risen to the most powerful position on the border he wielded more influence than any chief 
he had been opposed to the invasion of the pioneers and this alone without his sagacity or his generalship would have given him control of many tribes but hatred for his own people coupled with unerring judgment a remarkable ability to lead expeditions and his invariable success had raised him higher and higher until he stood alone he was the most powerful man west of the alleghanies his fame was such that the british had importuned him to help them and had actually in more than one instance given him command over british subjects all of which meant that he had a great even though an infamous name no matter what he was blamed for no matter how many dastardly deeds had been committed by his depraved brothers and laid to his door he knew he had never done a cowardly act that which he had committed while he was drunk he considered as having been done by the liquor and not by the man he loved his power and he loved his name in all gertie's eventful ignoble life neither the alienation from his people the horror they ascribed to his power nor the sacrifice of his life to stand high among the savage races nor any of the cruel deeds committed while at war hurt him a tithe as much as did this sanctioning the massacre of the christians although he was a vengeful unscrupulous evil man he had never acted the coward half king waited long for gertie to speak since he remained silent the wily huron suggested that they take a vote on the question let us burn the village of peace drive away the missionaries and take the christians back to the delaware towns all without spilling blood said gertie determined to carry his point if possible i say the same added elliot refusing the war club held out to him by half king me too voted mckee not so drunk but that he understood the lightning-like glance gertie shot at him kill em all kill everybody cried deering in drunken glee he took the club and pounded with it on the ground pipe repeated his former performance as also did half king after which he handed the black knotted symbol of death to jim gertie three had declared for saving the christians and three for the death penalty six pairs of burning eyes were fastened on the death's head pipe and half king were coldly relentless deering awoke to a brutal earnestness mckee and elliot watched with bated breath these men had formed themselves into a tribunal to decide on the life or death of many and the situation if not the greatest in their lives certainly was one of vital importance simon gertie cursed all the fates he dared not openly oppose the voting and he could not before those cruel but just chiefs try to influence his brother's vote as jim gertie took the war club simon read in his brother's face the doom of the converted indians and he muttered to himself now tremble and shrink all you christians jim was not in a hurry slowly he poised the war club he was playing as a cat plays with a mouse he was glorying in his power the silence was that of death it signified the silence of death the war club descended with violence feed the christians to the buzzards End of chapter 22 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter 23 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. I've been here before, said Joe to Whispering Winds. I remember that vine-covered stone. We crawled over it to get at Gertie and Silvertip. There's the little knoll. Here's the very spot where I was hit by a flying tomahawk. Yes, and there's the spring. Let me see, what did Wetzel call this spot? Beautiful spring, answered the Indian girl. That's it, and it's well named. What a lovely place nature had been lavish in the beautifying of this enclosed dell 
It was about fifty yards wide, and nestled among little wooded knolls and walls of gray lichen-colored stone. Though the sun shone brightly into the opening, and the rain had free access to the mossy ground, no stormy winds ever entered this well-protected glade. Joe reveled in the beauty of the scene, even while he was too weak to stand erect. He suffered no pain from his wound, although he had gradually grown dizzy, and felt as if the ground was rising before him. He was glad to lie upon the mossy ground in the little cavern under the cliff. Upon examination his wound was found to have opened, and was bleeding. His hunting coat was saturated with blood. Whispering winds washed the cut, and dressed it with cooling leaves. Then she rebandaged it tightly with Joe's linsey handkerchiefs, and while he rested comfortably, she gathered bundles of ferns, carrying them to the little cavern. When she had a large quantity of these, she sat down near Joe, and began to weave the long stems into a kind of screen. The fern stalks were four feet long and half a foot wide. These she deftly laced together, making broad screens which would serve to ward off the night dews. This done, she next built a fireplace with flat stones. She found wild apples, plums, and turnips on the knoll above the glade. Then she cooked strips of meat which had been brought with them. Lance grazed on the long grass just without the glade, and Mose caught two rabbits. When darkness settled down, Whispering Winds called the dog within the cavern and hung the screens before the opening. Several days passed. Joe rested quietly and began to recover strength. Besides the work of preparing the meals, Whispering Winds had nothing to do save sit near the invalid and amuse or interest him so that he would not fret or grow impatient while his wound was healing. They talked about their future prospects. After visiting the village of peace, they would go to Fort Henry, where Joe could find employment. They dwelt upon the cabin they would build, and passed many happy moments planning a new home. Joe's love of the wilderness had in no wise diminished, but a blow on his head from a heavy tomahawk and a vicious stab in the back had lessened his zeal so far that he understood it was not wise to sacrifice life for the pleasures of the pathless woods. He could have the last without the danger of being shot at from behind every tree. He reasoned that it would be best for him to take his wife to Fort Henry, there find employment, and devote his leisure time to roaming in the forest. Will the pale faces be kind to an Indian who has learned to love them? Whispering winds asked wistfully of Joe. Indeed they will, answered Joe, and he told her the story of Isaac Zane, how he took his Indian bride home, how her beauty and sweetness soon won all the white people's love. It will be so with you, my wife. Whispering winds knows so little, she murmured. Why, you are learning every day, and even if such was not the case, you know enough for me. Whispering winds will be afraid. She fears a little to go. I'll be glad when we can be on the move, said Joe, with his old impatient desire for action. How soon, Winds, can we set off? As many days, answered the Indian girl, holding up five fingers. So long I want to leave this place. Leave beautiful spring? Yes, even this sweet place. It has a horror for me. I'll never forget the night I first saw that spring shining in the moonlight. It was right above the rock that I looked into the glade. The moon was reflected in the dark pool, and as I gazed into the shadowy depths of the dark water, I suddenly felt an unaccountable terror. But I oughtn't to have the same feeling now. We are safe, are we not? We are safe, murmured whispering winds. Yet I have the same chill of fear whenever I look at the beautiful spring, and at night, as I awake to hear the soft babble of running water, I freeze until my heart feels like cold lead. Winds, I'm not a coward, but I can't help this feeling. Perhaps it's only the memory of that awful night with Wetzel. An Indian feels so when he passes 
to his unmarked grave answered winds gazing solemnly at him whispering winds does not like this fancy of yours let us leave beautiful spring you are almost well ah oh, if whispering winds should lose you i love you and i love you my beautiful wild flower answered joe stroking the dark head so near his own a tender smile shone on his face he heard a slight noise without the cave and looking up saw that which caused the smile to fade quickly moose he called sharply the dog was away chasing rabbits whispering winds glanced over her shoulder with a startled cry which ended in a scream not two yards behind her stood jem gertie hideous was his face in its triumphant ferocity he held a long knife in his hand and snarling like a mad wolf he made a forward lunge joe raised himself quickly but almost before he could lift his hand in defense the long blade was sheathed in his breast slowly he sank back his gray eyes contracting with the old steely flash the will to do was there but the power was gone forever remember dirty murderer i am wetzel's friend he cried gazing at his slayer with unutterable scorn then the gray eyes softened and sought the blanched face of the stricken maiden winds he whispered faintly she was as one frozen with horror the gray eyes gazed into hers with lingering tenderness then the film of death came upon them the renegade raised his bloody knife and bent over the prostrate form whispering winds threw herself upon gertie with the blind fury of a maddened lioness cursing fiercely he stabbed her once twice three times she fell across the body of her lover and clasped it convulsively gertie gave one glance at his victims deliberately wiped the gory knife on wind's leggings and with another glance hurried and fearful around the glade he plunged into the thicket an hour passed a dark stream crept from the quiet figures toward the spring it dyed the moss and the green violet leaves slowly it wound its way to the clear water dripping between the pale blue flowers the little fall below the spring was no longer snowy white blood had tinged it red a dog came bounding into the glade he leaped the brook hesitated on the bank and lowered his nose to sniff at the water he bounded up the bank to the cavern a long mournful howl broke the wilderness's quiet another hour passed the birds were silent the insects still the sun sank behind the trees and the shades of evening gathered the ferns on the other side of the glade trembled a slight rustle of dead leaves disturbed the stillness the dog whined then barked the tall form of a hunter rose out of the thicket and stepped into the glade with his eyes bent upon moccasin tracks in the soft moss the trail he had been following led him to this bloody spring i might have known it he muttered wetzel for it was he leaned upon his long rifle while his keen eyes took in the details of the tragedy the whining dog the bloody water the motionless figures lying in a last embrace told the sad story joe and winds he muttered only a moment did he remain lost in sad reflection a familiar moccasin print in the sand on the bank pointed westward he examined it carefully two hours gone he muttered i might overtake him then his motions became swift with two blows of his tomahawk he secured a long piece of grapevine he took a heavy stone from the bed of the brook he carried joe to the spring and returning for winds placed her beside her lover this done he tied one end of the grapevine around the stone and wound the other about the dead bodies he pushed them off the bank into the spring as the lovers sank into the deep pool they turned exposing first wind's sad face and then joe's then they sank out of sight little waves splashed on the shore of the pool 
the ripple disappeared, and the surface of the spring became tranquil. Wetzel stood one moment over the watery grave of the maiden who had saved him, and the boy who had loved him. In the gathering gloom his stalwart form assumed gigantic proportions, and when he raised his long arm and shook his clenched fist toward the west, he resembled a magnificent statue of dark menace. With a single bound he cleared the pool, and then sped out of the glade. He urged the dog on Gertie's trail, and followed the eager beast toward the west. As he disappeared, a long, low sound like the sigh of the night wind swelled and moaned through the gloom. End of chapter 23 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter 24 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Chapter 24 when the first ruddy rays of the rising sun crimsoned the eastern sky, Wetzel slowly wound his way down a rugged hill far west of Beautiful Spring. A white dog, weary and footsore, limped by his side. Both man and beast showed evidence of severe exertion. The hunter stopped in a little cave under a projecting stone, and laying aside his rifle, began to gather twigs and sticks. He was particular about selecting the wood, and threw aside many pieces which would have burned well. But when he did kindle a flame, it blazed hotly, yet made no smoke. He sharpened a green stick, and taking some strips of meat from his pocket, roasted them over the hot flame. He fed the dog first. Mose had crouched close on the ground, with his head on his paws, and his brown eyes fastened upon the hunter. He had too big a start for us, said Wetzel, speaking as if the dog were human. It seemed that Wetzel's words were a protest against the meaning in those large, sad eyes. Then the hunter put out the fire, and searching for a more secluded spot, finally found one on top of the ledge, where he commanded a good view of his surroundings. The weary dog was asleep. Wetzel settled himself to rest, and was soon wrapped in slumber. About noon he awoke. He arose, stretched his limbs, and then took an easy position on the front of the ledge, where he could look below. Evidently the hunter was waiting for something. The dog slept on. It was the noonday hour, when the stillness of the forest almost matched that of midnight. The birds were more quiet than at any other time during daylight. Wetzel reclined there with his head against the stone, and his rifle resting across his knees. He listened now to the sounds of the forest, the soft breeze fluttering among the leaves, the rain call of the tree frog, the caw of crows from distant hilltops, the sweet songs of the thrush and oriole were blended together naturally, harmoniously. But suddenly the hunter raised his head. A note deeper than the others, a little too strong, came from far down the shaded hollow. To Wetzel's trained ear, it was a discord. He manifested no more than this attention, for the bird call was the signal he had been awaiting. He whistled a note in answer that was as deep and clear as the one which had roused him. Moments passed. There was no repetition of the sound. The songs of the other birds had ceased. Besides Wetzel, there was another intruder in the woods. Mose lifted his shaggy head and growled. The hunter patted the dog. In a few minutes the figure of a tall man appeared among the laurels down the slope. He stopped while gazing up at the ledge. Then with noiseless step he ascended the ridge, climbed the rocky ledge, and turned the corner of the stone to face Wetzel. The newcomer was Jonathan Zane. "'Jack, I expected you afore this,' was Wetzel's greeting. "'I couldn't make it sooner,' answered Zane. "'After we left Williamson and separated, "'I got turned around by a band of several hundred redskins "'making for the village of peace. "'I went back again, but couldn't find any sign of the trail we're hunting. "'Then I makes for this meeting place. 
I've been going for some ten hours, and I'm hungry. I've got some bar already cooked, said Wetzel, handing Zane several strips of meat. What luck did you have? I found Gertie's trail and old one over here some eighteen or twenty miles, and followed it until I went almost into the Delaware town. It led to a hut in a deep ravine. I ain't often surprised, but I was then. I found the dead body of that girl, Kate Wells, we fetched over from Fort Henry. That's sad, but it ain't the surprising part. I also found Silvertip, the Shawnee I'd been looking for. He was all knocked and cut up, deader to stone. There'd been something of a scrap in the hut. I calculate Gertie murdered Kate, but I couldn't think then who did for Silver, though I allowed the renegade might have done that too. I watched round and seen Gertie come back to the hut. He had ten engines with him, and presently they all made for the west. I trailed them, but didn't calculate it'd be wise to tackle the bunch single-handed, so laid back. A mile or so from the hut I came across horse tracks mingling with the moccasin prints. About fifteen miles or so from the Delaware town, Gertie left his buckskins, and they went west, while he stuck to the horse tracks. I was on to his game in a minute. I cut across country for a beautiful spring, but I got there too late. I found the warm bodies of Joe, and that engine girl wins. The snake had murdered them. I allowed Joe one over winds, got away from the Delaware town with her, and tried to rescue Kate and kill Silver in the fight. Gertie probably was surprised and run after he had knifed the girl. Pierce so to me. Joe had two knife cuts, and one was an old wound. You say it was a bad fight? Must have been. The hut was all knocked in and stuff scattered about. Well, Joe could go some if he once got started. I'll bet he could. He was the likeliest lad I've seen for many a day. If he'd lasted, he'd been something of a hunter and fighter. Too bad. But, Lord, you can't keep him down, no more than you can lots of these wild young chaps that drift out here. I'll allow he had the fever bad. Did you have time to bury them? I hadn't time for much. I sunk them in the spring. It's a pretty deep hole, said Zane, reflectively. Then you and the dog took Gertie's trail, but couldn't catch up with him. He's now with the renegade cutthroats and hundreds of riled Indians over there in the village of peace. I reckon you're right. A long silence ensued. Jonathan finished his simple repast, drank from the little spring that trickled under the stone, and sitting down by the dog, smoothed out his long, silken hair. Lou! We're pretty good friends, ain't we? he asked thoughtfully. Jack, you and the colonel are all the friends I ever had, exceptin' that boy lying quiet back there in the woods. I know you pretty well, and I ain't saying a word about your running off from me on many a hunt, but I want to speak plain about this fellow Gertie. Well, said Wetzel, as Zane hesitated, twice in the last few years you and I have had it in for the same men, both white-livered traitors. You remember? First it was Miller, who tried to ruin my sister Betty, and next it was Jim Gertie, who murdered our old friend, as good an old man as ever wore moccasins. Well, after Miller ran off from the fort, we trailed him down to the river, and I points across and says, You or me? And you says, Me. You was Betty's friend, and I knew she'd be avenged. Miller is lying quiet in the woods, and violets have blossomed twice over his grave, though you never said a word. But I know it's true, because I know you. Zane looked eagerly into the dark face of his friend, hoping perhaps to get some verbal assurance there that his belief was true. But Wetzel did not speak, and he continued. Another day, not so long ago, we both looked down at an old friend and saw his white hair matted with blood. He'd been murdered for nothing. Again, you and me trailed a coward, and found him to be Jim Gertie. I knew you'd been hunting him for years, and so I says, Lou, you or me? And you says, me. 
I give in to you, for I knew you are a better man than me, and because I wanted you to have the satisfaction. Well, the months have gone by, and Jim Girty's still living and carrying on. Now he's over there after them poor preachers. I ain't saying, Lou, that you haven't more agin him than me, but I do say, let me in on it with you. He always has a gang of redskins with him. He's afraid to travel alone, else you'd had him long ago. Two of us'll have more chance to get him. Let me go with you. When it comes to a finish, I'll stand aside while you give it to him. I'd enjoy seeing you cut him from shoulder to hip. After he leaves the village of peace, we'll hit his trail, camp on it, and stick to it until it ends in his grave. The earnest voice of the backwoodsman ceased. Both men rose and stood facing each other. Zane's bronzed face was hard and tense, expressive of an indomitable will. Wetzel's was coldly dark, with fateful resolve, as if his decree of vengeance once given was as immutable as destiny. The big horny hands gripped in a vice-like clasp born of fierce passion, but no word was spoken. Far to the west somewhere, a befrilled and bedizened renegade pursued the wild tenor of his ways, perhaps even now steeping his soul in more crime or staining his hands a deeper red. But sleeping or waking, he dreamed not of this deadly compact that meant his doom. The two hunters turned their stern faces toward the west and passed silently down the ridge into the depths of the forest. Darkness found them within rifle shot of the village of peace. With the dog creeping between them, they crawled to a position which would, in daylight, command a view of the clearing. Then, while one stood guard, the other slept. When morning dawned, they shifted their position to the top of a low, fern-covered cliff, from which they could see every movement in the village. All the morning they watched with that wonderful patience of men who knew how to wait. The visiting savages were quiet. The missionaries moved about in and out of the shops and cabins. The Christian Indians worked industriously in the fields, while the renegades lolled before a prominent teepee. "'This quiet looks bad,' whispered Jonathan to Wetzel. No shouts were heard, not a hostile Indian was seen to move. "'They've come to a decision,' whispered Jonathan, and Wetzel answered him, "'If they have, the Christians don't know it.' An hour later the deep pealing of the church bell broke the silence. The entire band of Christian Indians gathered near the large log structure, and then marched in orderly form toward the maple grove, where the service was always held in pleasant weather. This movement brought the Indians within several hundred yards of the cliff, where Zane and Wetzel lay concealed. "'There's Heckwelder walking with old man Wells,' whispered Jonathan. "'There's Young and Edwards, and yes, there's the young missionary, Brother Joe. Appears to me they're foolish to hold service in the face of all those riled Injuns.' "'Wess and foolish,' answered Wetzel. "'Look, by gum, as I'm a living sinner, there comes the whole crowd of hostile redskins.' They've got their guns, and by gum they're painted. Looks bad, bad. Not much friendliness about that much. They ain't intending to be peaceable. By gum, you're right. There ain't one of them settin' down. Pears to me I know some of them redskins. There's Pipe, sure enough, and Kotoxen. By gum, if there ain't Chingus. He was friendly once. None of them's friendly. Look, Lou, look, right behind Pipe. See that long war bonnet? As I'm a born sinner, that's your old friend Wingenund. Pears to me we've rounded up all our acquaintances. The two bordermen lay close under the tall ferns and watched the proceedings with sharp eyes. They saw the converted Indians seat themselves before the platform. The crowd of hostile Indians surrounded the glade on all sides except one, which singularly enough, was next to the woods. "'Look thar!' exclaimed Wetzel under his breath. He pointed off to the right of the maple glade. Jonathan gazed in the direction indicated, and saw two savages stealthily slipping through the bushes and behind trees. Presently these suspicious-acting spies, or scouts, stopped on a little knoll perhaps a hundred yards from the glade. Wetzel groaned. 
This ain't comfortable, growled Zane in a low whisper. Them red devils are up to something bad. They'd better not move round over here. The hunters, satisfied that the two isolated savages meant mischief, turned their gaze once more toward the maple grove. Ah, Simon, you white traitor! See him, Lou, coming with his precious gang, said Jonathan. He's got the whole thing fixed. You could plainly see that. Bill Elliott, McKee, and who's that renegade with Jim Gurney? I'll allow he must be the feller we heard was with the Chippewas. Tough-looking customer. A good mate for Jim Gurney. A fine lot of border hawks. Something coming off, whispered Wetzel, as Zane's low growl grew unintelligible. Jonathan felt, rather than saw, Wetzel tremble. The missionaries are consulting. Ah, oh, there comes one. Which? I guess it's Edwards. By gum, who's that Injun stalking over from the hostile bunch? Big Chief, whoever he is. Blessed if it ain't half king. The watchers saw the chief wave his arm and speak with evident arrogance to Edwards, who, however, advanced to the platform and raised his hand to address the Christians. Crack! A shot rang out from the thicket. Clutching wildly at his breast, the missionary reeled back, staggered, and fell. One of those skulking redskins has killed Edwards, said Zane. But no, he's not dead. He's getting up. Maybe he ain't hurt bad. By gum, there's Young coming forward, of all the fools. It was indeed true that Young had faced the Indians. Half King addressed him as he had the other. But Young raised his hand and began speaking. Crack! Another shot rang out. Young threw up his hands and fell heavily. The missionaries rushed toward him. Mr. Wells ran round the group, wringing his hands as if distracted. "'He's hard hit,' his saying between his teeth. "'You can tell that by the way he fell.' Wetzel did not answer. He lay silent and motionless, his long body rigid, and his face like marble. "'There comes the other young fellow, Joe's brother. He'll get plugged, too,' continued Zane, whispering rather to himself than to his companion. Oh, I hope they'd show some sense. It's noble for them to die for Christianity, but he won't do no good. By gum, Heckwelder has pulled him back. Now that's good judgment. Half King stepped before the Christians and addressed them. He held in his hand a black war club, which he wielded as he spoke. Jonathan's attention was now directed from the maple grove to the hunter beside him. He had heard a slight metallic click as Wetzel cocked his rifle. Then he saw the black barrel slowly rise. Listen, Lou, maybe it ain't good sense. We're after Gertie, you remember, and it's a long shot from here, full three hundred yards. You're right, Jack, you're right, answered Wetzel, breathing hard. Let's wait and see what comes off. Jack, I can't do it. It'll make our job harder, but I can't help it. I can put a bullet just over the Huron's left eye. And I'm going to do it. You can't do it, Lou, you can't. It's too far for any gun. Wait, wait, whispered Jonathan, laying his hand on Wetzel's shoulder. Wait, man, can't you see what that unnameable villain is doing? What? asked Zane, turning his eyes again to the glade. The converted Indian sat with bowed heads. Half King raised his war club and threw it on the ground in front of them. He's announcing the death decree, hissed Wetzel. Well, if he ain't. Jonathan looked at Wetzel's face. Then he rose to his knees, as said Wetzel, and tightened his belt. He knew that in another instant they would be speeding away through the forest. Lou, my rifle's no good for that distance. But maybe yours is. You ought to know. It's not sense, because there's Simon Gertie and there's Jim. The men were after if you can hit one, you can another. But go ahead, Lou, plug that cowardly redskin. Wetzel knelt on one knee and thrust the black barrel forward through the fern leaves. Slowly the fatal barrel rose to a level and became as motionless as the immovable stones. Jonathan fixed his keen gaze on the haughty countenance of Half King as he stood with folded arms and scornful mien in front of the Christians he had just condemned. Even as the short stinging crack of Wetzel's rifle broke the silence, 
Jonathan saw the fierce expression of Half King's dark face change to one of vacant wildness. His arms never relaxed from their folded position. He fell as falls a monarch of the forest trees, a dead weight. End of chapter twenty four of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter twenty five of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Leonard Wilson. Chapter twenty five. Please do not preach today, said Nell raising her eyes imploringly to jem's face nelly i must conduct the services as usual i cannot shirk my duty nor let these renegades see i fear to face them i have such a queer feeling i am afraid i don't want to be left alone please do not leave me jem strode nervously up and down the length of the room nell's worn face her beseeching eyes and trembling hands touched his heart rather than almost anything else he desired to please her to strengthen her yet how could he shirk his duty nelly what is it you fear he asked holding her hands tightly oh i don't know what everything uncle is growing weaker every day look at mr young he is only a shadow of his former self and this anxiety is wearing mr heckwelder out he is more concerned than he dares admit you needn't shake your head for i know it then those indians who are waiting waiting for god only knows what worse than all to me i saw that renegade that fearful beast who made away with poor dear kate nell burst into tears and leaned sobbing on jem's shoulder nell i've kept my courage only because of you replied jem his voice trembling slightly she looked up quickly something in the pale face which was bent over her told that now if ever was the time for a woman to forget herself and to cheer to inspire those around her i am a silly baby and selfish she cried freeing herself from his hold always thinking of myself she turned away and wiped the tears from her eyes go jim do your duty i'll stand by and help you all a woman can the missionaries were consulting in Heckwelder's cabin. Zeisberger had returned that morning, and his aggressive, dominating spirit was just what they needed in an hour like this. He raised the downcast spirits of the ministers. "'Hold the service, I should say we will,' he declared, waving his hands. "'What have we to be afraid of?' "'I do not know,' answered Heckwelder, shaking his head doubtfully. "'I do not know what to fear.' Gertie himself told me he bore us no ill will, but I hardly believe him. All this silence, this ominous waiting perplexes, bewilders me. Gentlemen, our duty at least is plain, said Jem impressively. The faith of these Christian Indians in us is so absolute that they have no fear. They believe in God and in us. These threatening savages have failed signally to impress our Christians if we do not hold the service they will think we fear gertie and that might have a bad influence i am in favor of postponing the preaching for a few days i tell you i am afraid of gertie's indians not for myself but for these christians whom we love so well i am afraid heckwelder's face bore testimony to his anxious dread you are our leader we have but to obey said edwards yet i think we owe it to our converts to stick to our work until we are forced by violence to desist ah what form will that violence take cried heckwelder his face white you cannot tell what these savages mean i fear i fear listen heckwelder you must remember we had this to go through once before put in zeisberger earnestly in seventy eight gertie came down on us like a wolf on the fold he had not so many indians at his beck and call as now but he harangued for days trying to scare us and our handful of christians he set his drunken fiends to frighten us and he failed we stuck it out and won he's trying the same game let us stand against him and hold our services as usual we should trust in god 
Never give up, cried Jim. Gentlemen, you are right. You shame me, even though I feel that I understand the situation and its dread possibilities better than any one of you. Whatever befalls, we'll stick to our post. I thank you for reviving the spirit in my cowardly heart. We will hold the service today as usual, and to make it more impressive, each shall address the congregation in turn. "'And if need be, we will give our lives for our Christians,' said Young, raising his pale face. The deep, mellow peals of the church bell awoke the slumbering echoes. Scarcely had its melody died away in the forest, when a line of Indians issued from the church and marched toward the maple grove. Men, women, youths, maidens, and children. Glickikon, the old Delaware chief, headed the line. His step was firm, his head erect, his face calm in its noble austerity. His followers likewise expressed in their countenances the steadfastness of their belief. The maiden's heads were bowed, but with shyness, not fear. The children were happy, their bright faces expressive of the joy they felt in the anticipation of listening to their beloved teachers. This procession passed between rows of painted savages, standing immovable, with folded arms and somber eyes. No sooner had the Christians reached the maple grove, when from all over the clearing appeared hostile Indians, who took positions near the knoll where the missionaries stood. Eckewelder's faithful little band awaited him on the platform. The converted Indians seated themselves as usual at the foot of the knoll. The other savages crowded closely on both sides. They carried their weapons, and maintained the same silence that had so singularly marked their mood of the last twenty-four hours. No human skill could have divined their intention. This coldness might be only habitual reserve, and it might be anything else. Heckewelder approached at the same time that Simon Gertie and his band of renegades appeared. With the renegades were Pipe and Half King. These two came slowly across the clearing, passed through the opening in the crowd, and stopped close to the platform. Heckwelder went hurriedly up to his missionaries. He seemed beside himself with excitement, and spoke with difficulty. "'Do not preach today. I have been warned again,' he said in a low voice. "'Do you forbid it?' inquired Edwards. "'No, no, I have not that authority, but I implore it. Wait, wait until the Indians are in a better mood.' Edwards left the group, and, stepping upon the platform, faced the Christians. At the same moment, Half-King stalked majestically from before his party. He carried no weapon save a black, knotted war-club. A surging forward of the crowd of savages behind him showed the intense interest which his action had aroused. He walked forward until he stood halfway between the platform and the converts. He ran his evil glance slowly over the Christians, and then rested it upon Edwards. Half King's orders are to be obeyed. Let the pale face keep his mouth closed, he cried in the Indian tongue. The imperious command came as a thunderbolt from a clear sky. The missionaries behind Edwards stood bewildered, awaiting the outcome. But Edwards, without a moment's hesitation, calmly lifted his hand and spoke. Beloved Christians, we meet today as we have met before, as we hope to meet in Spain. The whistling of a bullet over the heads of the Christians accompanied the loud report of a rifle. All present plainly heard the leaden missile strike. Edwards wheeled, clutching his side, breathed hard, and then fell heavily without uttering a cry. He had been shot by an Indian concealed in the thicket. For a moment no one moved nor spoke. The missionaries were stricken with horror. The converts seemed turned to stone and the hostile throng waited silently, as they had for hours. "'He shot! He shot! Oh, I feared this!' cried Heckewelder, running forward. The missionaries followed him. Edwards was lying on his back, with the bloody hand pressed to his side. "'Dave! Dave! How is it with you?' asked Heckewelder, in a voice low with fear. "'Not bad. It's too far out to be bad. But it knocked me over,' answered Edwards weakly. Give me water. They carried him from the platform and laid him on the grass under a tree. Young pressed Edward's hand. 
he murmured something that sounded like a prayer and then walked straight upon the platform as he raised his face which was sublime with white light pale face back roared half king as he waved his war club you indian dog be silent young's clear voice rolled out on the quiet air so imperiously so powerful in its wonderful scorn and passion that the hostile savages were overcome by awe and the christians thrilled anew with reverential love young spoke again in a voice which had lost its passion and was singularly sweet in its richness beloved christians if it is god's will that we must die to prove our faith then as we have taught you how to live so we can show you how to die Spang! again a whistling sound came with the bellow of an overcharged rifle again the sickening thud of a bullet striking flesh young fell backwards from the platform the missionaries laid him beside edwards and then stood in shuddering silence a smile shone on young's pale face a stream of dark blood welled from his breast his lips moved he whispered i ask no more god's will jim looked down once at his brother missionaries then with blanched face but resolute and stern he marched toward the platform heckwelder ran after him and dragged him back no 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 my god would you be killed oh i tried to prevent this cried heckwelder wringing his hands one long fierce exultant yell pealed throughout the grove it came from those silent breasts in which was pent up hatred it greeted the action which proclaimed victory over the missionaries all eyes turned on half king with measured stride he paced to and fro before the christian indians neither cowering nor shrinking marked their manner to a man to a child they rose with proud mien heads erect and eyes flashing this mighty chief with his bloodthirsty crew could burn the village of peace could annihilate the christians but he could never change their hope and trust in god blinded fools cried half king the huron is wise he tells no lies many moons ago he told the christians they were sitting halfway between two angry gods who stood with mouths open wide and looking ferociously at each other if they did not move back out of the road they would be ground to powder by the teeth of one or the other or both half king urged them to leave the peaceful village to forget the pale-faced god to take their horses and flocks and return to their homes the christians scorned the huron king's counsel the sun has set for the village of peace the time has come pipe and the huron are powerful they will not listen to the pale-faced god they will burn the village of peace death to the christians half king threw the black war club with a passionate energy on the grass before the indians they heard this decree of death with unflinching front even the children were quiet not a face paled not an eye was lowered half king cast their doom in their teeth the christians eyed him with unspoken scorn my god my god it is worse than i thought moaned heckwelder utter ruin murder murder in the momentary silence which followed his outburst a tiny cloud of blue-white smoke came from the ferns overhanging a cliff crack all heard the shot of a rifle all noticed the difference between its clear ringing intonation and the loud reports of the other two all distinctly heard the zip of a bullet as it whistled over their heads all no not all one did not hear that speeding bullet he who was the central figure in this tragic scene he who had doomed the christians might have seen that tiny puff of smoke which heralded his own doom but before the ringing report could reach his ears a small blue hole appeared as if by magic over his left eye and pulse and sense and life had fled forever half king great cruel chieftain stood still for an instant as if he had been an image of stone his haughty head lost its erect poise the fierceness seemed to fade from his dark face 
his proud plume waved gracefully as he swayed to and fro and then fell before the christians inert and lifeless no one moved it was as if no one breathed the superstitious savages awaited fearfully another rifle shot another lightning stroke another visitation from the pale-faces god but jim girty with the cunning born of his terrible fear had recognized the ring of that rifle he had felt the zip of a bullet which could just as readily have found his brain as half kings he had stood there as fair a mark as the cruel huron yet the avenger had not chosen him was he reserved for a different fate was not such a death too merciful for the frontier death's head he yelled in his craven fear la van de la mort the well-known dreaded appellation aroused the savages from a fearful stupor into a fierce manifestation of hatred a tremendous yell rent the air instantly the scene changed End of chapter twenty five of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter twenty six of the spirit of the border by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson chapter twenty six in the confusion the missionaries carried young and edwards into mr wells cabin nell's calm white face showed that she had expected some such catastrophe as this but she of all was the least excited Eckwalder left them at the cabin and hurried away to consult Captain Williamson, while Seisberger, who was skilled in surgery, attended to the wounded men. Jim barred the heavy door, shut the rude swinging windows, and made the cabin temporarily a refuge from prowling savages. Outside the clamor increased. Shrill yells rent the air. Long rolling war cries sounded above all the din. The measured stamp of moccasined feet the rush of indians past the cabin the dull thud of hatchets struck hard into the trees all attested to the excitement of the savages and the imminence of terrible danger in the front room of mr wells cabin edwards lay on a bed his face turned to the wall and his side exposed there was a bloody hole in his white skin seisberger was probing for the bullet he had no instruments save those of his own manufacture, and they were darning needles with bent points and a long knife blade ground thin. There, I have it, said Zeisberger. Hold still, Dave. There. As Edwards moaned, Zeisberger drew forth the bloody bullet. Jim, wash and rest this wound. It isn't bad. Dave will be all right in a couple of days. Now I look at George. Zeisberger hurried into the other room. Young lay with quiet face and closed eyes, breathing faintly. Zeisberger opened the wounded man's shirt and exposed the wound, which was on the right side, rather high up. Nell, who had followed Zeisberger that she might be of some assistance if needed, saw him look at the wound and then turn a pale face away for a second. That hurried, shuddering movement of the sober, practical missionary was most significant. Then he bent over Young and inserted one of the probes into the wound. He pushed the steel an inch, two, three, four inches into Young's breast, but the latter neither moved nor moaned. Zeisberger shook his head and finally removed the instrument. He raised the sufferer's shoulder to find the bed saturated with blood. The bullet wound extended completely through the missionary's body and was bleeding from the back. Zeisberger folded strips of linsey cloth into small pads and bound them tightly over both apertures of the wound. "'How is he?' asked Jim, when the amateur surgeon returned to the other room and proceeded to wash the blood from his hands. Zeisberger shook his head gloomily. "'How is George?' whispered Edwards, who had heard Jim's question. "'Shut through the right lung. Human skill cannot aid him.' Only God can save. Did I hear a third shot? whispered Dave, gazing round with sad, questioning eyes. Heckwelder? He's safe. He has gone to see Williamson. 
you did hear a third shot half king fell dead with a bullet over his left eye he had just folded his arms in a grand pose after his death decree to the christians judgment of god it does seem so but it came in the form of leaden death from wetzel's unerring rifle do you hear all that yelling half king's death has set the indians wild there was a gentle knock at the door and then the word open in heckwalder's voice jim unbarred the door heckwalder came in carrying over his shoulder what apparently was a sack of meal he was accompanied by young christy heckwalder put the bag down opened it and lifted out a little indian boy the child gazed round with fearful eyes say binny say binny he cried running to nell and she clasped him closely in her arms heckwalder's face was like marble as he asked concerning edward's condition i'm not badly off said the missionary with a smile how's george whispered heckwalder no one answered him zeisberger raised his hands all followed heckwalder into the other room where young lay in the same position as when first brought in heckwalder stood gazing down into the wan face with its terribly significant smile i brought him out here i persuaded him to come whispered heckwalder oh almighty god he cried his voice broke and his prayer ended with the mute eloquence of clasped hands and uplifted appealing face come out said zeisberger leading him into the larger room the others followed and jim closed the door what's to be done said zeisberger with his practical common sense what did williamson say tell us what you learned wait directly answered heckwalder sitting down and covering his face with his hands there was a long silence at length he raised his white face and spoke calmly gentlemen the village of peace is doomed i entreated captain williamson to help us but he refused said he dared not interfere i prayed that he would speak at least a word to gertie but he denied my request where are the converts imprisoned in the church every one of them except benny mr christie and i hid the child in the meal sack and were thus able to get him here we must save him save him asked nell looking from heckwalder to the trembling indian boy nelly the savages have driven all our christians into the church and shut them up there until gertie and his men shall give the word to complete their fiendish design the converts ask but one favor an hour in which to pray it was granted the savages intend to murder them all oh horrible monstrous cried nell how can they be so inhuman she lifted benny up in her arms they'll never get you my boy we'll save you i'll save you the child moaned and clung to her neck they are scouring the clearing now for christians and will search all the cabins i'm positive will they come here asked nell turning her blazing eyes on heckwalder undoubtedly we must try to hide benny let me think where would be a good place we'll try a dark corner of the loft no no cried nell put benny in young's bed suggested jim no no cried nell put him in a bucket and let him down in the well whispered edwards who had listened intently to the conversation that's a capital place said heckwalder but might he not fall out and drown tie him in the bucket said jim no 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 cried nell but nelly we must decide upon a hiding place and in a hurry i'll save benny you will you stay here to face those men jim gertie and deering are searching the cabins could you bear it to see them you couldn't oh no i believe it would kill me that man that beast will he come here nell grew ghastly pale and looked as if about to faint she shrunk in horror at the thought of again facing gertie for god's sake heckwalder won't don't let him see me don't let him come in don't even as the imploring voice ceased a heavy thump sounded on the door who's there demanded heckwalder thump thump the heavy blows shook the cabin the pans rattled on the shelves 
No answer came from without. Quick, hide Benny. It's as much as our lives are worth to have him found here, cried Heckwelder in a fierce whisper as he darted toward the door. All right, all right, in a moment, he called out, fumbling over the bar. He opened the door a moment later, and when Jim Girty and Deering entered, he turned to his friends with a dread uncertainty in his haggard face. Edwards lay on the bed with wide-open eyes, staring at the intruders. Mr. Wells sat with bowed head. Zeisberger calmly whittled a stick, and Jim stood bolt upright with a hard light in his eyes. Nell leans against the side of a heavy table. Wonderful was the change that had transformed her from a timid, appealing, fear-agonized girl to a woman whose only evidences of unusual excitement were the flame in her eyes and the peculiar whiteness of her face. Benny was gone. Heckwelder's glance returned to the visitors. He thought he had never seen such brutal, hideous men. Well, I reckon a preacher ain't a goin' to lie. Have you seen any Injun Christians round here? asked Gertie, waving a heavy sledgehammer. Gertie, we have hidden no Indians here, answered Heckwelder calmly. Well, we'll have a look anyway, answered the renegade. Gertie surveyed the room with wolfish eyes. Deering was so drunk that he staggered. Both men, in fact, reeked with the vile fumes of rum. Without another word, they proceeded to examine the room by looking into every box, behind a stone oven, and in the cupboard. They drew the bedclothes from the bed, and with a kick demolished a pile of stove-wood. Then the ruffians passed into the other apartments, where they could be heard making thorough search. At length both returned to the large room, where Gertie directed Deering to climb a ladder leading to the loft. But because Deering was too much under the influence of liquor to do so, he had to go himself. He rummaged around up there for a few minutes, and then came down. "'Well, I reckon you wasn't lying about it,' said Gertie, with his ghastly leer. He and his companion started to go out. Deering had stood with bloodshot eyes fixed on Nell, while Gertie searched the loft, and as they passed the girl on their way to the open air, the renegade looked at Gertie as he motioned with his head toward her. His besotted face expressed some terrible meaning. Gertie had looked at Nell when he first entered, but had not glanced twice at her. As he turned now before going out of the door, he fixed on her his baleful glance. His aspect was more full of meaning than could have been any words. A horrible power of which he was boastfully conscious shone from his little pointed eyes. His mere presence was deadly. Plainly, as if he had spoken, was the significance of his long gaze. Anyone could have translated that look. Once before Nell had faced it, and fainted when its dread meaning grew clear to her. But now she returned his gaze with one in which flashed lightning scorn and repulsion, in which glowed a wonderful defiance. The cruel face of this man, the boastful barbarity of his manner, the long, dark, bloody history which his presence recalled, was indeed terrifying without the added horror of his intent toward her. But now the self-forgetfulness of a true woman sustained her. Gertie and Deering backed out of the door. Heckewelder closed it and dropped the bar in place. Nell fell over the table with a long, low gasp. Then with one hand she lifted her skirt. Benny walked from under it. His big eyes were bright. The young woman clasped him again in her arms. Then she released him, and laboring under intense excitement ran to the window. There he goes! Oh, the horrible beast! If I only had a gun and could shoot! Oh, if only I were a man, I'd kill him! To think of poor Kate! Ah, he intends the same for me! Suddenly she fell upon the floor in a faint. Mr. Wells and Jim lifted her on the bed beside Edwards, where they endeavored to revive her. It was some moments before she opened her eyes. Jim sat holding Nell's hand. Mr. Wells again bowed his head. Zeisberger continued to whittle a stick, and Heckwelder paced the floor. Christie stood by with every evidence of sympathy for this distracted group. Outside, the clamor increased. "'Just listen!' cried Heckwelder. "'Did you ever hear the like? All drunk, crazy, fiendish! 
they drank every drop of liquor the french traders had curses on the vagabond dealers rum has made these renegades and savages wild oh my poor innocent christians eckwelder leaned his head against the mantel-shelf he had broken down at last racking sobs shook his frame are you all right again asked jim of nell yes i am going out first to see williamson and then the christians he said rising very pale but calm don't go cried heckwelder i've tried everything it was all of no use i will go answered jim yes jim go whispered nell looking up into his eyes it was an earnest gaze in which a faint hope shone jim unbarred the door and went out wait i'll go along cried zeisberger suddenly dropping his knife and stick as the two men went out a fearful spectacle met their eyes the clearing was alive with indians but such indians they were painted demons maddened by rum yesterday they had been silent if they moved at all it had been with deliberation and dignity Today they were a yelling running blood-seeking mob awful did you ever see human beings like these asked zeisberger no no i saw such a frenzy once before but of course only in a small band of savages many times have i seen indians preparing for the warpath in search of both white men and redskins they were fierce then but nothing like this every one of these frenzied fiends is honest think of that every man feels it his duty to murder these christians gertie has led up to this by cunning and now the time is come to let them loose it means death for all i have given up any thought of escaping said zeisberger with the calmness that had characterized his manner since he returned to the village i shall try to get into the church i'll join you there as soon as i see williamson jim walked rapidly across the clearing to the cabin where captain williamson had quarters the frontiersmen stood in groups watching the savages with an interest which showed little or no concern i want to see captain williamson said jim to a frontiersman on guard at the cabin door well he's inside drawled the man jim thought the voice familiar and he turned sharply to see the sunburnt features of jeff flynn the old riverman who had taken mr wells party to fort henry why len i'm glad to see you exclaimed jim pretty fair to middlin answered jeff extending his big hand say how's the other one your brother as was called joe i don't know he ran off with wetzel was captured by indians and when i last heard of him he had married wingenan's daughter well i'll be doggone jeff shook his grizzled head and slapped his leg i just knowed he'd raise something i'm in a hurry do you think captain williamson will stand still and let all this go on i'm afeard so evidently the captain heard the conversation for he appeared at the cabin door smoking a long pipe captain williamson i've come to entreat you to save the christians from this impending massacre i can't do nothing answered williamson removing his pipe to puff forth a great cloud of smoke but you have eighty men here if we interfered pipe would eat us alive in three minutes you preacher fellows don't understand this thing you got pipe and gertie to deal with if you don't know them you'll be better acquainted by sundown i don't care who they are drunken ruffians and savages that's enough will you help us we are men of your own race and we come to you for help can you withhold it i won't have nothing to do with this business the chiefs have condemned the village and it'll have to go if you fellers had been careful no white blood would have been spilled i advise you all to lay low till it's over will you let me speak to your men to try and get them to follow me heckwelder asked that same thing he was persistent and i took a vote for him just to show how my men stood eighteen of them said they'd follow him the rest wouldn't interfere eighteen my god cried jim voicing the passion which consumed him you are white men yet you will stand by and see these innocent people murdered man where's your humanity your manhood these converted indians are savages no longer they are christians their children are as good pure 
innocent as your own can you remain idle and see these little ones murdered williams had made no answer the men who had crowded round were equally silent not one lowered his head many looked at the impassioned missionary others gazed at the savages who were circling around the trees brandishing their weapons if any pitied the unfortunate christians none showed it they were indifferent with the indifference of men hardened to cruel scenes jim understood at last as he turned from face to face to find everywhere that same imperturbability these bordermen were like wetzel and jonathan zane the only good indian was a dead indian years of war and bloodshed of merciless cruelty at the hands of red men of the hard border life had rendered these frontiersmen incapable of compassion for any savage jim no longer restrained himself bordermen you may be but from my standpoint from any man's from god's you are a lot of coldly indifferent cowards exclaimed jim with white quivering lips i understand now few of you will risk anything for indians you will not believe a savage can be a christian you don't care if they are all murdered any man among you any man i say would step out before those howling fiends and boldly demand that there be no bloodshed a courageous leader with a band of determined followers could avert this tragedy you might readily intimidate yonder horde of drunken demons captain williamson i am only a minister far removed from a man of war and leader as you claim to be but sir i curse you as a miserable coward if i ever get back to civilization i'll brand this inhuman coldness of yours as the most infamous and dastardly cowardice that ever disgraced a white man you are worse than gertie williamson turned a sickly yellow he fumbled a second with the handle of his tomahawk but made no answer the other bordermen maintained the same careless composure what to them was the raving of a bad preacher jim saw it and turned baffled fiercely angry and hopeless as he walked away jeff lynn took his arm and after they were clear of the crowd of frontiersmen he said young fellow you give him pepper no mistake and maybe you're right from your side of the fence but you can't see the injuns from our side we hunters haven't much humanity i reckon that's what you called it but we've lost so many friends and relatives and heard of so many murders by the red east that we look on all of em as wild varmints that should be killed on sight now maybe it'll interest you to know i was the feller who took the vote williamson told you about and i did it cause i had an interest in you i was watching you when edwards and the other missionary got shot i like grit in a man and i seen you had it clear through so when heckwelder comes over i talked to the fellers and all i could get interested was eighteen but they wanted to fight simply for fightin's sake now old jeff lynn is your friend you just lay low until this is over jim thanked the old riverman and left him he hardly knew which way to turn he would make one more effort he crossed the clearing to where the renegade's teepee stood mckee and elliott were sitting on a log simon gertie stood beside them his hard keen roving eyes on the scene the missionary was impressed by the white leader there was a difference in his aspect a wilder look than the others wore as if the man had suddenly awakened to the fury of his indians nevertheless the young man went straight toward him gertie i come get out you meddling preacher yelled the renegade shaking his fist at jim simon gertie was drunk jim turned from the white fiends he knew his life to them was not worth a pinch of powder lost lost all lost he exclaimed in despair as he went toward the church he saw hundreds of savages bounding over the grass brandishing weapons and whooping fiendishly they were concentrating around gertie's teepee where already a great throng had congregated of all the indians to be seen not one walked they leaped by jim and ran over the grass nimble as deer he saw the eager fire in their dusky eyes and the cruelly clenched teeth like those of wolves when they snarl he felt the hissing breath of many savages as they raced by him more than one whirled a tomahawk close to jim's head 
and uttered horrible yells in his ear. They were like tigers lusting for blood. Jim hurried to the church. Not an Indian was visible near the log structure. Even the savage guards had gone. He entered the open door, to be instantly struck with reverence and awe. The Christians were singing. Miserable and full of sickening dread, though Jim was, he could not but realize that the scene before him was one of extraordinary beauty and pathos. The doomed Indians lifted up their voices in song. Never had they sung so feelingly, so harmoniously. When the song ended, Zeisberger, who stood upon a platform, opened his Bible and read, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. In a voice low and tremulous, the venerable missionary began his sermon. The shadow of death hovered over these Christian martyrs. It was reflected in their somber eyes, yet not one was sullen or sad. The children who were too young to understand, but instinctively feeling the tragedy soon to be enacted there, cowered close to their mothers. Zeisberger preached a touching and impressive, though short, sermon. At its conclusion the whole congregation rose and surrounded the missionary. The men shook his hands, the women kissed them, the children clung to his legs. It was a wonderful manifestation of affection. Suddenly Glickikan, the old Delaware chief, stepped on the platform, raised his hand, and shouted one Indian word. A long, low wail went up from the children and youths. The women slowly, meekly bowed their heads. The men, due to the stoicism of their nature and the Christianity they had learned, stood proudly erect, awaiting the death that had been decreed. Likikan pulled the bell rope. A deep, mellow tone pealed out. The sound transfixed all the Christians. No one moved. Glickikon had given the signal, which told the murderers the Christians were ready. "'Come, man, my God, we can't stay here,' cried Jim to Zeisberger. As they went out, both men turned to look their last on the martyrs. The death knell which had rung in the ears of the Christians was to them the voice of God. Stern, dark visages of men and the sweet, submissive faces of women were uplifted with rapt attention. A light seemed to shine from these faces, as if the contemplation of God had illumined them. As Iceberger and Jim left the church and hurried toward the cabins, they saw the crowd of savages in a black mass round Gertie's teepee. The yelling and leaping had ceased. Heckwelder opened the door. Evidently he had watched for them. "'Jim, Jim!' cried Nell when he entered the cabin. "'Oh, I was afraid!' Oh, I'm glad you're back safe. See, this noble Indian has come to help us. Wingenund stood calm and erect by the door. Chief, what will you do? Wingenund will show you the way to the big river, answered the chieftain in his deep bass. Run away? No, never. That would be cowardly. Heckwelder, you would not go, nor you, Zeisberger. We may yet be of use. We may yet save some of the Christians. Save the yellow hair, sternly said Wingenund. Oh, Jem, you don't understand. The chief has come to warn me of Gertie. He intends to take me as he has others, as he did poor Kate. Did you not see the meaning in his eyes today? How they scorched me. Oh, Jem, take me away. Save me. Do not leave me here to that horrible fate. Oh, Jem, take me away. Now... I will take you, cried Jim, grasping her hands. Hurry, there's a blanket full of things I packed for you, said Heckwalder. Lose no time. Ah, hear that. My heavens, what a yell. Heckwalder rushed to the door and looked out. There they go, a black mob of imps, a pack of hungry wolves. Jim Gertie is in the lead. How he leaps, how he waves his sledge. He leads the savages toward the church. Oh, it's the end. Benny, where's Benny? cried Jim, hurriedly lacing the hunting coat he had flung about him. Benny's safe. I've hidden him. I'll get him away from here, answered young Christie. Go, now's your time. God speed you. 
I'm ready, declared Mr. Wells. I have finished. There goes Wingenund. He's running. Follow him quick. Good-bye. Good-bye. God be with you, cried Heckwelder. Good-bye. Good-bye. Jim hurried Nell toward the bushes where Wingenund's tall form could dimly be seen. Mr. Wells followed them. On the edge of the clearing, Jim and Nell turned to look back. They saw a black mass of yelling, struggling, fighting savages crowding around the church. Oh, Jim, look back! Look back! cried Nell, holding hard to his hand. Look back! See if Gertie is coming! End of chapter 26 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter twenty seven of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter twenty seven. At last the fugitives breathed free under the gold and red cover of the woods. Never speaking, never looking back, the guide hurried eastward with long strides. His followers were almost forced to run in order to keep him in sight. He had waited at the edge of the clearing for them, and relieving Jim of the heavy pack, which he swung lightly over his shoulder, he set a pace that was most difficult to maintain. The young missionary half led, half carried Nell over the stones and rough places. Mr. Wells labored in the rear. "'Oh, Jim, look back! Look back! See if we are pursued!' cried Nell frequently, with many a fearful glance into the dense thickets. The Indian took a straight course through the woods. He leaped the brooks, climbed the rough ridges, and swiftly trod the glades that were free of windfalls. His hurry and utter disregard for the plain trail left behind proved his belief in the necessity of placing many miles between the fugitives and the village of peace. Evidently they would be followed, and it would be a waste of valuable time to try to conceal their trail. Gradually the ground began to rise, the way became more difficult, but Wingenund never slackened his pace. Nell was strong, supple, and light of foot. She held her own with Jem, but time and time again they were obliged to wait for her uncle. Once he was far behind. Wingenund halted for them at the height of a ridge where the forest was open. Urn, exclaimed the chief, as they finished the ascent. He stretched a long arm toward the sun. His falcon eye gleamed. Far in the west, a great black and yellow cloud of smoke rolled heavenward. It seemed to rise from out the forest and to hang low over the trees. Then it soared aloft and grew thinner until it lost its distinct line far in the clouds. The setting sun stood yet an hour high over a distant hill and burned dark red through the great pall of smoke. "'Is it a forest fire?' asked Nell fearfully. "'Fire, of course, but—' Jim did not voice his fear. He looked closely at Wingenund. The chieftain stood silent a moment, as was his wont when addressed. The dull glow of the sun was reflected in the dark eyes that gazed far away over forest and field. "'Fire,' said Wingenund, and it seemed that as he spoke a sterner shadow flitted across his bronzed face. The sun sets to-night over the ashes of the village of peace. He resumed his rapid march eastward. With never a backward glance the saddened party followed. Nell kept close beside Jim, and the old man tramped after them with bowed head. The sun set, but Wingenund never slackened his stride. Twilight deepened, yet he kept on. Indian, we can go no further tonight. We must rest, cried Jim, as Nell stumbled against him, and Mr. Wells panted wearily in the rear. Rest soon, replied the chief, and kept on. Darkness had settled down when Wingenund at last halted. The fugitives could see little in the gloom, but they heard the music of running water and felt soft moss beneath their feet. They sank wearily down upon a projecting stone. The moss was restful to their tired limbs. Opening the pack, they found food with which to satisfy the demands of hunger. 
then close under the stone the fugitive sank into slumber while the watchful indian stood silent and motionless jim thought he had but just closed his eyes when he felt a gentle pressure on his arm day is here said the indian jim opened his eyes to see the bright red sun crimsoning the eastern hills and streaming gloriously over the colored forests he raised himself on his elbow to look around nell was still asleep the blanket was tucked close to her chin her chestnut hair was tumbled like a schoolgirl's she looked as fresh and sweet as the morning nell nell wake up said jim thinking the while how he would love to kiss those white eyelids nell's eyes opened wide a smile lay deep in their hazel shadows where am i oh i remember she cried sitting up oh jim i had such a sweet dream i was at home with mother and kate oh to wake and find it all a dream i am fleeing for life but jim we are safe are we not another day and we'll be safe let us fly she cried leaping up and shaking out her crumpled skirt uncle come mr wells lay quietly with his mild blue eyes smiling up at her he neither moved nor spoke eat drink said the chief opening the pack what a beautiful place exclaimed nell taking the bread and meat handed to her this is a lovely little glade look at those golden flowers the red and purple leaves the brown shining moss and those lichen covered stones why someone has camped here see the little cave the screens of plaited ferns and the stone fireplace it seems to me this dark spring and those gracefully spreading branches are familiar said jim beautiful spring interposed wingenund yes i know this place cried nell excitedly i remember this glade though it was moonlight when i saw it here wetzel rescued me from gertie nell you're right replied jim how strange we should run across this place again strange fate indeed which had brought them again to beautiful spring it was destined that the great scenes of their lives were to be enacted in this mossy glade come uncle you're lazy cried nell a touch of her old roguishness making playful her voice mr wells lay still and smiled up at them you are not ill cried nell seeing for the first time how pallid was his face dear nelly i am not ill i do not suffer but i am dying he answered again with that strange sweet smile oh breathed nell falling on her knees no no mr wells you're only weak you will be all right again soon cried jim jim nelly i have known all night i have lain here wakeful my heart never was strong it gave out yesterday and now it is slowly growing weaker put your hand on my breast feel ah you see my life is flickering god's will be done i am content my work is finished my only regret is that i brought you out to this terrible borderland but i did not know if only i could see you safe from the peril of this wilderness at home happy married nell bent over him blinded by her tears unable to see or speak crushed by this last overwhelming blow jim sat on the other side of the old missionary holding his hand for many moments neither spoke they glanced at the pale face watching with eager wistful eyes for a smile or listening for a word come said the indian nell slowly pointed toward her uncle he is dying whispered jim to the indian go leave me murmured mr wells you are still in danger we'll not leave you cried jim no 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 sobbed nell bending over to kiss him nelly may i marry you to jim whispered mr wells into her ear he has told me how it is with him 
He loves you, Nellie. I'd die happier knowing I'd left you with him. Even at that moment, with her heart almost breaking, Nell's fair face flushed. Nell, will you marry me? asked Jim softly. Low though it was, he had heard Mr. Wells whisper. Nell stretched a little trembling hand over her uncle to Jim, who enclosed it in his own. Her eyes met his. Through her tears shone faintly a light, which but for the agony that made it dim would have beamed radiant. Find a place, said Mr. Wells, handing Jim a Bible. It was the one he always carried in his pocket. With trembling hand, Jim turned the leaves. At last he found the lines and handed the book back to the old man. Simple, sweet, and sad was that marriage service. Nell and Jim knelt with hands clasped over Mr. Wells. The old missionary's voice was faint. Nell's responses were low, and Jim answered with deep and tender feeling. Beside them stood Wingenund, a dark, magnificent figure. There, may God bless you, murmured Mr. Wells, with a happy smile, closing the Bible. Nell, my wife, whispered Jim, kissing her hand. Come, broke in Wingenund's voice, deep, strong, like that of a bell. Not one of them had observed the chief as he stood erect, motionless, poised like a stag scenting the air. His dark eyes seemed to pierce the purple-golden forest. His keen ears seemed to drink in the singing of the birds and the gentle rustling of leaves. Native to these haunts as were the wild creatures, they were no quicker than the Indian to feel the approach of foes. The breeze had borne faint, suspicious sounds. Keep the Bible, said Mr. Wells. Remember its word. His hand closely clasped Nell's, and then suddenly loosened. His pallid face was lighted by a meaning, tender smile, which slowly faded, faded, and was gone. The venerable head fell back. The old missionary was dead. Nell kissed the pale, cold brow, and then rose, half-dazed and shuddering. Jim was vainly trying to close the dead man's eyes. She could no longer look. On rising, she found herself near the Indian chief. He took her fingers in his great hand and held them with a strong, warm pressure. Strangely thrilled, she looked up at Wingenund. His somber eyes, fixed piercingly on the forest, and his dark, stern face were, as always, inscrutable. No compassion shown there, no emotion unbefitting a chieftain, would ever find expression in that cold face. But Nell felt a certain tenderness in this Indian, a response in his great heart, felt it so surely, so powerfully, that she leaned her head against him. She knew he was her friend. Come, said the chief once more. He gently put Nell aside before Jem arose from his sad task. We cannot leave him unburied, expostulated Jem. Wingenund dragged aside a large stone which formed one wall of the cavern. Then he grasped a log which was half covered by dirt, and exerting his great strength, pulled it from its place. There was a crash, a rumble, the jar of a heavy weight striking the earth, then the rattling of gravel. And before Nell and Jim realized what had happened, the great rock forming the roof of the cavern slipped down the bank, followed by a small avalanche. The cavern was completely covered. Mr. Wells was buried. A mossy stone marked the old missionary's grave. Nell and Jim were lost in wonder and awe. Ah! cried the chief, looking toward the opening in the glade. Fearfully Nell and Jim turned to be appalled by four naked painted savages standing with leveled rifles. Behind them stood Deering and Jim Gertie. Oh! God, we are lost, 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 exclaimed Jim, unable to command himself. Hope died in his heart. No cry issued from Nell's white lips. She was dazed by this final blow. Having endured so much, this last misfortune, apparently the ruin of her life, brought no added suffering, 
only a strange, numb feeling. Aha! Thought you'd give me you the slip, eh? croaked Gertie, striding forward, and as he looked at Wingenund, his little yellow eyes flared like flint. Does a wolf befriend Gertie's captives? Chief, you have led me a hard chase. Wingenund deigned no reply. He stood as he did so often, still and silent, with folded arms, and a look that was haughty, unresponsive. The Indians came forward into the glade, and one of them quickly bound Jim's hands behind his back. The savages wore a wild, brutish look. A feverish ferocity, very near akin to insanity, possessed them. They were not quiet a moment, but ran here and there for no apparent reason, except possibly to keep in action with the raging fire in their hearts. The cleanliness which characterized the normal Indian was absent in them. Their scant buckskin dress was bedraggled and stained. They were still drunk with rum and the lust for blood. Murder gleamed from the glance of their eyes. "'Jake, come over here,' said Gertie to his renegade friend. "'Ain't she a prize?' Gertie and Deering stood before the poor stricken girl and gloated over her fair beauty. She stood as when first transfixed by the horror from which she had been fleeing. Her pale face was lowered, her hands clenched tightly in the folds of her skirt. Never before had two such coarse, cruel fiends as Deering and Gertie encumbered the earth. Even on the border where the best men were bad, they were the worst. Deering was yet drunk, but Gertie had recovered somewhat from the effects of the rum he had absorbed. The former rolled his big eyes and nodded his shaggy head. He was passing judgment from his point of view, on the fine points of the girl. She certainly is, he declared with a grin. She's the little beauty. Beats any I ever seen. Jim Gertie stroked his sharp chin with dirty fingers. His yellow eyes, his burnt saffron skin, his hooked nose, his thin lips, all his evil face seemed to shine with an evil triumph. To look at him was painful. To have him gaze at her was enough to drive any woman mad. Dark stains spotted the bright frills of his gaudy dress, his buckskin coat and leggings, and dotted his white eagle plumes. Dark stains, horribly suggestive, covered him from head to foot. Blood stains, the innocent blood of Christians, crimsoned his renegade's body, and every dark red blotch cried murder. "'Girl, I burned that village of peace to get you,' growled Gertie. Come here. With a rude grasp that tore open her dress, exposing her beautiful white shoulder and bosom, the ruffian pulled her toward him. His face was transfixed with the fierce joy, a brutal passion. Deering looked on with a drunken grin, while his renegade friend hugged the almost dying girl. The Indians paced the glade with short strides like leashed tigers. The young missionary lay on the moss with closed eyes. He could not endure the sight of Nell in Gertie's arms. No one noticed Wingenund. He stood back a little, half-screened by drooping branches. Once again the chief's dark eyes gleamed, his head turned a trifle aside, and standing in the statuesque position habitual with him when resting, he listened as one who hears mysterious sounds. Suddenly his keen glance was riveted on the ferns above the low cliff. He had seen their graceful heads quivering. Then two blinding sheets of flame burst from the ferns. Spang! Spang! The two rifle reports thundered through the glade. Two Indians staggered and fell in their tracks, dead without a cry. A huge yellow body spread out like a panther in his spring, descended with a crash upon Deering and Gertie. The girl fell away from the renegade as he went down with a shrill screech, dragging Deering with him instantly began a terrific whirling wrestling struggle a few feet farther down the cliff another yellow body came crashing down to alight with a thud to bound erect to rush forward swift as a leaping deer the two remaining indians had only time to draw their weapons before this lithe threatening form whirled upon them shrill cries hoarse yells the clash of steel and dull blows mingled together one savage went down twisted over writhed and lay still the other staggered, warded off lightning-like blows until one passed under his guard and crashed dully on his head. 
Then he reeled, rose again, but only to have his skull cloven by a bloody tomahawk. The victor darted toward the whirling mass. Loose! Shake him loose! Let him go! yelled Jonathan Zane, swinging his bloody weapon. High above Zane's cry, deering shouts and curses, girdish shrieks of fear and fury, above the noise of wrestling bodies and dull blows, rose a deep, booming roar. It was Wetzel's awful cry of vengeance. Shake him loose! yelled Jonathan. Baffled, he ran wildly around the wrestlers. Time and time again his gory tomahawk was raised, only to be lowered. He found no opportunity to strike. Gertie's ghastly countenance gleamed at him from the whirl of legs and arms and bodies. Then Wetzel's dark face, lighted by merciless eyes, took its place, and that gave way to Deering's broad features. The men being clad alike in buckskin, and their motions so rapid, prevented Zane from lending a helping hand. Suddenly Deering was propelled from the mass as if by a catapult. His body straightened as it came down with a heavy thud. Zane pounced upon it with cat-like quickness. Once more he swung aloft the bloody hatchet. Then once more he lowered it, for there was no need to strike. The renegade's side was torn open from shoulder to hip. A deluge of blood poured out upon the moss. Deering choked. A bloody froth formed on his lips. His fingers clutched at nothing. His eyes rolled violently, and then were fixed in an awful stare. The girl lying so quiet in the woods near the old hut was avenged. Jonathan turned again to Wetzel and Gertie, not with any intention to aid the hunter, but simply to witness the end of the struggle. Without the help of the powerful Deering, how pitifully weak was the death's head of the frontier in the hands of the avenger. Jim Gertie's tomahawk was thrown in one direction and his knife in another. He struggled vainly in the iron grip that held him. Wetzel rose to his feet, clutching the renegade. With his left arm, which had been bared in the fight, he held Gertie by the front of his buckskin shirt and dragged him to that tree which stood alone in the glade. He pushed him against it and held him there. The white dog leaped and snarled around the prisoner. Gertie's hands pulled and tore at the powerful arm which forced him hard against the beach. It was a brown arm and huge with its bulging, knotted, rigid muscles, a mighty arm strong as the justice which ruled it. "'Gertie, thy race is run!' Wetzel's voice cut the silence like a steel whip. The terrible, ruthless smile, the glittering eyes of doom, seemed literally to petrify the renegade. The hunter's right arm rose slowly. The knife in his hand quivered as if with eagerness. The long blade, dripping with Deering's blood, pointed toward the hilltop. "'Look there! See them!' "'There's your friends,' cried Wetzel. On the dead branches of trees standing far above the hilltop were many great dark birds. They sat motionless, as if waiting. "'Buzzards! Buzzards!' hissed Wetzel. Gertie's ghastly face became an awful thing to look upon. No living countenance ever before expressed such fear, such horror, such agony. He foamed at the mouth, he struggled, he writhed. With a terrible fascination he watched that quivering, dripping blade, now poised high. Wetzel's arm swung with the speed of a shooting star. He drove the blade into Gertie's groin, threw flesh and bone, hard and fast, into the tree. He nailed the renegade to the beach, there to await his lingering doom. Ah! shrieked Gertie in cries of agony. He fumbled and pulled at the haft of the knife, but could not loosen it. He beat his breast, he tore his hair, his screams were echoed from the hilltop as if in mockery. The white dog stood near, his hair bristling, his teeth snapping. The dark birds sat on the dead branches above the hilltop, as if waiting for their feast. End of chapter 27 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter twenty eight of the Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter twenty eight. Zane turned and cut the young missionary's bonds. Jim ran to where Nell was lying on the ground and tenderly raised her head, 
calling to her that they were saved. Zane bathed the girl's pale face. Presently she sighed and opened her eyes. Then Zane looked from the statue-like form of Wingenund to the motionless figure of Wetzel. The chief stood erect with his eyes on the distant hills. Wetzel remained with folded arms, his cold eyes fixed upon the writhing, moaning renegade. "'Lou, look here,' said Zane, unhesitatingly, and pointed toward the chief. Wetzel quivered as if sharply stung. The cold glitter in his eyes changed to lurid fire. With upraised tomahawk he bounded across the brook. "'Lou, wait a minute!' yelled Zane. "'Wetzel, wait, wait!' cried Jim, grasping the hunter's arm. But the latter flung him off as the wind tosses a straw. "'Wetzel, wait! For God's sake, wait!' screamed Nell. She had risen at Zane's call, and now saw the deadly resolve in the hunter's eyes. Fearlessly she flung herself in front of him. Bravely she risked her life before his mad rush. Frantically she threw her arms around him, and clung to his hands desperately. Wetzel halted. Frenzied as he was at the sight of his foe, he could not hurt a woman. "'Girl, let go,' he panted, and his broad breast heaved. "'No, no, no! Listen, Wetzel, you must not kill the chief. He is a friend.' "'He is my great foe.' "'Listen, oh, please listen,' pleaded Nell. "'He warned me to flee from Gertie. He offered to guide us to Fort Henry. He has saved my life.' For my sake, Wetzel, do not kill him. Don't let me be the cause of his murder. Wetzel, Wetzel, lower your arm. Drop your hatchet. For pity's sake, do not spill more blood. Wingenund is a Christian. Wetzel stepped back, breathing heavily. His white face resembled a chiseled marble. With those little hands at his breast, he hesitated in front of the chief he had hunted for so many long years. "'Would you kill a Christian?' pleaded Nell, her voice sweet and earnest. "'I reckon not, but this engine ain't one,' replied Wetzel slowly. "'Put away your hatchet. Let me have it. Listen, and I will tell you after thanking you for this rescue. Do you know of my marriage? Come, please listen. Forget for a moment your enmity. Oh, you must be merciful. Brave men are always merciful.' Engine are you a christian hissed wetzel oh i know he is i know he is cried nell still standing between wetzel and the chief wingenund spoke no word he did not move his falcon eyes gazed tranquilly at his white foe christian or pagan he would not speak one word to save his life oh tell him you are a christian cried nell running to the chief yellow hair the delaware is true to his race as he spoke gently to Nell, a noble dignity shone upon his dark face. "'Injun, my back bears the scars of your brave whips,' hissed Wetzel, once more advancing. "'Dead wind, your scars are deep, but the Delawares are deeper,' came the calm reply. "'Wingenund's heart bears two scars. His son lies under the moss and ferns. Dead wind killed him. That wind alone knows his grave. Wingenund's daughter, the delight of his waning years, freed the Delaware's great foe and betrayed her father. Can the Christian God tell Wingenund of his child? Wetzel shook like a tree in a storm. Justice cried out in the Indian's deep voice. Wetzel fought for mastery of himself. Delaware. "'Your daughter lays there with her lover,' said Wetzel firmly, and pointed into the spring. Uh, exclaimed the Indian, bending over the dark pool. He looked long into its murky depths. Then he thrust his arm down into the brown water. "'That wind tells no lie,' said the chief calmly, and pointed toward Gertie. The renegade had ceased struggling. His head was bowed upon his breast. The white serpent has stung the Delaware. What does it mean? cried Jim. Your brother Joe and Whispering Winds lie in the spring, answered Jonathan Zane. Gertie murdered them, and Wetzel buried the two there. Oh, is it true? cried Nell. 
true lass whispered jim brokenly holding out his arms to her indeed he needed her strength as much as she needed his the girl gave one shuddering glance at the spring and then hid her face on her husband's shoulder delaware we are sworn foes cried wetzel wingenund asks no mercy are you a christian wingenund is true to his race delaware be gone take these weapons and go when your shadow falls shortest on the ground death wind starts on your trail death wind is the great white chief he is the great indian foe he is as sure as the panther in his sleep as swift as the wild goose in his northern flight wingenund never felt fear the chieftain's sonorous reply rolled through the quiet glade if that wind thirsts for wingenund's blood let him spill it now for when the delaware goes into the forest his trail will fade be gone roared wetzel the fever for blood was once more rising within him the chief picked up some weapons of the dead indians and with haughty stride stalked from the glade oh wetzel thank you i knew nell's voice broke as she faced the hunter she recoiled from this changed man come we'll go said jonathan zane i'll guide you to fort henry he lifted the pack and led nell and jim out of the glade they looked back once to picture forever in their minds the lovely spot with its ghastly quiet bodies the dark haunting spring the renegade nailed to the tree and the tall figure of wetzel as he watched his shadow on the ground when wetzel also had gone only two living creatures remained in the glade the doomed renegade and the white dog the gaunt beast watched the man with hungry mad eyes a long moan wailed through the forest it swelled mournfully on the air and died away the doomed man heard it he raised his ghastly face his dulled senses seemed to revive he gazed at the stiffening bodies of the indians at the gory corpse of deering at the savage eyes of the dog suddenly life seems to surge strong within him hell fire i am not done for yet he gasped this damn the knife can't kill me i'll pull it out he worked at the heavy knife hilt awful curses passed his lips but the blade did not move retribution had spoken his doom suddenly he saw a dark shadow moving along the sunlit ground it swept past him he looked up to see a great bird with wide wings sailing far above he saw another still higher and then a third he looked at the hilltop the quiet black birds had taken wing they were floating slowly majestically upward he watched their graceful flight how easily they swooped in wide circles he remembered that they had fascinated him when a boy long long ago when he had a home where was that home he had one once ah oh, the long cruel years have rolled back a youth blotted out by evil returned he saw a little cottage he saw the old virginia homestead he saw his brothers and his mother ah! a cruel agony tore his heart he leaned hard against the knife with the pain the present returned but the past remained all his youth all his manhood flashed before him the long bloody merciless years faced him and his crimes crushed upon him with awful might suddenly a rushing sound startled him he saw a great bird swoop down and graze the treetops another followed and another and then a flock of them he saw their gray spotted breasts and hooked beaks buzzards he muttered darkly eyeing the dead savages the carrion birds were swooping to their feast my god he's nailed me fast for buzzards he screamed in sudden awful frenzy nailed fast ah, 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 alive my buzzards ah, ah. he shrieked until his voice failed 
and then he gasped. Again the buzzard swooped overhead, this time brushing the leaves. One, a great grizzled bird, settled upon a limb of the giant oak and stretched its long neck. Another alighted beside him. Others sailed round and round the dead treetop. The leader arched his wings, and with a dive swooped into the glade. He alighted near Deering's dead body. He was a dark, uncanny bird, with long, scraggy, bare neck, a wreath of white, grizzled feathers, a cruel, hooked beak, and cold eyes. The carrion bird looked around the glade and put a great claw on the dead man's breast. <coughs> shrieked Gertie. His agonized yell of terror and horror echoed mockingly from the wooded bluff. The huge buzzard flapped his wings and flew away but soon returned to his gruesome feast. His followers, made bold by their leader, floated down into the glade. Their black feathers shone in the sun. They hopped over the moss. They stretched their gristled necks and turned their heads sideways. Dirty was sweating blood. It trickled from his ghastly face. All the suffering and horror he had caused in all his long career was as nothing to that which then rendered him. He, the renegade, the white Indian, the death's head of the frontier, panted and prayed for a merciful breath. He was exquisitely alive. He was human. Presently the huge buzzard, the leader, raised his hoary head. He saw the man nailed to the tree. The bird bent his head wisely to one side, and then lightly lifted himself into the air. He sailed round the glade, over the fighting buzzards, over the spring and over the doomed renegade he flew out of the glade and in again he swooped close to gertie his broad wings scarcely moved as he sailed along gertie tried to strike the buzzard as he sailed close by but his arm fell useless he tried to scream but his voice failed slowly the buzzard king sailed by and returned every time he swooped a little nearer and bent his long scraggy neck suddenly he swooped down light and swift as a hawk his wide wings fanned the air he poised under the tree and then fastened sharp talons in the doomed man's breast end of chapter twenty eight of the spirit of the border by zane gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Chapter twenty nine of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter twenty nine. The fleeting human instinct of Wetzel had given way to the habit of years. His merciless quest for many days had been to kill the frontier fiend now that it had been accomplished he turned his vengeance into its accustomed channel and once more became the ruthless indian slayer a fierce tingling joy surged through him as he struck the delaware's trail wingenund had made little or no effort to conceal his tracks he had gone northwest straight as a crow flies toward the indian encampment he had a start of sixty minutes and it would require six hours of rapid traveling to gain the delaware town reckon he'll make for home muttered wetzel following the trail with all possible speed the hunter's method of trailing an indian was singular intuition played as great a part as sight he seemed always to divine his victim's intention once on the trail he was as hard to shake off as a bloodhound yet he did not by any means always stick to the indian's footsteps with wetzel the direction was of the greatest importance for half a mile he closely followed the delaware's plainly marked trail then he stopped to take a quick survey of the forest before him he abruptly left the trail and breaking into a run went through the woods as fleetly and noiselessly as a deer running for a quarter of a mile when he stopped to listen all seemed well for he lowered his head and walked slowly along examining the moss and leaves presently he came upon a little open space where the soil was a sandy loam he bent over then rose quickly he had come upon the indian's trail cautiously he moved forward stopping every moment to listen 
in all the close pursuits of his maturer years he had never been a victim of that most cunning of indian tricks an ambush he relied solely on his ear to learn if foes were close by the wild creatures of the forest were his informants as soon as he heard any change in their twittering humming or playing whichever way they manifested their joy or fear of life he became as hard to see as difficult to hear as a creeping snake the delaware's trail led to a rocky ridge and there disappeared wetzel made no effort to find the chief's footprints on the flinty ground but halted a moment and studied the ridge the lay of the land around a ravine on one side and a dark impenetrable forest on the other he was calculating his chances of finding the delaware's trail far on the other side indian woodcraft subtle wonderful as it may be is limited to each indian's ability savages as well as other men were born unequal one might leave a faint trail through the forest while another could be readily traced and a third more cunning and skillful than his fellows have flown under the shady trees for all the trail he left but red men follow the same methods of woodcraft from tradition as wetzel had learned after long years of study and experience and now satisfied that he had divined the delaware's intention he slipped down the bank of the ravine and once more broke into a run he leaped lightly sure-footed as a goat from stone to stone over fallen logs and the brawling brook at every turn of the ravine at every open place he stopped to listen arriving on the other side of the ridge he left the ravine and passed along the edge of the rising ground he listened to the birds and searched the grass and leaves he found not the slightest indication of a trail where he had expected to find one he retraced his steps patiently carefully scrutinizing every inch of the ground but it was all in vain wingenund had begun to show his savage cunning in his warrior days for long years no chief could rival him his boast had always been that when wingenund sought to elude his pursuers his trail faded among the moss and the ferns wetzel calm patient resourceful deliberated a moment the delaware had not crossed this rocky ridge he had been cunning enough to make his pursuer think such was his intention the hunter hurried to the eastern end of the ridge for no other reason than apparently that course was the one the savage had the least reason to take he advanced hurriedly because every moment was precious not a crushed blade of grass a brushed leaf an overturned pebble nor a snapped twig did he find he saw that he was getting near to the side of the ridge where the delaware's trail had abruptly ended ah what was there a twisted bit of fern with the drops of dew brushed off bending beside the fern wetzel examined the grass it was not crushed a small plant with triangular leaves of dark green lay under the fern breaking off one of these leaves he exposed its lower side to the light the fine silvery hair of fuzz that grew upon the leaf had been crushed wetzel knew that an indian could tread so softly as not to break the springy grass blades but the underside of one of these leaves if a man steps on it always betrays his passage through the woods to keen eyes this leaf showed that it had been bruised by a soft moccasin wetzel had located the trail but was still ignorant of its direction slowly he traced the shaken ferns and bruised leaves down over the side of the ridge and at last near a stone he found a moccasin print in the moss it pointed east the delaware was traveling in exactly the opposite direction to that which he should be going he was moreover exercising wonderful sagacity in hiding his trail this however did not trouble wetzel for if it took him a long time to find the trail certainly the delaware had expended as much or more in choosing hard ground logs or rocks on which to tread wetzel soon realized that his own cunning was matched he trusted no more to his intuitive knowledge but stuck close to the trail as a hungry wolf holds to the scent of its quarry the delaware trail led over logs stones and hard-baked ground up stony ravines and over cliffs 
the wily chief used all of his old skill he walked backward over moss and sand where his footprints showed plainly he leaped wide fissures in stony ravines and then jumped back again he let himself down over ledges by branches he crossed creeks and gorges by swinging himself into trees and climbing from one to another he waded brooks where he found hard bottom and avoided swampy soft ground with dogged persistence and tenacity of purpose wetzel stuck to this gradually fading trail every additional rod he was forced to go more slowly and take more time in order to find any sign of his enemy's passage through the forest one thing struck him forcibly wingenund was gradually circling to the southwest a course that took him farther and farther from the delaware encampment slowly it dawned upon wetzel that the chief could hardly have any reason for taking this circling course save that of pride and savage joy in misleading in fooling the foe of the delawares in deliberately showing deathwind that there was one indian who could laugh at and lose him in the forest to wetzel this was bitter as gall to be led a wild goose chase his fierce heart boiled with fury his dark keen eyes sought the grass and moss with terrible earnestness yet in spite of the anger that increased to the white heat of passion he became aware of some strange sensation creeping upon him he remembered that the delaware had offered his life slowly like a shadow wetzel passed up and down the ridges through the brown and yellow aisles of the forest over the babbling brooks out upon the golden flecked fields always close on the trail at last in an open part of the forest where a fire had once swept away the brush and smaller timber wetzel came upon the spot where the delaware's trail ended there in the soft black ground was a moccasin print the forest was not dense there was plenty of light no logs stones or trees were near and yet over all that glade no further evidence of the indian's trail was visible it faded there as the great chief had boasted it would wetzel searched the burnt ground he crawled on his hands and knees again and again he went over the surroundings the fact that one moccasin print pointed west and the other east showing that the delaware had turned in his tracks was the most baffling thing that had ever crossed the hunter in all his wild wanderings for the first time in many years he had failed he took his defeat hard because he had been successful for so long he thought himself almost infallible and because the failure lost him the opportunity to kill his great foe in his passion he cursed himself for being so weak as to let the prayer of a woman turn him from his life's purpose with bowed head and slow dragging steps he made his way westward the land was strange to him but he knew he was going toward familiar ground for a time he walked quietly all the time the fierce fever in his veins slowly abating calm he always was except when that unnatural lust for indian's blood overcame him on the summit of a high ridge he looked around to ascertain his bearings he was surprised to find he had traveled in a circle a mile or so below him arose the great oak tree which he recognized as the landmark of beautiful spring he found himself standing on the hill under the very dead tree to which he had directed gertie's attention a few hours previous with the idea that he would return to the spring to scalp the dead indians he went directly toward the big oak tree once out of the forest a wide plain lay between him and the wooded knoll which marked the glade of beautiful spring he crossed this stretch of verdant meadowland and entered the copse suddenly he halted his keen sense of the usual harmony of the forest with its innumerable quiet sounds had received a severe shock he sank into the tall weeds and listened then he crawled a little farther doubt became certainty a single note of an oriole warned him and it needed not the quick notes of a catbird to tell him that near at hand somewhere was human life once more wetzel became a tiger the hot blood leaped from his heart firing all his veins and nerves but calmly noiseless certain cold 
deadly as a snake he began the familiar crawling method of stalking his game on on under the briars and thickets across the hollows full of yellow leaves up over stony patches of ground to the fern-covered cliff overhanging the glade he glided lithe sinuous a tiger in movement and in heart he parted the long graceful ferns and gazed with glittering eyes down into the beautiful glade he saw not the shining spring nor the purple moss nor the ghastly white bones all that the buzzards had left of the dead nor anything save a solitary indian standing erect in the glade there within range of his rifle was his great indian foe wingenund wetzel sank back into the ferns to still the furious exultations which almost consumed him during the moment when he marked his victim he lay there breathing hard gripping tightly his rifle slowly mastering the passion that alone of all things might render his aim futile for him it was the third great moment of his life the last of three moments in which the indian's life had belonged to him once before he had seen that dark powerful face over the sights of his rifle and he could not shoot because his one shot must be for another again had that lofty haughty figure stood before him calm disdainful arrogant and he yielded to a woman's prayer the delaware's life was his to take and he swore he would have it he trembled in the ecstasy of his triumphant passion his great muscles rippled and quivered for the moment entirely beyond his control then his passion calmed such power for vengeance had he that he could almost still the very beats of his heart to make sure and deadly his fatal aim slowly he raised himself his eyes of cold fire glittered slowly he raised the black rifle wingenund stood erect in his old grand pose with folded arms but his eyes instead of being fixed on the distant hills were lowered to the ground an indian girl cold as marble lay at his feet her garments were wet and clung to her slender form her sad face was frozen into an eternal rigidity by her side was a newly dug grave the bead on the front sight of the rifle had hardly covered the chief's dark face when wetzel's eye took in these other details he had been so absorbed in his purpose that he did not dream of the delaware's reason for returning to the beautiful spring slowly wetzel's forefinger stiffened slowly he lowered the black rifle wingenund had returned to bury whispering winds wetzel's teeth clenched an awful struggle tore his heart slowly the rifle rose wavered and fell it rose again wavered and fell something terrible was wrong with him something awful was awakening in his soul wingenund had not made a fool of him the delaware had led him a long chase had given him the slip in the forest not to boast of it but to hurry back to give his daughter christian burial wingenund was a christian had he not been once having cast his daughter from him he would never have looked upon her face again wingenund was true to his race but he was a christian suddenly wetzel's terrible temptation his heart-racking struggle ceased he lowered the long black rifle he took one last look at the chieftain's dark powerful face then the avenger fled like a shadow through the forest End of chapter 29 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Chapter 30 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Chapter 30 It was late afternoon at Fort Henry, the ruddy sun had already sunk behind the wooded hill, and the long shadows of the trees lengthened on the green square in front of the fort. Colonel Zane stood in his doorway, watching the river with eager eyes. A few minutes before, 
a man had appeared on the bank of the island and hailed the colonel had sent his brother jonathan to learn what was wanted the latter had already reached the other shore in his flatboat and presently the little boat put out again with the stranger seated at the stern i thought perhaps it might be wetzel mused the colonel though i never knew of lou's wanting a boat jonathan brought the man across the river and up the winding path to where colonel zane was waiting hello it's young christie exclaimed the colonel jumping off the steps and cordially extending his hand glad to see you where's williamson how did you happen over here captain williamson and his men will make the river eight or ten miles above answered christie i came across to inquire about the young people who left the village of peace was glad to learn from jonathan they got out all right uh, yes indeed we're all glad come and sit down of course you'll stay overnight you look tired and worn well no wonder when you saw that moravian massacre you must tell me about it i saw sam brady yesterday and he spoke of seeing you over there sam told me a good deal ah here's jim now the young missionary came out of the open door and the two young men greeted each other warmly i wish she asked christie when the first greetings had been exchanged nell's just beginning to get over the shock she'll be glad to see you jonathan tells me you got married just before gertie came up with you at beautiful spring yes it is true in fact the whole wonderful story is true yet i cannot believe as yet you look thin and haggard when we last met you were well now that awful time pulled me down i was an unwilling spectator of all that horrible massacre and shall never get over it i can still see the fiendish savages running about with the reeking scalps of their own people i actually counted the bodies of forty-nine grown christians and twenty-seven children an hour after you left us the church was in ashes and the next day i saw them burned bodies oh the sickening horror of the scene it haunts me that monster jim gertie killed fourteen indians with his sledgehammer did you hear of his death asked colonel zane yeah and a fitting end it was to the frontier skull and crossbones it was like wetzel to think of such a vengeance has wetzel come in since uh, no jonathan says he went after wingenund and there's no telling when he'll return i hoped he would spare the delaware wetzel spare an indian but the chief was a friend he surely saved the girl i am sorry too because swingenund was a fine indian but wetzel is implacable here's nell and mrs clark too come out both of you cried jim nell appeared in the doorway with colonel zane's sister the two girls came down the steps and greeted the young man the bride's sweet face was white and thin and there was a shadow in her eyes i'm so glad you got safely away from from there said christie earnestly tell me of benny asked nell speaking softly oh yes i forgot why benny is safe and well he was the only christian indian to escape the christian massacre heckwelder hid him until it was all over he's going to have the lad educated thank heaven murmured nell and the missionaries inquired jim earnestly we're all well when i left except of course young he was dying the others will remain out there and try to get another hold but i fear it's impossible it is impossible not because the indian does not want christianity but because such white men as the gerties rule the beautiful village of peace owes its ruins to the renegades said colonel zane impressively captain williamson could have prevented the massacre remarked jim possibly it was a bad place for him and i think he was wrong not to try declared the colonel hello cried jonathan zane getting up from the steps where he sat listening to the conversation a familiar soft moccasined footfall sounded on the path all turned to see wetzel coming slowly toward them his buckskin hunting costume was ragged and worn he looked tired and weary but the dark eyes were calm it was the wetzel whom they all loved they greeted him warmly nell gave him her hands and smiled up at him i'm so glad you've come home safe she said safe and sound lass and glad to find you well answered the hunter as he leaned on his long rifle looking from nell to colonel zane's sister 
Betty, I always gave you first place among border lasses, but here's one as could run you most any kind of a race, he said with a rare smile which so warmly lighted his dark, stern face. Lou Wetzel making compliments? Well, of all things, exclaimed the colonel's sister. Jonathan Zane stood closely scanning Wetzel's features. Colonel Zane, observing his brother's close scrutiny of the hunter, guessed the cause, and said, Lou, tell us, did you see Wingenund over the sights of your rifle? Yes, answered the hunter simply. A chill seemed to strike the hearts of the listeners. That simple answer coming from Wetzel meant so much. Nell bowed her head sadly. Jim turned away, biting his lip. Christie looked across the valley. Colonel Zane bent over and picked up some pebbles, which he threw hard at the cabin wall. Jonathan Zane abruptly left the group and went into the house. But the colonel's sister fixed her large black eyes on Wetzel's face. Well, she asked, and her voice rang. Wetzel was silent for a moment. He met her eyes with that old inscrutable smile in his own. A slight shade flitted across his face. Betty, I missed him, he said calmly, and shouldering his long rifle, he strode away. Nell and Jem walked along the bluff above the river. Twilight was deepening. The red glow in the west was slowly darkening behind the boldly defined hills. "'So it's all settled, Jem, that we stay here,' said Nell. "'Yes, dear, Colonel Zane has offered me work, and a church besides. We are very fortunate, and should be contented. I am happy because you're my wife. And yet I am sad when I think of him.' Poor Joe. Don't you ever think we we wronged him? whispered Nell. No, he wished it. I think he knew how he would end. No, we did not wrong him. We loved him. Yes, I loved him. I loved you both, said Nell softly. Then let us always think of him as he would have wished. Think of him. Think of Joe. I shall never forget. In winter, spring, and summer I shall remember him, but always most in autumn, for I shall see that beautiful glade with its gorgeous color and the dark shaded spring where he lies asleep. The years rolled by with their changing seasons. Every autumn the golden flowers bloomed richly, and the colored leaves fell softly upon the amber moss in the glade of beautiful spring the indians camped there no more they shunned the glade and called it the haunted spring they said the spirit of a white dog ran there at night and the wind of death mourned over the lonely spot at long intervals an indian chief of lofty frame and dark powerful face stalked into the glade to stand for many moments silent and motionless and sometimes at twilight when the red glow of the sun had faded to gray a stalwart hunter slipped like a shadow out of the thicket and leaned upon a long black rifle while he gazed sadly into the dark spring and listened to the sad murmur of the waterfall the twilight deepened while he stood motionless the leaves fell into the water with a soft splash a whippoorwill caroled his melancholy song from the gloom of the forest came a low sigh which swelled thrillingly upon the quiet air and then died away like the wailing of the night wind quiet reigned once more over the dark murky grave of the boy who gave his love and his life to the wilderness end of chapter thirty also end of the book the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio